One, we're gonna get started here in a moment. It is 801, 802. <clears throat> we are on time in this meeting. Um, more importantly, it's Sandra's birthday today. Happy birthday, Sandra. Um, I will uh, see if our executive director has any comments or announcements. Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, council members, um, folks listening online. I um, know you're doing quite well on this meeting, and uh, as you've indicated, Mr. Chairman, you are on schedule. Um, so uh, nothing in terms of announcements for me this morning. Thank you. All right, and uh, there'll probably be several uh, reminders, but let's not forget that daylight savings time starts um, I guess at 2 a.m. Sunday morning. So um, we'll all lose uh, an hour of sleep, but it's an hour less waiting for the council meeting to start on Sunday. So we'll get started um, on agenda item E6, and I'll turn to uh, Todd Phillips to get us started. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, council. So this agenda item E6, as the chair just recognized, which is workload and new management measure priorities. Uh, a little bit to orient the council, uh, noting that this particular agenda item has in the past been, uh, been a little bit convoluted. Um, <clears throat> staff has provided what is considered a conceptual design of the process, which is under agenda item E6, attachment one. And additionally, um, for council reference, uh, the GMT has been the keeper of management measures the council has considered in the past and has put on this list. That particular list, which I will reference here in my overview, is contained within the GMT report one. So under this particular agenda item, the council has essentially three tasks that are very much interrelated. The first is that this agenda item is a dedicated time for stakeholders, for council members, for advisory body members, and the like to um, provide information to the council as to management measures that they would like to see added to this list. Um, the second part is that the council would um, take this list, um, review, revise, edit as it sees fit. Um, and again, this is the existing list that is uh, under JMC report one. And possibly the, the third more important and more direct um, action for this particular agenda item is that the council will look at the overall list of um, management measures, including the ones that they could add, and prioritize them for work. Um, and, and by prioritize them for work, I mean that they would look at this list and, and say, this particular management measure is what the GMT and staff should work on next. Um, and to reference that, of course, the uh, whiting utilization was one item that had been prioritized and was completed at this meeting. And an additional um, measure that had been prioritized in the past will be applied at the next meeting, which is of course the non troll RCA. So <clears throat> your action today is to consider the new groundfish management measure proposals and review the list of management measures and amendments and consider this addition of prioritization and work priorities in the light of all um, groundfish management measures um, priorities, including those that we are uh, mandated to complete, and then provide guidance um, to the ground fish management team and staff regarding priorities and schedules on these items. In your reference materials, you have several reports. Um, you, of course, have the two uh, reports that I mentioned at the onset, which is attached one, which shows the uh, overall design of this particular process. The ground fish management team uh, report one, which is uh, shows the I guess the existing list and some information thereof. Uh, you have a supplemental GMT report, and then you have a supplemental GMT presentation. And for, for council information, the GMT will not be reading their report. They will be giving that in presentation form. And then finally, of course, you have the supplemental gap report one. Um, with that overview, um, hopefully I have uh, answered a few questions, but I'm happy to take any if you have. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Todd. I'll see if there are any questions on your overview. And if not, we will go directly to Lynn Mattis and the GMT report and presentation. So I'm not seeing any 
hands. So welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Um, Sandra, can I share my screen, please? So good morning. Um, hopefully you are all, all are seeing the correct view, not the present presenter view. No, we're, it looks good. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is my first time trying it with, with this platform. So yeah, as, as Todd said, I'm going to give an overview of G what's in GMT reports one and supplemental report two. Um, this is the diagram that uh, Todd referenced a few minutes ago about how we see this process. Since We've already talked about it. I'm going to skip over it. It was mostly just here for reference that this is the, the, the first meeting where we plan really plan on how we do our groundfish workload. GMT report one, which was in the advanced briefing book, was intended just to be a reminder of where things left off when the council last discussed this item in March 2021. No items have been added or removed by the GMT since uh, council discussion in March of last year. We did have a few updates in the progress to date column, the far right column in appendix two, um, and any of those have been bolded just to highlight those. So we wanted to include this in the advanced briefing book as a starting place for the discussion at this meeting. Supplemental report two. We have some updates based on council decisions and discussions over the last year, including some things earlier at this meeting, particularly yesterday. Guidance with NIMFS, discussion with the GAP, um, and then public comments we've gotten over the last year. So Appendix 1 in GMT Report 2, um, this is based on the NIMS, what NIMS provides in their report under the NIMS report. It shows what the GMT is working on or expecting to be working on uh, and when. And this is based on mandatory items, recurring items, and council identified priorities. We also try to identify who the GMT lead or leads are anticipated to be when, when we're working at that. Um, here on the screen, it's a little small to see, but hopefully you all have it in front of you uh, on the and a document. Th this is just showing that Appendix 1 table. The color coding it doesn't have any meaning other than just an easy way for us to identify where things are broken down. And any column where you see three stars, that is the GMT's anticipation of when the final regulations would be published. So you see the top three rows are things we're working on with the biennial harvest specifications for this cycle. We're going to be working on those through July. The council takes final action in June, but we will have a little bit of cleanup work to do probably. Then something like in season, the purplish row, um, that's an ongoing thing. So that's your out there year round. So this was just to try to visually show what we have going on, what we're working on, when, and all of that. Then moving on to table or to appendix two, this is the uh, the infamous list. Table A has items that have already been prioritized by the council, items that the council has made specific action that these are items we're prioritizing and we're working on. We do have a column on progress to date and a column on when next steps are scheduled, and that is based on the draft year at a glance that was in the advanced briefing book, uh, agenda item C7, attachment one. So in attachment at appendix two, table A, some updates that since report one, um, Items A2 and A3 have been combined along with item B14 from table B into one combined action A2. And this is the non-trawl RCA modifications, the MLA Platt EFP and the regulations and the CalCOD conservation area removal. Then based on council motions and discussion under E3, uh, which was I think yesterday, we have added a new item A5 on stock definitions and stock complexes. 
we have added that to uh, table A, the prioritized items as a placeholder based on what we interpreted council's discussion and motion and guidance from NIMS to be is that that would need to be a prioritized item. If the council has an, uh, prefers or has another idea and prefers it to be moved down to table B, we can do that. This was just our best estimate of where it needed to be until we got um, a full update from the council. So the updated Appendix A table, uh, you'll notice A1 Pacific Whiting utilization is still on this table. Council has taken final action yesterday or the day before. Uh, so the next iteration of this table will have that item removed. We just wanted, didn't want to remove it just yet. A2 is that combined non troll RCA package that I mentioned. And then A5 is the new stock definition complex. So any row that is shaded, um, if you have color version, it's a tannish, light orange, um, that, that is just highlighting someplace where we, we have made an update or um, we have some specific uh, questions or wanted some input on. And then anything bolded is new. So Appendix 2, Table B, is all other potential ground fish management measures. So these are all the other items that haven't been prioritized by the council. And the order in this table does not imply any prioritization by the GMT. We've just been adding things as they come up. So um, some items that came up yesterday have been added to the bottom of the table. Um, don't take that order as any sort of prioritization exercise. For updates on that table B, uh, there are two trawl EFPs, rows B2 and B6. Uh, the GMT doesn't, isn't saying that these need to go away or anything, but we just wanted to point out that row B2, they're, they're in year four of the three years of EFPs needed for the uh, salmon ITS. Um, it, it's the GMT's understanding there hasn't been a lot of participation in this EFP. Therefore, we may need some guidance from NIMS about how much data has been collected and does this EFP need to continue, should it continue. And then B6 is another trawl EFP. That one is starting year five of the EFPs. There was no set number of minimum years required for that EFP. Um, but again, we, we just wanted to point out that it had been going on for a number of years. Is there enough data to consider moving into regulations for those EFPs when there is time and workload capacity um, in the Table A prioritized items? Item B8, discard mortality rates for recreational fisheries. Uh, this item actually has two components. The first component is there had been some discussion a while back about updating the death by depth mortality matrix for surface rates that was uh, adopted in 2008. Uh, the, some discussion about should we check those rates to see if they're still accurate? Uh, do they need to be updated? And then the second piece has been about developing rates for um, discard mortality rates for additional species when descending devices are used. Currently, we only have rates for cow cod, yellow eye, and canary rockfish. A subgroup of the GMT has been working on developing descending device rates for additional species. Um, we hope to be able to present to the SSC and Council in June 2020 or 2022. And we don't see this as being a regulatory action, more of a catch accounting methodology. The council and SSC back in 2013 approved of the methodology the GMT was using. Uh, so we see this as a math uh, catch accounting exercise where we'll be applying those same methodologies to try to develop rates for new species, um, particularly ones that um, Based on new assessments, we will likely have some regulatory discards like quillback, copper, and vermilion rockfishes. Um, item B14, as I mentioned before, was combined with A2 and A3 in table A. Uh, we have added a new item, row B16, at sea processing south of 42. Initially, this was part of the Pacific Whiting utilization item, but got delayed due to potential impacts on salmon and other managed species. 
at the previously. So the council signaled that an EFP may be appropriate avenue. Um, we just wanted to make sure it didn't get lost in the shuffle. So we've put it back on the list. Then based on council's discussion on the limited entry fixed gear catch share review program yesterday, we have added three new lines. The first being uh, catch share cost recovery. Um, this was based on information within E4A NIMS report one and some discussion with NIMS staff. We have added uh, B18 looking at the base pit permit removal and we this was based on what we interpreted from council discussion and action yesterday and also um, a new sort of uh, new item B19 sort of a catch-all for all other follow-on actions uh, particularly those listed in the gap recommendation in the gap report from E4A. So here is half of appendix two table B with GMT updates. Again, you'll have, you should have the version of this with the report in front of you. Um, the highlighted cells are the cells, the items that I mentioned above, and then anything in bold is new. And then here's the second half of that table and you can see the new items 16 through 19 at the bottom of this table based on discussions yesterday on the limited entry fixed gear. Just some other considerations. The GMT will be focused on the 23-24 biennial harvest specifications and management measures through June. There are also other high workload items already prioritized that the team and council staff are working on, such as Sablefish gear switching, the non troll RCA adjustments and repeal of the CCA, fixed gear catch share review, and limited entry fixed gear program review, which those are actually the same thing. I don't know why we still have them as two bullets. Um, and then along with any recurring and routine items like in season, um, the, the ground fish endangered species act work group, et cetera. And with that, that's the quick and dirty sort of high level overview. And I anticipate there will be questions that I will do my best to answer. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn, for the presentation. We'll look for some questions. Heather. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Uh, good morning, Lynn. Um, thank you to you and the GMT for this, um, not only the report, but the presentation. I, I appreciate uh, walking through the report information in this presentation format. It's really helpful. I have a question on, um, this is, table um, B and the new items that were added. And I guess the question is really for all of them, um, but specifically, I'm curious about how um, or what the process is, or I guess I please remind me what it is because I should know, but um, for the limited entry fixed gear follow on actions, there were the, the three actions, the gap had interest in um, putting on this list. What's the process for scoping those? So when the GMT comes back to the council and says, you know, for the first one, this will be the workload and the, um, kind of the analytical process and who works on it. When will we when will we get that or or do we need to ask for that? Uh, Chair Gorelnik, Ms. Hall. Yeah, we were a little confused about that too. We had some discussion amongst ourselves, um, got ourselves pretty wrapped around the axle for a while too. And the the way I believe it should happen is the council, if the council wants those items broken out and scoped individually request that and the next time we come up, we have this agenda item, we will come back with that information. But we would need specific guidance from the, the council on, you know, we could package all of these things like B17, 18 and 19, maybe they go into one big package. Um, or if they wanna be broken out individually, providing us that guidance and we will come back to you the next time workload and new management measures prioritization comes up in front of the council. But we would need a request, um, requ we would need you to request us to, requ <laughs> to, uh, to work on that and exactly how you want it broken out. 
Thank you, Lynn. Further questions of the GMT? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Lynn. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at slide six. Uh, this is your, yes, the GMT workload matrix. Um, there are a couple things that just think, thinking about your workload and all that's on the, the GMT's plate. Um, I'm just wondering, um, like a few of the items, uh, for example, the DMR rates for rec fisheries um, isn't a management measure, it's a workload issue. Um, did you update this table um, or, or think about it holistically? I, I don't know if you had time to do that, this meeting, or if that wasn't you know, maybe the goal, but another one that I was wondering about that I would expect um, will take some time uh, this year is the work on the logbook. I know that may not be a GMT centric um, activity, but it is certainly work that um, is tied to the council process and tied to um, our discussions this week. So I was just wondering if you can tell us a little more about um, the GMT's discussion on this appendix and um, how much you added to or updated it. Thank you, Chair, Chair Grelnick, uh, Mr. Remco. We didn't spend as much time on this table, this appendix, as we probably could have. The, as to the discard mortality rate item, um, we see that as part of the in-season monitoring and management row um, because it's, it's catch counting um, so we did see that in there. And since so many of the, the prioritized items are commercial, which involves more of our commercial GMT reps, those of us who were more involved in recreational fisheries were trying to take it on. We did not discuss the logbook issue uh, a, as a standalone and where it should fit in this matrix. So that, um, that was an oversight on our part. We did not discuss it. Thanks much. I know there's a lot to do here. All right, thank you for the question. Any further questions of the GMT on the report? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks, Len, for a great report here. It's very clear. I just had a, a question. It occurred to me while going through here, there's several of the EFPs that are contemplated into going into regulation. And I was thinking about the lapses of the EFPs between that time. And is that something that you have considered or thought about and how we could uh, keep continuity there while the regs are being promulgated and such? And if, if that's a concern or is, has it been a request at all? So just, uh, just curious with your thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, uh Chair Grelnick, Mr. Dooley, we were not suggesting that these EMPs, these EFPs should cease. We, we see these EFPs continuing until the rulemaking is completed, similar to how um, the Platt Emily EFP has continued while we've been working on the rulemaking so that we continue to have that data and we do have that continuity. Um, we, it was not in our intent at all to say these EFPs should end. We were just trying to point out they've been in place for a number of years, so maybe when there's some capacity to add something new, this might be something we would look at. Does that help answer your question, sir? Yes, thank you so, uh, a lot, Lynn. I just was curious if that has any any uh, workload consequences involved with it and something we may consider. But uh, just uh, that was just a, a question. I appreciate you answering it. Thank you. Further questions of the GMT? All right, thank you very much, Lynn. We will now hear from the GAP, and it looks like it's a team presentation. Louis Zim, Dan Platt, and Jeff Lackey. Good morning. Council members, Mr. Chair, 
Good morning, Mr. Zim. Thank you, sir. I'll be reading from uh, agenda item E6, the supplemental gap report one. Ground fish advisory panel report on workload and new management measures priorities. The GAP receives an overview of this item from the Pacific Fishery Management Council, Staff Officer Todd Phillips, and discuss this agenda item with the GMT. As we noted in our March 2021 statement on this agenda item, the many GAP members remain dismayed with how long it takes for some items to move through the planning, analysis, and council decision process. However, we don't have a better solution for ground fish workload planning at this time. We reiterate our suggestion that the EFPs that have proven their efficacy and ability to perform within the boundaries established by the EFPs be expeditiously moved into regulation by the quickest means possible. This will increase the opportunities available for all fishermen and processors. Candidate management measures. The GAP supports the recommendations included in Supplemental GMT Report 2 under this agenda item and proposing moving one, some, or all the following from the B list to the A list in no particular order. Now that the council has taken action on specific whiting utilization. B16, an EFP for at sea whiting processing south of 42 degrees north latitude. The council removed the measure from the Pacific whiting utilization package and suggested it move forward as an EFP. The GAP requests the addition of this EFP to the list so at sea processors can explore processing in waters off Northern California. Other whiting EFPs have shown the fishing and at sea processing industry can minimize impacts to salmon. Expanding at sea whiting processing areas may become more important as competition for space increases due to proposed offshore wind areas that may or may not be realized in the future. However, it is important for the seafood industry to begin preparing for changes related to offshore wind, changes in the ocean relative to both target species and bycatch species, etc. B8 develop a discard mortality index in the context of descending device use for additional rockfish guilds or by species, including copper, quillback, vermilion slash sunset, and Southern California dwarf species, as is already in process by a subgroup of the GMT. This subgroup desires to prevent these, present these results later this year. GAP members feel these values are critical to have in time for use in estimating total catch and bycatch of these species during the 2022 season when these values are first needed by managers. B19, Sablefish Limited Entry Fixed Gear Catch Shares Program Review and Cost Recovery. Per our agenda item E4A Report 1, limited entry fixed gear catch share program review, the GAP suggests adding three items as a follow-on package. Those items include amending the tiered sablefish permits that are hook and line endorsed to use slinky pots. For vessels with stacked sablefish endorsed permits, allow vessels to fish a cumulative landing limit for each permit registered and amending the program to allow a fourth permit per vessel, providing the permit is of second generation ownership. The GAP also recommends that if the council moves forward with cost recovery, that it be included as part of the follow on package. New management measures. 
The GAP notes the following also is referenced in Supplemental GMT Report 2. As a priority item for the A-list, we include it here as additional information and perspective from the GAP. A5, stock definitions. The GAP understands this is a priority issue for the Council as determined under Agenda Item E3, stock definitions. The GMT Report 1 and GAP Report 1 under this agenda item address the importance of adding this measure to the workload list. And that completes my statement. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Louise M. We have a question from Maggie Summer. Thanks, Chair Gorelnik. Thanks very much, Louis. Uh, I wonder if, so, uh, as we are contemplating adding, in particular, the GAPS recommendations for follow-on actions from the uh, limited entry fixed gear program review, uh, is someone there with you who could speak a little bit more to the item to allow uh, a fourth permit per vessel, providing the permit is of second generation ownership. And what I'm interested in is understanding what you mean by second generation ownership. Thank you for the question. I'd like to say Maggie. Um, I was in part of the discussions on that and perhaps somebody else can uh, chime in, but what that is regarding is not second generation in the sense of family, of the son taking, uh, getting a permit to uh, continue to work on the boat, but more of the people that were not in the first issuance of these permits and have been working on the vessels and have an experience. So these would include people that were not uh, in the first issuance. Does that, uh, does that help? Yes, thank you. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Zim. Um, question on, I believe it's B16. This is the addition of an item to consider an EFP for south of uh, 42 uh, processing uh, at sea. Um, I guess I'm hoping to hear more about the GAPS discussion on this item and the recommended addition of it as a standalone item on the, uh, the list of potential new management measures. Um, I, I concur with the, the discussion, um, the outcome of the discussion, which was to consider um, potentially um, consider an EFP for this activity. Um, but my question is, did the GAP um, discuss the fact that we have as a standing agenda item each biennium uh, a call for new EFPs that are considered in conjunction with our biennial specs. I mean, in my mind, I just feel like we already have an agenda item scheduled as part of our uh, biennial process to consider new EFPs. Thank you for the question, Ms. Yuremko. Um, I would like to pass this on to my friend Jeff Lackey, who's much more involved in this fishery, if he's available. I am here. Can you hear me? You bet. Okay. I, I, I don't know if I have a, an answer about the process by which to bring this forward, the EFP, or maybe the thinking in the gap was if we're prioritizing all ground fish items, this would be one that uh, some on the gap would like to see prioritized. So maybe it would fit here for putting all ground fish items in one place to look at prioritization. I, I'm sorry, I don't think I have a better answer than that on the two um, processes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, any uh, further questions on the gap report? All right, thank you very much. Uh, Louie and Jeff. 
that completes reports and takes us to public comment. I know we have some public comment. We'll pause for a moment here to get that up on the screen. All right, there we have our five names. We'll start with Paul Clampett and followed by Jeff Shester. Welcome, Paul. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Paul Clampett. I own the Fishing Vessel Augustine, and I'm a member of the Fishing Vessel Owners Association and also a member of the Sable Fish and Halibut Pot Association. Uh, we've been uh, fishing off this for sable fish off the coast of Washington, Oregon, and California for 40 years. And uh, we've been participating in the tiered fishery since its inception. Um, we support the GAP's uh, advice to um, amend the uh, sable fish limited entry big scare catch here program to allow uh, slinky pots to be uh, endorsed for all permits. Um, we also uh, support the GAP suggestion to um, for vessels uh, to amend the uh, program to allow a fourth permit per vessel, providing that the permit is is uh, owned by a second generation fisherman. Um, we also would like to uh, agree with the GAP to move forward to allow vessels to fish a cumulative. Uh, limit uh, landing limit for each permit registered. This would uh, uh, eliminate some wastage in the fishery. And I know uh, there's on a sec there's a second track moving forward uh, to allow for a, a lengthier season, which we support. Um, um, we're going to be up against it um, since there's going to be increase in quota and. Um, we need as much time as possible. And we'd like to see at some point a year round fishery. Um, and that's really all I have. And I, I appreciate your, your time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. Are there any questions for Paul? Thank you, Paul. Uh, Jeff Shester followed by Merritt McRae. Welcome, Jeff. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the council. This is Jeff Shester. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Go, go ahead. Great. Um, thank you, and good morning. Um, uh, I'm, I'm representing uh, the conservation group Oceana. And again, my name is Jeff Shester, for the record. Um, my thank you uh, to the council uh, for your work to protect uh, short belly rockfish. And we wanted to start by recognizing efforts by the industry, uh, particularly the whiting industry and the council to prevent uh, incidental catch of short belly rockfish in light of the recent increases uh, in, in abundance. Um, our request is that the council prioritize and schedule a groundfish FMP amendment that would prohibit directed fishing for short belly rockfish. This is currently uh, item B4 in the current, or B14 in the most recent table provided by the GMT. Uh, since 2010, the council has recognized short belly rockfish as an important forage species for salmon, a highly migratory species, uh, other ground fish, uh, marine mammals, and seabirds. Uh, it's recognized in the uh, uh, fishery ecosystem plan as such. And right now there is currently a lack of, uh, of targeted fishing by, by the members of the industry and um, and, and, and there do not appear to be plans uh, based on industry inputs to uh, in, engage in directed targeted fishing for short belly. However, there is uh, a, a, an ongoing larger uh, looming threat uh, of fishing uh, short belly for fish meal and oil in light of the increase in global aquaculture demand for feeds. Uh, just as a recent example, uh, the Nordic uh, Aqua, Aqua Farms proposal uh, for 27,000 metric tons uh, of annual farm salmon production in Humboldt Bay, California, uh, would use a huge amount of, uh, of feeds. And this is just one example uh, from, from the West Coast of this increase in the demand for fish meal. Uh, the council has uh, affirmed its policy goal of preventing directed fishing uh, repeatedly over the last uh, uh, several years. Um, 
in 2020, the council moved short belly rockfish to ecosystem component uh, species status, uh, but did in doing so did retain a commitment to reinstate uh, those protections. Uh, most recently, the council made commitments to prohibit a directed fishery uh, as part of the 23 or 2023 24 uh, ground fish specifications and management measures. And this was included uh, all year last year and throughout the spring and summer until November um, when uh, it was uh, taken off that list uh, as and, and, and moved to the uh, future workload under this item. We do appreciate the 2000 ton metric ton trigger uh, that uh, will uh, be put in the, the FMP uh, uh, as, as part of the uh, specifications and that deals with incidental catch. But uh, the, the, the issue of directly uh, preventing a, a targeted fishery uh, is, is still uh, a management need. Um, in last November, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, put forward a, a pretty comprehensive report that laid out a starting place and some recommendations uh, for what uh, an initial scoping would look like of this item, as well as uh, laid out various regulatory approaches and some straightforward uh, analysis that could be done to support that. Uh, so it's not, it's not that nothing has been done on this item uh, as implied by the, the GMT's table, but in fact, I think quite a bit of work and thought has gone into this. The, that report recommended uh, moving forward with this item as a standalone groundfish FMP amendment, uh, as opposed to doing it through other uh, means and recommended that it be scheduled and considered at, under this agenda item at the March 2022 uh, meeting. Um, so we just wanted to, to conclude by saying that precautionary management and the protection of forage species is a, is a key ongoing council responsibility that should not just take place uh, when, when it's convenient. We do recognize that there is extensive uh, workload and new things uh, being added all the time to the workload list. Uh, and we, uh, as stakeholders, you know, are willing to be patient. Uh, and we can be flexible on, on the schedule in terms of uh, this doesn't have to be the, the top uh, item that has to happen right away. But uh, we fear that if it doesn't, um, if, if it doesn't, uh, in, uh, if it's not included in the schedule and, and, and the council doesn't begin the process and actually put it on the calendar, we're concerned that this uh, will ultimately kind of die a, a slow death and, and it won't actually happen. Um, so we're asking the council to stand by its commitments that it's made repeatedly uh, and add a short belly rockfish uh, directed fishing prohibition uh, to its list of priorities and, and put it on, on a schedule so that a process can be kicked off, uh, largely following the approach laid out in the ODFW report from November. Uh, thank you very much and would appreciate uh, uh, your action on this and we'd, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for your testimony as well as your written public comment. Let me see if there are any questions from around the table. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, Merritt McRae, followed by Robert Alverson. Welcome, Merritt. Good morning, Tara Gorelnik, council members. I'm Merritt McRae with the Sport Fishing Association of California. We greatly appreciate the GMP, GMT's efforts already undertaken to address establishing mortality indices for a broader range of rockfish species to include quillback, copper, Vermilion sunset rockfish. These are all species which are newly constraining within the nearshore and shelf rockfish complexes. I especially appreciate the gap support in advancing this effort to list A. This will recognize the ongoing efforts of the GM team members and ensure that work won't get overridden by other priorities. Thus far, only yellow eye, cow cod, and canary rockfish have discard mortality estimates in the context of deep water release and recompression. Yet use of these methods has been strongly advised to required by our West Coast states. These methods greatly increase survivorship of released rockfish and others. If one searches, is barotrauma keeping you up? At the top of the results list will be a video teaching these methods and how and why they work. Thank you. Thank you, Merritt. Are there questions for Merritt? All right. Uh, Robert Alverson, followed by Heather Mann. Welcome, Bob. Yeah. 
you're unmuted on our end. Well, why don't we go to Heather Mann and we'll come back to Bob Alverson. Welcome, Heather. Morning, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> council members. My name's Heather Mann. I am here on behalf of the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. MTC represents 30 trawl vessels, uh, 25 of which participate in the whiting fishery. I wanna thank the council for moving forward the whiting action um, earlier in the week. And I'm here today to ask you to prioritize the EFP that allows um, uh, allows looking at um, processing of whiting south of the Oregon California border. Um, as I talked about the other day, the industry had this activity as a solution to improving mothership utilization, but we pulled it from the package at the request of council members. But it wasn't to pull it completely, it was to explore it through an EFP um, as a better way of uh, seeing whether this was an appropriate type of activity. As the gap statement points out, the whiting industry has done a really great job of minimizing their incidental catch of Chinook. And we know that this is true um, as we're 100% observed. It is uh, my understanding that the industry can bring an EFP directly to the agency for consideration, but I also know it is traditionally the practice um, to bring the EFP through the council process. So in providing full transparency, um, you know, I'm gonna be exploring all options to fast track this EFP. Um, it's, there's unlikely to be any significant impacts to salmon stocks from this action. Catcher vessels can fish south of the border now, but their mothership processors can't follow them, making the fishery less efficient, uh, more expensive, and increasing the carbon footprint of the entire operation. Uh, as I said, the fishery is already 100% observed, so we'll know what any uh, salmon impacts are because they'll be appropriately captured in record keeping. I'd like to point out too that based on publicly available council documents, um, you can see that in the 2020 directed Chinook fishery, the bycatch mortality of Chinook for commercial and recreational fisheries combined um, was 66,000 Chinook. Uh, with the majority of that bycatch mortality coming from California fisheries taking place in the area between Pigeon Point and Point Arena. The 2021 fishery was projected to realize a bycatch mortality of 54,700 Chinook, and that's all information um, on page 40 of the 2021 preseason three report. In the 2020 and 2021 whiting fisheries, a combined total of 4,638 Chinook were intercepted across all three sectors. Um, and that information is also available online on the PACFIN website in the Salmon Scorecard. So I think that um, while I recognize there are concerns from um, some in California about exploring this EFP, I do think that if we step back and take a holistic look at managing federal fisheries uh, in a way that meets the Magnuson standard, <clears throat> Magnuson Stevens national standards that um, you know we should have an opportunity to, to try this out. I think that the directed salmon fisheries are having a, a much larger impact on bycatch mortality than the whiting industry. With regards to the EFB being prioritized um, versus going through the EFP agenda item that um, Marcy brought up earlier, I was not in the gap when they had this um, discussion, so I, I can't respond to that question. But my response uh, for myself and for MTC members would be, we'd like to see this move forward as quickly as possible, perhaps even for the 2022 season. You know, if the council were to prioritize this activity, then perhaps we could just work directly with the agency to move it forward. In terms of a workload issue, um, you know, perhaps the industry could help fund a contractor to work on it for National Marine Fishery Service. Um, either way, there would be safeguards built into the EFP, which could address any unintended uh, salmon impacts, as um, all EFPs generally have, you know, something in them. So that could be some type of a harvest guideline um, or some other kind of trigger that um, that would pull the 
pull the activity. And lastly, I would just add that, as we discussed the other day, there aren't a huge amount of um, mothership platforms on the grounds um, in any year. And so, you know, perhaps we're even going to limit it in the EFP to a couple of operations. Um, at the end of the day, though, moving forward um, with this activity, it just makes, it makes sense and it's good uh, fisheries management policy uh, to take it through an EFP first and it will make the fishery um, you know, more efficient, less costly, and may even be an improvement on um, incidental catch of salmon. Although I think we've done you know, really well so far um, in the last several years of doing that. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, but it would be great to have the council indicate that they support moving this forward. Um, as it was the council that asked us to remove it from the package um, that passed earlier in the week and explore it through an EFP. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Heather. Let's see if there are any questions from around the table from Heather, Marcy Remco. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Heather, for your testimony. Um, appreciate your um, recap of prior discussions and the council's suggestion that uh, the matter of processing south of 42 might be appropriate to consider in a future EFP. Uh, I guess I'd ask, um, I think we made that decision um, or we gave that guidance um, several months ago. I want to say, what, last March maybe. Um, in any case, um, Back in November 21, uh, we had our standing agenda item for preliminary approval of EFPs for consideration in the 23-24 biennium. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering if um, in light of the urgency that you've indicated, um, I, I think there was an opportunity there to submit an EFP application. And I'm just wondering maybe what discussions took place uh, about that opportunity. Uh, through the chair, Marcy, uh, thanks for the question. Um, it was discussed uh, individually and uh, with COVID and emergency rule for whiting and other things that had been happening. Um, I think there was just concerns about the workload. And at that time, um, we hadn't really thought about the potential to hire a contractor to do the work. Um, for example, up in the North Pacific, um, it's, it, it's quite frequent that contractors like John Govan are hired to actually write and manage and run EFPs. And so that's not something I think that we've generally done down here. Um, and hadn't really thought about it at that time and um, have been exploring, exploring that now. Um, it's also not unprecedented in this um, Pacific Council to have uh, EFPs move forward out of cycle. And so I think um, while that might not be a satisfactory answer to you, I think the, the combination of um, COVID and other things just made it seem untenable at the time. I think the circumstances have changed since then. And um, I think it's something that uh, we can address the, the, the shortcomings that we were concerned with before. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, further questions of Heather Mann. Uh, Heather, I've got a question. If you could just uh, repeat that citation to me for uh, salmon bycatch mortality in the salmon fishery. Yes, it's on, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's on page 40 of the 2021 pre-season three report. All right, thank you very much. Yep, thank you. All right, uh, we have one more public commenter, if we can reach him. Bob Alverson, are you with us? All right, so uh, we can't reach Bob, so we're going to conclude public comment and commence with our council discussion and action on agenda item E6.
the action is before us on the screen. We have some very detailed suggestions and information from both the GMT and the GAP. So I'll look for someone to get us started with council discussion. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. I will uh, start by observing that we have on the prioritized list already uh, a number of very substantive items. Um, and we have heard a very strong recommendation from the National Marine Fishery Service to add a stock definitions and stock complexes issue, which we discussed earlier at this meeting and, and uh, I think will be broad in scope and uh, a very significant workload as well. Um, we are all aware of our ground fish workload constraints. And at this point, uh, I think that it will be the best approach to take a very, uh, very narrow or streamlined approach to adding new management measures, uh, particularly if they are moved, if they are put on the prioritized list, uh, which indicates council intent to begin work on them uh, in at some point in the relatively near future. So just starting off this discussion by, uh, I think, recognizing that, as always, there are a lot of potential candidate measures. There are a lot of needs in uh, our, our suite of ground fish fisheries. Um, and we are, uh, I, I think we are going to need to make some, some uh, careful, thoughtful decisions on, on what to add to the list and how to prioritize them and move forward. Um, I certainly support adding the stock definitions item to the uh, priority list as identified by the GMT. Uh, I do want to appreciate the GMT's work as always in providing us with a very organized list uh, of measures and comments on uh, maybe the readiness of some of the candidate measures to be moved up. Uh, I have several questions and, and maybe points of discussion here, but I'll, I'll just start with one. The GMT raised some questions on uh, the adequacy of data we have on several existing EFPs and are, is it uh, sufficient for us to consider moving those into regulation? Uh, and so I, I would ask, um, what, and maybe this is a question for staff or for the National Marine Fisheries Service, um, what is, is the process for and timing for us to be able to evaluate that and to understand when we have enough information? Is there a schedule on, on which we can expect to receive a, some report on data adequacy that would be make that a good time to consider whether those are ready to begin moving into regulation? So look to uh, NIMS or staff to try to answer the, that question. Ryan? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Maggie, for the question. Um, you know, we don't have a specific designated process or metrics. I mean, the council would need to determine that as they evaluate the action. You know, I can, I can speak at least to some of the ones that are on the list currently and the level of uh, activity we have had uh, in those EFPs uh, and the amount of years that they have been, um, uh, amount of years that they've been underway uh, and whether or not we would believe that there is enough information, but there's no specific process. And if, and if you want me to speak to those, I'm happy to. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Ryan. I, I don't, but maybe briefly, if you have information right now, that would help. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so if you're looking at uh, table B, I, I do think um, that there, uh, for B6, that we do, we would have enough information, uh, but not uh, probably for B2. That would be at least our preliminary, yes, based on the amount of uh, trips that we've had. 
Thanks. All right, let's continue with discussion on this agenda item. We do have to provide guidance. Uh, Maggie Summer. Thanks, Chair. I uh, wanted to speak to the um, suite of limited entry fixed gear related items. Uh, we have some recommendations to package those. Uh, I think that makes sense to me. Maybe following up on um, the question Heather Hall asked the GMT earlier uh, about packaging. Um, it, my sense overall is that I, I think conceptually it makes sense to package. It will help to have a little more information as we get down the road, uh, maybe some pre-scoping on the various elements to help us understand what the workload and timing aspects of the component items are likely to be. And if that might uh, motivate us to pull any out of the package and put them on a, a different track. Uh, so I, I think um, it makes sense to me to package it at this point and to ask for uh, a little bit more information, both from the GMT and, and I think from the GAP. I will say I remain uh, pretty unclear on the, the details of the proposed uh, fourth permit stacking item. And in particular, I would be looking for more uh, description of of intent and of how that might be envisioned to work um, as uh, at some point as we are then preparing to make a decision on whether to move forward with um, that that element in the package. Stop there for now. Thank you, Maggie. So are you, are you seeking clarity from the GMT and the gap on those proposals or just at this meeting or in a future or Thanks, Chair. Uh, I think just noting that clarity in the future would be helpful. Uh, I, I will say at, at this point, my inclination would be to include the items as a package uh, on the list of candidate measures as uh, described in the, the GMT report in Table B. Uh, but just wanted to, to kind of put that notice out there that I think we will be looking for more information on those at, at some point in the future. And Chair, for your information, I, I do have a motion at some point, but we may have more discussion before then. Right. Yeah, I don't want to uh, rush the discussion. We have time for discussion. Um, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'd like to speak to the, the B-16, the at sea processing south of, San, uh, south of 42. I, I think, you know, we've, that was part of that original package and was dropped by industry and suggested by the council to be dropped. But now we're coming back with a EFP proposal and it, um, just want to understand better some of the, some of the things that were mentioned, like uh, Marcy mentioned that should be in the EFP uh, procedures and it's not maybe necessarily here. Uh, we heard Heather speak of maybe having an independent contractor help develop this has been done in the North Pacific. And I think, it, you know, we've had good experience with EFPs, particularly in the whiting sector with, uh, and, and I think that we could, uh, and we've, we've had a, a good experience with EFPs south of 42 in the midwater trawl issue. So I think, given the proper sideboards, I, I think it's doable and I think it's worth exploring and understanding. And I think it's it's definitely needed by that sector. And I, I think it would very much help. And I think it's probably was one of the more uh, effective things to help mothership utilization in that whole effort. So I don't know that I'm hard over that we need to include it here, but I'd like to hear maybe uh, some thoughts on doing it in an EFP separate from this and maybe how we could reduce some workload by, does it make sense to maybe uh, take that offer up to have industry 
help put this together with a, a contractor and they pay for it and all of that. So I'm just looking at overall workload, looking at the needs of industry. I think it's it's been well explained to me over time that it's needed and those boats do have the right to fish down there anyhow. It's this uh, processing issue. I and it, it makes sense for efficiency in the fishery, uh, profitability in the fishery. It's it's the things that we should be dealing with as a council. So I'd, I'm looking for the the expedited path that reduces workload, and maybe uh, maybe that could be spoken to here today. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Krista, and yeah. then followed by Marcy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, while we're speaking about EFPs, was uh, actually wondering about Slinky Gear and if EFP was a path forward for them um, in the sense that we don't know a lot about how they would operate down here. Uh, they are definitely of interest, it sounds like, to a number of people. Um, I am supportive of all of the items in the package, depending on how they flesh out, obviously. Um, I do have concerns about the, the Gen 2 um, and how that would look in terms of crew in particular. Um, and I just want to recognize that for Gen 1, I mean, none of us are getting any younger. I'm not Gen 1. My dad is 81 years old. He is. Um, and whether you uh, unfortunately pass or just want to retire when you're not 95, um, I do think we need to start thinking about what that looks like um, if we are going to take something like this topic up. The other item that we really didn't talk much about was the um, stacking of permits and how that would work for the cumulative landings. And so hopefully this does get at least kept on the list uh, as a package. And if so, um, the next time this comes forward, it would be very helpful, I think, to have a bit more explanation of what that looks like um, to help us make decisions. That I will end my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to focus a minute um, on discussing a little bit more related to Appendix 1, which is the workload matrix. Um, just wanting to, to highlight that there is an awful lot packed into this one little multicolored sheet. Um, it is a nice simple snapshot of roughly what the workload is on the GMT plate. Um, we've accounted for time uh, for biennial specs and management measures, EFP applications, stock assessment updates and panels, in-season monitoring, the ESA humpback whale biop, uh, and the ESA work group. Um, now the fixed gear catch share review. Uh, we have SAMTAC on the list, as well as the non troll RCA action. Widening utilization is still on the list. Is there still workload associated with implementing the action and finalizing it and finalizing the regs and completing the necessary consultations and then standing items um, pertaining to ecosystem, uh, halibut, and marine spatial planning. Um, if we were to kind of bullet out each one of those major categories, I think we'd find an awful lot um, else that's in there. Um, I asked Lynn about logbooks and um, she rightfully mentioned, well, we didn't really think about that, didn't spend too much time on this Appendix 1 matrix, and I'm not quite sure off the top of my head where logbooks might fall. Um, but it would probably, um, you know, it would be on this list, um, maybe in the ESA category. Um, my, my point here is that um, you know, we've we've asked them to summarize their workload and present it to us here in a nice, simple format, and they have. Um, but 
you know, I'm cognizant that this doesn't tell us the whole story about uh, the workload on the plate. Um, I want to highlight that because um, item B8 on the discard mortality rates uh, for recreational fisheries, um, that is really a workload item. Um, while it's listed in table B as a management measure item, we've heard it's it's not a regulatory item. It's a um, kind of behind the scenes analytical task that's going on um, with a subgroup of GMT members along with uh, John Budrick, our SSC member. Um, but I think I, I just wanna emphasize the importance of that work and while um, it doesn't show here on the workload list, it is definitely an element, as, as Lynn noted, of the in-season uh, monitoring and management. And that we have definitely um, increased our both our capacity and our emphasis on um, in-season monitoring, uh, particularly in California, but also uh, for other species that we are keeping an eye on and that we uh, get reports about um, actually in each of the in-season items um, routinely from our GMT about how, how our fisheries are performing um, with emphasis on um, special circumstances that have come to our attention in the council arena. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that because I know B8 is on this list. I, I don't know that I would keep it in table B. Um, but I did want to acknowledge um, the discussion here from the GMT on that point and the significance of it as we continue our in-season monitoring in 2022 with a very new suite of species on the list when it comes to priority needs for monitoring. Um, to speak to uh, EFPs, um, and the B16, or I'm sorry, uh, yes, the proposal add um, consideration of an EFP for Delta 42 for at sea processing. Um, I appreciate the discussion that we've had uh, here today and the um, recognition of this item coming out of the whiting utilization packet. Um, but again, I would stress that there is already a placeholder for EFPs uh, in our workload, uh, GMT workload list. Um, I really appreciated everything Heather had to say about the, um, the process that might be needed to bring forward an EFP application and the need of the industry to, um, to find a coordinator and um, prepare the applications. And it sounds like um, the timing just wasn't right. And I certainly um, can understand why um, the reason she offered make, make good sense to me. Um, and I think uh, that would be an EFP that will come with significant workload. Um, we've taken up EFPs uh, and preliminarily approved. Some some EFPs um, already for the next uh, 23-24 biennium. Um, so I feel like that work is uh, underway. Um, we've, we'll be working to finalize those EFPs when we take final action on them in June. Um, so I guess, you know, in, in my mind, um, there will be an upcoming opportunity. Um, November of 2023 to bring a complete application um, to consider an EFP at, at that time. So um, anyway, I, I, that was just intended to be my, my feeling on this issue. Um, I don't believe it warrants a standalone addition on our management measure list um, because management measures um, 
I, I view them as a separate category from EFPs. We see these other items on the list that talk about moving EFPs into regulation and that that's when they become something on the management measure list. So um, I guess that's where I stand on this item and it doesn't reflect at all about a sense of priority in the sense of um, or how I how I view um, a decision on an EFP. I think we had that discussion in the context of the widening utilization package and um, agree with that path forward at the appropriate time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Marcy. Brad Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Grolnick. Um Ryan, earlier you mentioned, uh, talking about B2 and B6 and how B2 was was lagging as far as information to go forward, and B6 probably did. Were you envisioning um, both those, when they're both ready, moving together for efficiency's sake? Or um, was that a possibility just to, so we can, you know, as a gain efficiency in this, in this um, in what we do here? Or, um, and if that's so, um, how much information are, are we actually collecting under B2 and when might it be ready to move forward in the future? Well, to the chair, thanks, Mr. Penger, for the question. I mean, we don't have a specific vision of how you might package that. It's really kind of up to the council. Um, they are different fishing activities, I, I would note. Um, you know, as of as of right now for you know for b6 on the midwater front we've had plenty of efp trips north 42 especially i do think there's enough data i mean th this is the level i can speak to right now it's really um up to the council to say how they would want to package it and then of course to see what the scoping and analysis would go um for uh for b2 um you know I think we're on we're on year four of this one, um, but uh, we've, we're allowed to have ten vessels to participate. But I'd estimate maybe only two vessels take a handful of trips each year. So uh, that's at least our current read of the situation. So if the council wanted to package those together, I mean that's that's really up to you. But I think my initial assessment and my response to Maggie was that we definitely know we have a, a lot more data for uh, B six than we do B two. Okay, thank you. I, I, actually, I believe that reason is because people are concerned about salmon and they're just trying to minimize the, the effects as much as possible. So, thank you. All right, further discussion? Corey Reddings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wanted to briefly speak to item B14, the prohibition of directed short billy rockfish fishery. Uh, we heard Dr. Shuster talk about this this morning, and um, I continue to think that this is a really important issue with a lot of ecosystem impacts and um, with new aquaculture developments coming online, potentially even here in California. Um, I think that this continues to be a really important item and something that we should keep on the list. Um, I don't know exactly how to prioritize this. Um, there's a lot on the plate, that's pretty clear. Um, but it would be great to see this somehow um, slated for consideration and perhaps the latter half of this year, or um, somehow prioritized. Uh, I'll note that ODF and W produced an excellent report back in November. Um, and that's a provides a really nice starting point for work on this. So um, I'll leave it at that. I just wanted to um, voice my support for that item. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corey. Further discussion? And if not, um, if there's a motion forthcoming, we can have discussion on the motion. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. I would like to offer a motion.
I move the council adopt the lists of prioritized and candidate new management measures presented in tables A and B in E6A Supplemental GMT Report 2, March 2022, Appendix 2, except do not include B16 at sea processing south of 42 degrees, 10 minutes north, combine into one package of limited entry fixed gear follow-on actions, B3 permit price reporting, B-17, program cost recovery, B-18, removal of base permit, B-19, follow-on gap recommendations, allow hook and line endorsed tier sablefish permits to use slinky pots for vessels with stacked sablefish endorsed permits, allow vessels to fish a cumulative non-sablefish landing limit for each permit, allow a fourth permit per vessel. And before there's a second, Sandra or Chris, whoever's the magic behind the screen there, if you could change the top bullet where it says 42 degrees, 10 minutes north, I believe that should just be 42 degrees. If you could delete that 10 minutes for me, please. Thank you. Okay, is the yeah. language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, thank you. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Heather. Uh, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, I appreciate the GMT's provision of these lists to us and the additions they made in their supplemental report reflecting uh, guidance and er, and council actions at this meeting that have occurred uh, up to this point. So uh, proposing that with the exceptions noted here, we uh, adopt those lists. I spoke uh, earlier in discussion about my uh, belief that we have very substantial workload already on the plate, uh, both in the A list of prioritized items as well as um, already in progress, as Marcy reminded us, looking at uh, Appendix 1 to the Supplemental GMT Report 2. And uh, we, we have um, a, a limit on workload capacity, both in the GMT, in the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, and everyone who is working on these items. So this reflects a, a really streamlined approach of um, prioritizing new management measures as well. Let me speak uh, just to a, a couple of them in particular. Uh, as I said, this does, uh, or earlier, um, I, I do support and this motion does add to um, the, the prioritized list, the new item, the GMT is labeled A5 for stock definitions and stock complexes. And so I uh, think that it will behoove the council to have some discussion on what the next step there should look like and when we want to take it. Uh, so we should maybe all be thinking about that in preparation for our workload planning discussion. Uh, if we are, are prepared to make any process and scheduling decisions at this meeting, uh, I, I'm sure that would be helpful. It may take some further thought and input, so recognize we might not be ready to do it then, but I wanted to flag that. Um, we had a fair amount of discussion on the B-16 item at sea processing south of 42 North, and I am suggesting we, we not include it here based on the uh, discussion that it is not a, a management measure item. It is an EFP proposal. Uh, Marcy recommended that that be considered at the normal ground fish, in the normal ground fish EFP cycle. I think uh, I also heard Heather Mann's uh, request that this be considered as soon as possible and um, certainly recognize the history of this item and, and having it removed from the whiting utilization package. I hear the importance of it to industry. Uh, I think the council 
can consider at a, at a future time whether it is under the um, the regularly scheduled ground fish EFP item or we want to consider an out of cycle EFP, I understand that there are probably no set aside implications of this EFP. So it doesn't have that required connection to a specification cycle, but as noted, it would be significant workload and that is important to factor in. Um, and recognizing that we have just taken action on a suite of other whiting utilization measures uh, you know, again, that all supports uh, my, my recommendation here. On the uh, packaging of the limited entry fixed gear follow-on actions, uh, I think I spoke to this earlier. Uh, it makes sense to me to package them for now, but I, I do believe we will be wanting more information on them. You will note that I removed the second generation language from the fourth permit per vessel only because I, I think that that language has been very confusing. We, my intent is to have the gap in industry and GMT start from the concept that the gap was proposing in their report, but I, I do think that that will need further uh, scoping and, and fleshing out. But indicating here, by putting it on the candidate list, the council's willingness to have it further considered at some time, although not yet assigning it a priority. And then uh, I'll just speak to a couple things that have come up in discussion that you don't see on this list. Um, the B8 item, discard mortality rates. I think there is uh, some priority to those, particularly given our, our situation with some of the nearshore rockfish stocks appreciate the GMT's information uh, that there is, is work going on uh, to develop some uh, uh, mortality rates when descending devices are used and that uh, we hope to receive a report or some information on that uh, possibly in June if it's ready then. Um, and I, you know, again, that I guess that just would lead me to remind everyone that although this meeting is our overall holistic big picture look at the ground fish workload. Of course, we can make changes at any item. And if we receive information that we are prepared to start taking action on, on any particular topic, uh, we can move it up and, and prioritize it at that time. On the discard mortality rates, also uh, recognize the GMT's comment that uh, it probably is not a management measure per se, it's a catch accounting issue regardless it is uh, ground fish workload. And then finally on short belly rockfish, uh, I think you all know that ODFW is very interested in uh, the topic of prohibiting and developing a prohibition on a directed fishery. We remain so. Uh, we continue to hope that the report provided last fall will serve as a good starting point for some scoping. Um, it remains on the, on the candidate list, uh, certainly proposing to to uh, keep it there, I think it's been added there since last fall when we had considered putting it into the specs package but decided uh, instead to, to add it to the list of new management measures for a separate FMP amendment pathway. Um, and again, continue to think uh, that's a good approach, but I don't feel that it is urgent uh, based on uh, a lot of information we've covered before. I won't cover that ground again here. So uh, I did not feel there was justification to prioritize it uh, above other items right now and, and move it up to the A-list. That concludes my remarks on the motion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maggie. Are there questions for maker of the motion? Discussion on the motion. Staring hard for hands, I don't see any. So if there uh, is no discussion, then I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for the motion. Maggie Summer. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just make one more brief remark that I forgot to include, um, which was just recognizing the, the discussion we also had and the note in the GAP report about the existing EFPs. I'm not looking at their item numbers, uh, but the, the fact that in particular, the uh, midwater non-whiting trawl EFP uh, pro probably has a substantial amount of data available now due to um, good participation in that sector. I think we, we are interested in looking at uh, moving that into regulation. Uh, again, didn't feel we had the, the information here to allow us to prioritize that. Um, and uh, therefore, I, I did not address it with the understanding that uh, it can continue in EFP form uh, for now. So it, it, that's not suggesting there will be an, an end to that opportunity until it's moved into regulation. But certainly we'll be interested in exploring further with GMT or National Marine Fishery Service, however appropriate, um, the data that's available on that so that we can inform ourselves on, on when we are ready to um, really start moving forward on putting that into regulation. <laughs> All right, thanks for those comments, Maggie. Is there further action on this agenda item? Uh, let me turn to uh, Staff Officer Todd Phillips to see how we're doing on this agenda item. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe, um, well, the council has offered a motion and has in, uh, indicated their priorities for the for the, the list, as well as uh, done some revision and editing to said list. Um, looking at the, the discussion, I would say that you have completed your council action on this particular agenda item. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Todd. And uh, thanks to the council and particularly to Maggie for the motion. Uh, that concludes our action on agenda item E6 and will take us next to E7. But we're doing uh, fairly well on time here, so we'll take a, an early morning break uh, and we'll be back at uh, 9.48 or so. We'll take a full 15 minutes here. Thank you.
All right, let's uh, mosey on back to our seats and we'll continue on with agenda item E7. All right, E7 in season adjustments. Uh, Todd, why don't you get us rolling? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, good, good morning again, Council. So for in season adjustments, this agenda, I, agenda item's objective is for the Council to consider progress to date of ground fish fisheries, as well as routine in season adjustments for 2022 fisheries. Um, these adjustments, of course, could include such things as catch limit adjustments or adjustments to season structure. Um, looking at your action today, it is to consider projections for 2022 fisheries and adopt any in-season adjustments for 2022 as necessary. Your um, packet includes only one report, which is a report from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The GAP and the GMT did not submit any statements at this particular meeting as they, uh, as in their discussions, they determined that there were no um, needed adjustments, at least based on their, their thoughts and discussions. So that is what I have, Mr. Chair, for this agenda item, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you may have. And I'll also note that should the council have any questions for the GMT or GAP, there are members in the uh, webinar here that are ready to answer those questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Todd. Are there any questions from council members on the overview? All right, so we'll get started with our loan report. Uh, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Todd, for the overview. Just like to refer to uh, supplemental CDFW report one, our uh, report on 2021 groundfish harvest in California. This is our final update on the status of the 2021 fishing season relative to ACLs, harvest guidelines, sex, sector allocations, and ACTs that were applicable uh, during 2021. Uh, we provide our normal tables of mortality from the recreational sector and the commercial trawl, non-trawled sector broken out separately and then combine the recreational and commercial totals uh, in table one and compare those to the federally designated harvest specs. Uh, looking at table two, for the monthly recreational catch, uh, this is uh, the same information that's provided to RECFIN and reflects activity across all recreational management areas for the calendar year. Looking to table three, uh, these uh, data are from PACFIN uh, and also are um, across all management areas for the year. Um, Notably, attainment of shelf rockfish stocks and nearshore stocks was higher in 2021 compared to 2020 by both the recreational and the commercial sectors. Attainment of lingcod and deep water stocks in 2021 was similar to 2020 in the non trawl sector. While all California catches in 2021 were within established specs and guidelines, the ACL contribution of vermilion rockfish to the total shelf rockfish complex ACL, and this is for the south of 4010 uh, shelf uh, ACL, um, was exceeded. You see in uh, table one uh, that uh, was exceeded by 138% of the ACL contribution to the complex uh, as shown in table one, um, 230 tons of uh, estimated recreational catch and uh, close to 60 tons of commercial catch for that, um, the harvest of vermilion uh, toward the ACL, um, the total shelf ACL. 
so that exceeded the contribution um, by 138%. So um, notably though, we, we foresaw that that would be the case by the end of 2021. And we did, uh, recommend that the council act to reduce the recreational sub bag limit for vermilion rockfish. Uh, that action was taken uh, by the council and then concurrently um, by the California Fish and Game Commission and new regulations are in effect both for state and federal waters that establish a reduced sub bag limit of four fish. Um, beginning in 2022, just wanna flag that um, we'll begin providing our catch updates at the April Council meeting and that in response to the results of the 2021 stock assessment, uh, this future uh, or the in-season report that we typically provide under this agenda item will, will change up a little bit and will include estimated take of quillback and copper rockfish uh, in addition to the select ground fish species and complexes that we've reported on throughout 2021. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy. Are there questions on the CDFW report? Uh, I have one question, Marcy. I, I noticed that, you know, vermilion is part of the shelf rockfish and we had relatively low attainment of the complex but relatively high attainment of one component of the complex and it's i'm not that experienced of a fisherman but <clears throat> that would suggest a highly selective fishing on this one particular stock so do you think that's the case or do you think that um, perhaps the uh, limits that have been established for that stock uh, don't reflect the actual abundance. Uh, thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, I would say that uh, vermilion rockfish is a popular target uh, in the area of south of 4010 popular both for uh, sport fisheries and for commercial fisheries as well. It's uh, one of the um, higher priced uh, rockfish that can be uh, sold on the market, um, desirable. Uh, as for recreational fisheries, um, vermilion is one species that is um, widely encountered um, and again is a a desired target for recreational anglers, and in fact uh, spans um, a number of habitats and, and depth profiles. You can uh, successfully uh, target and catch them in, you know, anywhere from 20 fathoms down to you know 100-ish, um, and are in a variety of habitats. Um, so. We did uh, recently in, in 2021 complete a new full stock assessment that shows the stock uh, is healthy. And we have, um, we're taking up the matter of uh, biennial specifications and other agenda items uh, to look at the allowable um, yields and how uh, this, man this species can continue to be managed effectively in the minor shelf complex. So not sure if I answered your question. Um, you did. Okay, <laughs> all right. I, I, I expect it's answered as well as we can at this stage. Are there any other questions on the CDFW report? All right, I'm gonna see any hands. Thank you very much, Marcy, for the report. Uh, that's our only report. Uh, I don't believe there's any public comment the last time I looked, but let's just take another look and see if someone has signed up in the last few minutes. Or, oh, I'm sorry, Heather Hall, you have your hand up. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. That's okay, thank you, Chair Grelnick. Um, I wanted to take uh, Todd up on um, his offer to ask a question of the GMT, uh, even though they don't have a report, if I might. 
Um, so I, I just wanted to follow up on a request that um, was brought up late last fall about the DTL fishery. Um, we heard that they were impacted by COVID um, and had requested that the GMT start tracking catch in, in the DTL fishery early in the year, uh, just in case there might be an opportunity to increase um, limits for that sector earlier than September. Uh, so just wanted to check uh, with the GMT. I, I also know I'm not blindsiding them with this question. So um, if I could get an um, update on that. So who's here from the GMT to? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Whitney Roberts from the GMT, just verifying that you can hear me loud and clear. Sound good, Whitney. Thank you. Great, thank you, Heather. And, and thank you, Heather, for the question. Um, yeah, so I went ahead and took the um, incentive to just run the model, even though we aren't doing a report this uh, agenda item. Um, I ran the projections and then also uh, looked at how landings and prices were tracking so far in the first period, which is the first two months of the year. Um, in general, the prices, the 2022 prices so far, um, at least for the um, limited entry north, open access north, um, and limited entry south, actually for all of the four um, sectors, the prices are tracking um, lower than both 2020 and 2021. Um, I don't have any context as to why that may be the case. Um, I'm sure there are a number of factors that weigh into um, this, the prices in 2022, and I'm, um, I'm sure industry would have some really good input on that if the council um, <clears throat> was interested. But uh, in general, the prices are tracking lower than 2020 and 2021. Um, but I will note that um, for the limited entry north sector, uh, the landings are looking a bit higher and better <clears throat> than the past two years. Um, and in fact, we're the highest um, in the last five or second highest in the last five years. Um, and so those are looking really good. Um, and then for the open access north sector, um, participation um, is higher than it has been in 2020 and 2021. Um, and then similarly, landings in 2022 have generally been higher than um, than to date in the past two years. Um, so to me, this this indicates preliminarily that um, the sector may be uh, somewhat rebounding from their impacts from COVID in terms of participation and ability to land in markets. Um, however, there is that, that still that caveat that prices remain fairly low um, compared to historical trends to this date. Um, and so... For the limited entry south sector, of course, this one um, tends to attain a little bit lower than the north, um, but it's seeing um, some low participation compared to the limited entry north um, may not be rebounding as much from COVID. I know that there are some um, infrastructure issues that is still uh, sort of weighing into participation, um, and especially for the open access south sector, that is continuing to be low, um, and we've commented on that in the past. Um, so I hope that helps answer. And then in terms of projections, um, the projections that I ran, given that there isn't a lot of new data, are very similar to the November 2021 projections that we provided for 2022. Um, the two months of data we have so far doesn't really change um, how the the fleet is projected to catch their 2022 um, land and catch shares, but we will certainly rerun the projections um, for April and June and um, see if there are ways that we may be able to increase the trip limits ahead of schedule um, so that all of the fleet has an opportunity to <clears throat> take advantage of those higher trip limits. Um, and happy to answer any follow-up questions if that didn't capture everything you're looking for, Heather. Thank you. Whitney, thank you very much, and thank you for keeping that um, on your radar and having so much information um, for us right now. I really appreciate it, and um, I heard you mention that we would have more information not only in April but also June to help um, inform what we do about that, so look forward to hearing that. Um, thanks again. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other reports? Okay, there is no public comment. So that takes us to council 
discussion and action here. And um, we, we've taken a look at some projections and we have an opportunity to adopt any adjustments if necessary. Um, so let's see if there's any discussion here or any motions. Um, all right, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm not seeing any discussion and I'm not expecting any motions based upon the body language I'm seeing here and certainly nothing amongst our virtual participants. So um, unless I see a hand go up, I'm gonna go back to our staff officer and see how we're doing. Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe that this agenda item has been covered adequately uh, by the council um, and the action, well, has been completed. Thank you. And I can answer any other questions that you may have. All right, thank you very much, Todd. Um, salmon would be next on our agenda, but we're not ready for that yet. So we're gonna go to our next ground fish item, E8, and I will hand the gavel to our vice chair, Brad Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. And I'll turn to uh, John DeVore to get us started off on E8. John. Uh, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Agenda item E8 concerns uh, stock assessment priorities, groundfish stock assessment priorities uh, for the next two assessment cycles. That would be 2023 and 2025. And this has been the Council's convention to uh, provide an early signal so that uh, uh, science centers and and um, and scientists who support the stock assessment process can can do some advanced preparation um, a couple of years out. Um, so uh, the last time uh, you took this up was uh, when you made final action um, on stock assessment priorities in June of 2020, and decided um, both the. 2021 assessments, which of course have already been conducted, reviewed, and then a candidate list uh, for next year, 2023. Um, in the uh, situation summary, I list the stocks that were uh, considered candidates at that time for stock assessment in 2023. And in that list, you'll see that there are some stocks that were underlined that at that point in time were stronger candidates. Um, those stocks included uh, yellowtail rockfish south of 4010, green spotted rockfish, bank rockfish, brown rockfish, tree fish, and yellow eye rockfish. Now, of course, that, that's a, a very preliminary list, and, and um, new information always comes that may uh, compel you to have different priorities, so there's uh, nothing standing there. Um, in your advanced briefing book, um, we have uh, uh, three attachments that, that came through from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center that describes the uh, assessment prioritization methodology, um, a summary of the available data to support groundfish stock assessments next year, and then the, um, the famous uh, assessment prioritization workbook that uh, um, Dr. Jim Hasty and uh, Dr. Chantel Wetzel have um, provided for us that's uh, always very helpful in informing uh, council decisions on stock assessment priorities. Um, they also will have a PowerPoint presentation to give that goes over the high points uh, from all of that information. Uh, in addition to those attachments, we have um, two of the three uh, terms of reference that guide the stock assessment process in the advanced briefing book. Um, one for the groundfish and coastal pelagic species stock assessment process for 23 and 24, and there's marked up versions with some comments and proposals from both the SSC and stock assessment teams um, for your consideration. Um, and then there's uh, a draft terms of reference for the groundfish rebuilding analysis uh, with a couple of uh, proposals there. 
the third terms of reference, it wasn't in your advanced briefing book because prior to the council meeting, there were no proposed changes to it. And that's the uh, terms of reference for methodology reviews. Um, going back to attachment four, which is the draft terms of reference for ground fish and coastal pelagic species stock assessment process. Uh, the council back in June of 2020, um, based on a recommendation from the CPS management team, uh, recommended that two separate terms of references uh, be prepared, one that's ground fish centric and one that's CPS centric. And you'll see um, supplemental to the briefing book, uh, both the uh, CPS management team and the SSC um, uh, in certainly endorse that um, and, and then propose a schedule for sorting out that terms of reference. So it's our expectation um, that the council will uh, continue to uh, favor that uh, having separate terms of reference and we are prepared to do that. And so really the focus here will be on the ground fish uh, stock assessment terms of reference. Um, we have a supplemental, oh, we also had in the advanced briefing book, it's attachment six was, which is the SSC groundfish subcommittee report on the groundfish stock assessment process review. Uh, we had a webinar that was held on January 25th um, of this year. And so you'll see uh, the discussion and, and some of the proposals that affect that uh, groundfish stock assessment terms of reference. And um, so we put that in for information and it's, ref it's referenced in, in uh, some of the supplemental reports uh, you have here. Um, supplemental to the briefing book, we have reports from the SSC, the Groundfish Management Team, the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel and the CPS Management Team uh, for your consideration. And uh, as I mentioned uh, early in this briefing, we have a PowerPoint from doctors uh, Jim Hasty and Chantel Wetzel to go over the uh, assessment prioritization workbook and some of the uh, high points from that. And um, if, and so that's all I really have for this. This is a preliminary decision out for public review and the council is scheduled to make final decisions on stock assessment priorities in June of this year. So unless there are questions on the overview, I recommend that we uh, take the PowerPoint from uh, Drs. Hasty and Wetzel. Okay, thank you, John, for the overview. Um, questions for John? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So we'll go to the uh, Science Center report and uh, Jim Chantel, welcome. Good morning. Um, do we know if Dr. Jim Hasty is online yet this morning? He was uh, planning on presenting, but if not, I would be more than happy to. I see his name, so I think you're good to go. Okay, so. Can you, can you hear me? We can. Oh, okay. Great, I was trying to connect through the phone and that wasn't working, but I just unmuted my computer and that seems to work. So all the better, thank you. Didn't mean to give Chantelle a scare there. I would like to start off by thanking her very much for uh, her increased role this year in pulling all of the new data together and, and helping to update the mammoth spreadsheet. Uh, next. Um, as John mentioned, there are three at attachments that have been provided to you. He's described these, so I won't, but drawing your attention uh, to the fact that we revised uh, attachment three uh, early in the week. <clears throat> and, uh, next, there was an, an inadvertent error in updating a portion of the assessment frequency scoring tab. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, we think everything is correct. 
now. Next. So the goal of this process, of course, is to identify stocks for uh, one of the major types of assessments in 2023, benchmarks, updates, or data moderates, the sorts of assessments that provide us with stock status information. Uh, primarily what we'll do during this presentation is to review uh, very quickly the, the uh, elements that are provided in attachment three, the workbook, uh, look at the preliminary species ranking for 2020, uh, discuss those a bit. We'll have a quick look at the calendar and then we can answer questions about this presentation or the other attachments if that's desirable. Next. <clears throat> so within the workbook, uh, each one of the elements there that's listed in the factor column has its own tab, and those are organized uh, into four major groups, fishery importance of a stock, stock status, <clears throat> ecosystem importance of the species, and uh, a couple of others in an assessment information category. Next. <clears throat> So the first uh, element in fishery importance is commercial fishery importance. Uh, not surprisingly, sable fish is the most important here. Uh, the scoring of this element uses uh, the sum of ex-vessel revenues over the 2016 to 20 period. Um, and importantly, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the scores within this tab do not include uh, fish sales by uh, tribal members. So this would be non-tribal commercial. Next. In uh, the recreational fishery importance, we don't have a, a clear analog to ex vessel revenue on the recreational side. So back uh, several cycles ago when we initiated this new process, we developed a pseudo revenue variable that is created by multiplying each of the state level uh, landed weights for recreational species by uh, an importance weight uh, that is state specific that ranges from 0.5 to 2. And those were developed with the assistance of the recreational uh, members of the, from the states uh, on the GMT and also in discussions with uh, the GAP. <clears throat> and this, uh, that pseudo revenue is transformed in, a, in the same kind of way uh, that commercial revenue is. And here we see lingcod and black rock fish being at the top of the heap, followed closely by vermilion sunset. Next. Uh, then we have a uh, tribal importance from fishing, and this is divided into two parts. One of them is developed much like the commercial tab uh, scoring, where uh, ex vessel revenue from fish sales is uh, scored in a very similar way, but only to a maximum of seven instead of 10, and then three points are reserved for subsistence importance, and with stable fish being uh, the top scorer in both of those categories for the tribes. And these were developed previously with uh, tribal representatives uh, on the GMT and with their help consultation with other Northwest tribes. Um, Nothing has changed in the in the subsistence scoring of this since last time. Next. Finally, there's a kind of a catch-all tab for uh, choke species considerations and also constituent demand. And for choke species, we, we changed this element a little bit this year and tied it more directly to another tab that appears in the spreadsheet called 2024 Specs Limiting. And basically this takes a look at the recent 
average catches and compares those to the preliminary 24 ACLs that are uh, moving forward in the current uh, specs process. And so the more constraining a species looks like it might be, uh, the higher the, the point scoring for that. Uh, the spreadsheet was developed at a time where we thought there would be a quillback rebuilding plan. And so yellow eye and quillback are identified here as uh, the most important uh, choke species with the highest scores. Next. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back, Sandro. Uh, the, the second component of that uh, includes modifiers that capture situations where a species is much more important either to a, a specific fleet, so you know, hook and line versus trawl on the commercial side, or a state uh, in either the commercial or uh, recreational ranks. So in particular, if you have a species like a brown rock fish that perhaps doesn't show up as, as high on coastwide ranks because it's only found off California, then that could get extra points in this category uh, for being more important within California. Next. And then we have another, uh, as we move into uh, status considerations uh, for rebuilding stocks, again, the same caveat for quillback here, and there's uh, scoring that's based on uh, where the stock is and, and how, how soon it's projected to rebuild. And so these are the only two species that were awarded points in this category. Next. Then we have a category that captures stock status, uh, where it's available. And so not surprisingly, as uh, the stocks uh, for higher stock status, uh, particularly when a stock is assessed to be above the estimated unfished level for its uh, spawning biomass or spawning output, it receives very few points. As it declines into the precautionary zone, it, it receives between five and seven points. If it's if a stock is below the MSST, the minimum stock size threshold, then it would receive eight to 10, depending on how it's trending. And in some cases then, uh, where we haven't done an assessment previously that's capable of identifying stock status, then we've used the PSA or vulnerability scores that were developed uh, back in the 2000s as a substitute for the scoring. So you'll see there's uh, a large group of species uh, that receive six points in this factor, and all of those have unknown stock status and have uh, PSA scores that are at least two. Next. Uh, the analog then uh, to stock status is fishing, fishery status. And here we're looking at whether uh, the harvest of a stock over the three year period, 2018 to 20, uh, is higher than, near, or quite a bit below the average OFLs or the sum of the OFLs, the, I guess, average OFLs that were adopted for those three years. Uh, when looking over on the right-hand side, uh, the species that are listed in italics in the slide and in the tab are ones that contribute to a larger assemblage OFL, uh, values that are non-italicized but in bold, like petrolisol, uh, are those that have individual OFLs. So you can see petroli and widow rockfish there are the highest attainment species relative to their OFLs among the stocks that are that have individual OFLs. Next. 
we have one tab that addresses ecosystem importance, and this uh, looks at uh, ecosystem importance from two directions. First, top down, and and that captures what is eating uh, managed and protected species. So the top scorer in this 2016 EcoPath model in that category is Pacific Hake. So it is consuming, by virtue of its volume, uh, more weight in managed and protected species than any other stock. Now, Hake isn't included in this exercise, but it sets the, the top score at 10, and then others are arranged below that. From the other perspective, the bottom-up score is what managed and protected species are eating. And there, the top score goes to phytoplankton and in fauna. And where species were grouped into assemblages in this ecopath model, we've uh, distributed the, the scoring for that assemblage among species based on the 2018 to 20 uh, OFLs or OFL contributions as that was the most universally available analog to abundance that we had available. Next, we have a new assessment or a new information category uh, that attempts to capture uh, in a sub somewhat subjective way, the potential for information that's be become available since the last assessment or in is available for a species that hasn't been assessed previously that could contribute to a successful assessment. Also, where there have been uh, issues or problems that have been identified in prior assessments, is there information or new approaches that would be available to resolve those? And, or in circumstances where uh, the uncertainty category that was associated with a prior assessment might be able to be upgraded to result in a lower uncertainty buffer. Next. The last contributing tab to uh, the factor scoring is uh, the target frequency and the years since the last assessment, if there's been a previous assessment. And this tab is really the most important factor for rotating species through the rankings and particularly in lowering rankings for stocks immediately after they've been assessed. The initial target for, for the species that we can, we estimate uh, a target assessment frequency, and that uh, is based on mean age and catch that's transformed. But then there are other additive adjustments to that that reflect recruitment variability, fishery importance, and ecosystem importance. So the more important species are, or the higher their recruitment variability, uh, the more frequently uh, they should be assessed. And so the target assessment frequency is reduced due to those factors. Because of our biennial process, we round that to the nearest two years. And you see on the right-hand side there, a distribution of the ultimate target frequencies uh, for the species that are included in this exercise. You'll note too that there are a large number of species that don't have that haven't previously been assessed with anything uh, more extensive than a data poor catch only assessment. And we don't have the information that we need from those species to develop a target assessment frequency. So for those we establish uh, an initial scoring uh, value of four, and then for all species, there are a few other modifiers that are applied. Uh, this year, we've also uh, assigned an arbitrary value of negative four 
for all of the species that have, were assessed last year in 2021. And that doesn't mean that those species uh, weren't important or, or potentially uh, shouldn't be assessed again uh, in the next cycle. It just means that uh, they have to overcome a bit of a handicap and in, uh, in the form of uh, higher scores in, in other factors. Next. And so in the scoring of this element, we see a number of species up at the top that haven't been assessed for quite a long time. Black rockfish is, is right up there, uh, even though it's, it's its assessment is a bit more recent than some of the others it's grouped with. It is still beyond its target frequency. Uh, the three stocks there that are identified for 2013 were previously assessed as index-based data moderates back in that year as part of the first ex experience with data moderates. And then you'll see the stark magenta color reflects uh, majority of the species in the top 25 or so here that have not been assessed previously. Next. So then we take all of the raw factor scores and put them together and multiply them by uh, the weights that are shown in blue. These weights haven't changed for several cycles. I think they're still the same as maybe the first year that we did this. Um, and those are designed to bring a balance to this that reflects the traditional uh, decisions that have been made uh, for assessment priorities. Um, I would note, though, too, that the rankings that flow from uh, the weighted scoring uh, are advisory. Uh, in, in some cases, drawing attention to species that otherwise might uh, pass under the radar. And in the near term, uh, these certainly need to be considered in the context of available data. Uh, they, the rankings may also, in turn, where we don't have enough data, highlight the need to get more data to assess species that have uh, importance in uh, one or more of these categories. Next. So here is a, a brief summary of the top 40 scoring species with black and brown the trolley, pullback, and rose thorn at the top. Uh, there are some species that we have assessed fairly recently, as in quillback and sablefish. Sablefish tends to be a species that is hard to move very far from, from the top just because of its importance in so many areas. We can come back to this slide later as part of discussion, if you'd like, but note in the, in the workbook as well that we have one column that shows the, the list or shows the designation from the Council's 2023 preliminary listing back in, in June of 2020. Uh, we also have some of our thoughts on 2023 options in the column next to that, and then a pair of columns that show when the last assessment was done and what kind of assessment was done. So we have full data moderate updates, length-based data moderates that we did last year, and data poor assessments, which do not provide us with uh, a status determination or, or a status, uh, stock status. Next. So just very briefly, for those of you who invested time in looking at the workbook before it was revised, uh, the magnitude of the changes is fairly small. Uh, generally speaking, because of the nature of the error that was made, species that have more fishery importance move up. 
So say a species like brown rockfish or blue deacon, yellowtail, Pacific cod, those species moved up. Other species that are somewhat less important move down. Sometimes they don't move down because their score changed, as in the case of sablefish, but because other species uh, moved up in front of them. Most of the stocks uh, towards the top moved less than four spots. Next. Obviously, data availability is a huge factor for a number of species in determining whether we could assess them in 2023. Uh, one takes a look at a stock like tree fish. There aren't a lot of, uh, throughout its range, there are about 600 annual uh, lengths that are collected, but uh, virtually nothing in the way of age structures. And the dark color, uh, the dark magenta in the index potential column here uh, indicates that um, there's not uh, a high likelihood of being able to develop an index of abundance, either from uh, the Northwest Center surveys or from a recreational CPUE. Um, uh, one note I would make on this slide as well with regard to quillback is that even though we have an annual average of just over 400 ages or age structures that haven't been aged, uh, I think most of them got aged this last year. Um, very few of those are actually from California. So when you think about the potential to do, uh, a, say, a full assessment for quillback in California, just be aware that um, there would be very a very small proportion of these of that number that would be available for that exercise. Next, and then we have the. Uh, rounding out the top 30 here, um, same sort of information that uh, was provided. There's a full set of this type of information in the data availability tab, along with some other multi-year summaries of data that are a complement to uh, the attachment to that uh, provides much more detailed annual summaries of data by source. Next. So we, now we have a few slides on items to consider uh, in your uh, deliberations for uh, selecting species for a preliminary list of importance that can be discussed and, and potentially more information assembled between now and June. Black rockfish is highly important in both the recreational and commercial fisheries and, and also in other aspects. Uh, we anticipate that there will be new survey data available from Oregon, and that would be beneficial since there were some challenges with the Oregon portion of the 2015 assessment. Um, <clears throat> with regard to Stock delineation consequences. It is important to note that uh, the 2015 assessment had three areas, and there were uh, good reasons in terms of data availability for uh, the assessments to be divided along state boundaries. Uh, hopefully, um, progressing as you voted yesterday uh, in option one for the development of an FMP amendment that, that work on defining stocks and stock boundaries could be progressing in a timely manner to, uh, to be available for results of a three area assessment next year. Uh, there are several top ranked species in the list this year that have not been previously assessed. At, at least above a catch only data pour level. Uh, those include rose thorn, red banded, and tree fish. Of those three, rose thorn and red banded are 
sampled reasonably well by the uh, West Coast Ground Fish Bottom Trawl Survey. Um, and so they could be done as either full assessments potentially or as length based data monitor assessments. Tree fish uh, is, <clears throat> uh, would be less well suited for a uh, a full assessment and even a, a length-based data monitor would probably lack any source of index information. Next. Quillback rockfish, uh, which you became very familiar with last year, was uh, highly ranked again this year due to several factors primarily relating to uh, the recent levels of catch relative to past OFL contribution levels and its potential to be a choke species in, in the near future. Um, there would be little additional new data available for a full quillback assessment in 2023, um, with the possible exception that uh, the SSC will be uh, reviewing uh, in a workshop format later this year uh, using the use of ROV visual data in assessments. And so the depending on the outcomes of that workshop, which I, if I recall correctly, won't be scheduled until the end of September, that could potentially provide uh, additional information for uh, quillback rockfish. Copper rockfish was assessed last year. It comes in at number 29. Uh, there would be some sources of new information that could be included in a full assessment, and those are listed here. Incidentally, we don't think at the, t at the current time, and we plan to look more at this, that um, for much of California, there would be um, data from the CCFRP survey uh, that's conducted via uh, institutional consortium in California. Uh, per, there's perhaps the chance that uh, we'll back index of abundance could be generated in the north of California, north of San Francisco, but uh, we'll need to spend some more time looking at that uh, this spring. Next, there was an update uh, for Petrali Sol that was conducted in 2019, um, but the last full assessment for Petrali was in 2013. Some of you might recall that two years ago in 2020, when we came forward in March with the initial package, we did not yet have the 2019 survey data. <laughs> and if you look at the figure in the, in the right, where, where you see survey trend information, you can see that there was a big dip in the survey between 2017 and 2018. At the time, in, in, at this, uh, the, the March 2020 meeting, there was a lot of concern about doing an assessment um, in 21 based on, on that uh, downward tick in the 2018 survey. By the time we got to 2000, or uh, by the time we got to June, we did have the 2019 value, which is the last one in this figure. And that was a, a bounce back up in that survey index. And that uh, set people's minds a bit more at ease with regard to Petrali, and we didn't end up assessing it in 2021. But again, because of that variability in the assessment index and the fact that we don't we didn't have a 2020 survey, uh, where the 21 survey index point falls relative to these recent ones will likely be pretty important in determining the value of uh, a 
full assessment in uh, 2023. I say full assessment because in the interim, we have developed analysis to support use of a, an ecosystem driver of recruitment in this assessment that can only be added uh, in the form of a full assessment, not an update. And so we really think that the next assessment should be a full in order to incorporate that information. What we do see about recruitment right now, though, is that there hasn't the, both the samples that have been aged from the survey and, and the survey lengths, which are a little more complete probably, uh, don't show a lot of sign of recruitment since about a decade ago. And so, again, that will be uh, something we would look for in data from the 2021 assessment. Next. Yellow eye rockfish, uh, the rebuilding analysis uh, that was last done in 2017 indicated that uh, there was a 50% probability of rebuilding in 2027. We have, uh, as, as always, here limited new data because of restricted landings and the fact that our uh, bottom trawl survey doesn't sample yellow eye rockfish well. So it would seem somewhat unlikely that we'll get enough new information that might suggest the stock uh, was actually rebuilt in 2023, uh, but that is a possible stock for an assessment update. The last assessment of rough eye and black spotted, although that's ranked 27, it does show the potential to be uh, a somewhat constraining species, and there have been some years where it has been caught in uh, large numbers in the hake fishery. We have done genetic testing of, uh, of rough eye and black spotted as, as identified by our, our folks on the bottom trawl survey. And that information would help inform the, the underlying percentage of black spotted in, among those two species, which was not well understood in the last assessment. And, uh, as John DeVore has pointed out in previous advisory body meetings, we might not need a new assessment uh, to, in order to change that designation, uh, but it all, also will have been 10 years since this fish was assessed last. Also in that category are the thorny heads. Uh, long spine is, is never ranked as high as short spine because of its uh, lesser importance to the fishery, short spine does check in at number 22. Both of these were last assessed in 2013. Noting here that the prior assessments have effectively been uh, catch length index data moderates as we don't have uh, a way yet to reliably age those species using our traditional aging methods. Both of them are well sampled and we have lots of length and, and reliable abundance index information for them from the bottom trawl survey. Next. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, there were three species that are in the top 30 that were last assessed as index-based data moderates in 2013. Uh, the two flatfish are very well sampled by the bottom trawl survey and would also be good candidates for the sort of uh, length-based data moderates using survey indices. Um, potentially, uh, three or four of those stocks might be combined into a single panel uh, for review. Uh, the prior brown rockfish assessment relied on a CPV index of abundance. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of aging potential for an assessment next year, which means that it's not the best of candidates for a full assessment, 
but in order to include both link data and a recreational CPUE index in an assessment, that would have to be a full because our terms of reference for the length-based data moderates uh, prohibit the use of fishery-based CPUE indices. Uh, striped tail and green striped are not as highly rated uh, or ranked, uh, but they also have good uh, length-based data moderate potential uh, using survey indices. And then finally, uh, blue deacon and boccaccio would be other species that would be potential candidates for update assessments uh, last assessed in 2017. Next. Um, our calendar is quite uncertain at this time because we don't have uh, a, we don't have dates yet for the June 2023 council meeting. You'll see two Sundays in June that are colored in dark teal, and given uh, the new holiday status of Juneteenth on the 19th, uh, it looks like the most likely weeks that would hold the bulk of council days would would involve those weeks of the 11th or the 25th. So which of those would get uh, selected for a council meeting would have impacts on uh, the dates for earlier star panels that could uh, still feed uh, assessment results into the June council meeting. You'll see that last week in April has uh, darker lavender coloring while the two first weeks in May are lighter colored, indicating that uh, the ability of those weeks to feed assessment results into the June council meeting would probably depend on selection of that later time period towards the end of June. Uh, as a result, if the earlier week were to be selected in June, that might well result in a larger share of our assessment results getting fed into the September council meeting. Next. And so that concludes our presentation. Uh, we're available to answer questions on any of the attachments or the material covered uh, in this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for a pretty complete summary of, uh, of this agenda item. Uh, questions for Jim or uh, Chantel? Marcy, you're up. Go, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Dr. Hasty. Um, just a general question about rose thorn rockfish. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the confidence in the fish ID and the data streams and, and the confidence uh, that we have in them that uh, it's a full suite of information that we'd be working with? Yeah, uh, thank you, Marcy, for that question. That's a, a good question that has, has come up in uh, in discussions with the uh, with the SSC in particular, uh, John Field raised the point that uh, some of these species that have had lower amounts of uh, catch and where the the annual amounts of catch are uh, calculated using the species composition sampling proportions. And in some cases, uh, particularly as we go back in time in dealing with fish that uh, may have uh, a fair amount of fixed gear catch, uh, weren't necessarily sampled uh, as well as uh, even minor species that have been uh, more major parts of the, the trawl fishery over the last 30 years. So I think that there is some concern uh, when evaluating uh, some of those species like rose thorn and, and red banded. Um, there ha 
has been work ongoing to uh, develop procedures to improve some of those uh, estimates of catch over time, but um, I think there's probably still more work that could be done on that front uh, before we undertake some of these species. It is, yeah, the concern is that we have some of the species like rose thorn where the data poor assessment that has been done um, is providing an OFL contribution of 15 tons and our fishing mortality has been 21 over the last five year, or over the last three uh, years from 2018 to 2020. And, and so the reason that that gets elevated is this concern about, you know, could a new assessment that brings more information to bear uh, to provide a, a higher OFL? Um, and so those, we can certainly um, attempt to look more this spring at those catch histories and, and potentially have some discussions with your staff and the Southwest Center over, um, you know, in an attempt to you know, better evaluate what the potential problems are with those before we get to the June meeting. Thank, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hasty. I, I, I raised the question only because in California, um, we have rosy rockfish that are quite abundant and frequently encountered in at least recreational fisheries uh, throughout most of the state. So I just would have some concerns that potentially there might be challenges with fish ID, uh, catch histories, and uh, what may have taken place with um, apportionment or um, catch reconstructions. So um, I appreciate that offer for uh, discussion uh, as needed in the, in the sidelines with the appropriate uh, states or agencies. Um, if I may have a second question, and I think I see John's well, hand up. Well, if I could, I see John Dorn had his hand up. Uh, so maybe, um, John, did you have something relevant to the first question? No, I'd, I'd, I'd say um, I'll defer to Marcy and I'll ask my question after she asks hers. That's fine. Okay, very good. Marcy, please. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So uh, next question is on Petroli. I think it's slide 24. Yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned the 2021 trawl survey results that aren't yet available. Um, in our delegation discussion this morning, I learned that those results are likely to be uh, available by June, so might assist us in our discussion on prioritizing that species. Is that correct? Yes, uh, we'll certainly, we're hoping to have those results by early April, and so um, it, it certainly would be possible for us after we have a chance to examine those results and, and see where they fit, both in terms of the compositional data, at least the length data, since uh, we won't have aged anything from the survey yet, uh, but also perhaps more importantly, the index value and to see, you know, are we moving up from the 2019 value or moving down. And if we're moving down, given that Petroli has the highest attainment of its OFL and ACL uh, of any of our major species uh, over <clears throat> 2018 to 20, we caught almost 90% of the ABC for Petroli. So um, if, if there's a, a indication of a downturn, I think that would elevate the concerns for, for doing a Petroli assessment. And we'll try to get that information out there in advance of the briefing book to interested parties. 
Okay. Thank you, Marcy, for that. Um, John DeVore. John? Well, thank you. Um, my question is also on Petroli. Um, I, I see here that you say there's no sign of strong incoming recruitment since 2010. However, in viewing the assessment, uh, 2010 had uh, um, a negative assessment estimated recruitment D even it was actually 2012 that was above average. Um, the only reason I bring up that little uh, detail is that the gap um, has a reference in their statement to Petroli recruitment and I don't want the council to be confused about that. So I'm presuming um, that that is a typo on this slide. Jim? No, uh, that that judgment uh, wasn't based on the last on the updated assessment. It was based on looking at the data in the in the survey. So the the bubble plots for length and age, uh, those don't show um, a uh, or there isn't a strong indication there of. 2012 recruitment. Um, so, I mean, there may well have been other fishery data uh, in the 2019 survey that uh, was indicating um, a, a larger 2012 recruitment. So, um, I'm not discounting that result. I'm just saying. Uh, the information that we will have to look at in between now and the June meeting is primarily from the survey, although I, I suppose we could look at uh, the fall fishery length composition data. Um, I don't know how much of that will have been, uh, how much of the commercial data will, would have been aged uh, to this point, but we could certainly bring in uh, a look at the commercial length uh, data as well and go back to the 2019 update and see what was driving uh, those estimates of your class three. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I, 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 don't, I don't think this discounts the overriding message that you just haven't seen evidence of uh, strong recent recruitment. So uh, I wouldn't quibble about a couple of years anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think the point is that it's been a decade. And, um, and we don't, <clears throat> this is a fishery that has been driven by uh, strong recruitment. And uh, if we're not getting strong recruitment, then uh, it, we certainly, the trolley is certainly a species that we don't want to be pushing down into the precautionary zone. Um, and so if there is uh, some suggestion of, a, of more of a downturn, then uh, it would be best to have a new assessment and one that brings as much information to bear as possible. Um, so we get the, the best possible idea of where we are and where harvests need to be to um, maintain the stock at a healthy level. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, Phil Anderson, Bill. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks, Jim, for the presentation. I have uh, questions in two different areas. First has to do with uh, recreational. I think it was you don't necessarily need to go to it, but I think on slide seven, it displayed the relative importance of different species to the recreational fishery. Um, I note on one of the Excel spreadsheets, I don't know exactly where I found this, but it, it breaks down um, uh, by relative weight, uh, by state, um, the relative importance of species to the recreational fisheries. Um, and of course there are, there's a, a couple of, uh, commonalities between the three states in terms of importance, lingcod and black rock fish being, being the ones that stand out to me. 
Um, there are other species that there are stark differences between the relative importance to the different uh, states uh, from a recreational perspective. And I just um, wanted to, to call that out that um, there are some very significant differences between the states on which species are the, um, important. And I didn't know if there had been any consideration to show us a, kind of a state by state ranking um, so that we would be informed by that. And perhaps where I find that is this Excel spreadsheet I'm looking at. Um, and so yeah, in the, in the uh, recreational tab for that, it would be possible to, um, you know, to rank the columns that show the pseudo values by state in order to, to get more of what I think you're talking about, Phil. And, and also keeping in mind, too, the, that constituent demand tab in situations where we might have a species that was considerably more important in one state than in the others, then that would be a place to where we might add a little more weight in for, for that species than would be captured on this tab um, where, uh, where we're looking at or we're doing the ranking on a coastwide basis. But we could certainly add in rankings by state into the, the next version of the spreadsheet if you think that would be helpful. Thanks, Jim. I, I, I hesitate to ask you to add more slides to your presentation. <laughs> but I, I do think that those relative weights that are in that one Excel sheet are somewhat informative. My second comment just in this recreational category is that at least for Washington, We've seen some fairly significant uh, changes in the in uh, what species are are in the relative dominance in the in the fishery, uh, and in in particular, yellowtail rockfish in recent years have been playing a greater role in our recreational fisheries. And more recently, obviously, because of that, it's a stock that's been rebuilt and and uh, restrictions have been have been eased, the canary rockfish for Washington is playing a very big, a much bigger role now in the recreational fishery than it did two or three years ago. So uh, there have been some significant changes. I didn't know whether the, the, uh, the years that were used uh, to, to make the, the qualifications in terms of the relative weights uh, and, and, and uh, species importance to, to recreational fisheries included recent years, like in the last couple of years where at least I've observed, I'll say anecdotally, but also backed up by landing data that we've had some significant changes uh, in our recreational fishery and de particularly dependent on canary and yellowtail rockfish. So, so I yeah, guess that's a good, yeah. The, the question good was, point, you know, so whether there's recent years data included in the analysis. Yeah, the data there go up through 2020, and in part, you know, when we're developing this initial version, we um, we don't have uh, or haven't, you know, had uh, complete data from the the previous year's fishery. And so the other factor is that the, that we've used a five year uh, some in this. And so we're reaching all the way back to 2016, where obviously Canary wasn't, uh, the management of it wasn't reflecting its rebuilt status at that point yet. And so as where we have trends like that using five years can can mask a bit where things are right now. Um, for the fishery status, we've only used uh, a three-year period, and so we might consider in the future, you know, how things would be different in this and would it be a better 
reflection if we were only using three years you know there's always a trade-off between variability um, and instability in those estimates if if you're not trending in a direction then five years can help uh, mellow out some interannual variability but if you do have a trend going then that um, that's not so good so thank you for pointing that out and just my second category of, of, of questions, Jim, and is is a is just about Pacific Whiting and understanding, of course, that Whiting is managed through our process um, through the U.S. Canada Agreement for for Whiting and um, and the the assessments and the results of the assessments are coming through that process and and aren't necessarily uh, coming through our council process like they like they used to. And I just just point that out because I know there's a significant workload associated with doing the the, the um, assessments for Pacific Hake. And uh, just wanted to, I, I mean, assuming, I'm certainly assuming that when you're thinking about the capacity of, of our stock assessment authors to uh, do assess stock assessments through our biennial cycle here. There's also that consideration of the work that I suspect that some of those same people are doing relative to the whiting assessment. And it, it's almost, uh, it, you know, we, we just came out of, as you well know, being a very key uh, participant, particularly in our scientific review group in the whiting process that, um, uh, there's a there's a lot of activity there, and uh, it, it's almost out of sight, out of mind a little bit now in the council process. But um, just just wanted to make that point and and just check with my assumption that in thinking about what the capacity is in any given biennial cycle, that the, we have a substantial amount of work going into the uh, assessment of our our Hake resource. That's a terrific point, Phil, and, and it's one, you know, I'm not sure that we struck a very good balance. Last year, there were factors, some factors that we hadn't fully anticipated, but, um, you know, one of our assessment co-authors for, for Hake ended up leading the Southern Lincoln assessment, uh, and the other was helping on, on the Dover Soul assessment, but that one was also slated for an early May star panel. And so uh, most of the time work on these other assessments, even if they're not going to be reviewed until July, is is going uh, early on in the calendar year here. And so uh, it really is the case that the people who are involved in Hake cannot be relied upon to lead uh, an assessment uh, you know later on in the calendar year that you know they're certainly able to provide support for uh, others who are leading assessments but um, yeah it's a lot a lot on their plates Thanks, Jim. Hey, thank you, Phil. Further questions for uh, for Jim or Chantel? Uh, Corey Niles. Corey? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and, and, and thanks, Jim, and, and thanks, Chantel, for all the work. Really appreciate um, you laying this out for us. Um, maybe looking ahead to uh, council discussion a little or in, in some of the issues we'll see from the gap in the GMT reports. On, on slide 10, which I believe was the one where you have uh, yellow eye and quill back rebuilding stocks. One, a, a simple question is yeah, the score seemed backwards to me, I, but maybe I've mixed up in um, terms of why a shorter rebuilding time would have a higher score. But bigger question is, as you as you noted later, later on that Quillback, if if it's coast wide as is as it's the presumption now under the FMP, 
it, it's not overfished. But the, the question in my mind, how, and I, we've asked you this in the past and you mentioned it somewhere, but how do you treat, looking at Quillback as an example, and we're, we're having a, gonna have a concerted effort to look at stock definitions, especially in the near shore, but it, I will presume that there will be some smaller scale populations here. How do you, how did you look at that smaller area and like the differential status of, of Quillback off areas of California versus in the Pacific Northwest, for example? Well, the, um, in the stock status tab, which is, uh, I think the, the one right after this, uh, the, um, we look at, at those status questions on a coastwide basis for all species because we're, you know, we're trying to keep the spreadsheet with one row per species. And so if you look in, in that tab, um, Sandra, if you could go to the next slide real quickly here, um, that, that one identifies pull back up there at the top at 26%. And so that reflects the coastwide distribution um, and or the coastwide set of assessment results. And that, according to the thermometer on the left side, results in a score of seven points, in part because the trend was declining as well. Um, if you go back to the Prior slide, Sandra, uh, just to say something quickly, it generally, um, you know, what we're looking at in the scoring is uh, whether a particular condition puts greater emphasis on, uh, on doing an assessment in this upcoming cycle. And our general theory has been if a stock has, has been assessed and it's not predicted to rebuild in within the next 20 years, then the necessity of doing an assessment in the upcoming cycle is less than one where uh, we think there's a greater possibility that new information coming into the assessment might show that it's already rebuilt. And in fact, the highest score uh, under this factor is for a stock that we think will be rebuilt in the next assessment. So I, I, I don't know if that helps with uh, understanding the motivation for these scores, but we could talk more about that offline later if need be. Yeah, thanks, Jim. And no, oh, thanks. And I think um, I may have one more question, but I saw I think I saw Maggie's hand go up, so I will defer. And okay, she's shaking her head. No, uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And I, I guess one last question um, for me on brown rockfish, and just in terms, this is a lot of effort you put into it, and that keeps scoring highly. It's it's I think it was number three, maybe. Um, yet we don't see it being recommended by the GAP or the GMT. Um, so it just, it, to me, it's an example of, you know, we put all these quantifications in, into the here, and yet there's other factors that people look to, but I don't know if you had any, had any, any brief, um, and maybe I'm wrong, but no, there, but why, why isn't brown rockfish popping up in people's minds as a priority? Do you think? Well, I think the challenges with brown rockfish are, um, you know, the lack of age data, uh, the fact that, you know, there there was a recreational CPV index that was used in 2013. Um, there's, in looking to, um, and one of the things, as I mentioned, that we'll be looking at more closely this spring is the potential for uh, indices of abundance to be derived from the CCFRP survey data in California. The preliminary look that Melissa Monk had at, at those data thought that uh, there was no chance really of, of an index uh, 
south of Point Conception, a possibility in Central California, and probably, yes, north of San Francisco. Um, the thing to consider, though, is that trying to explore and implement an assessment in a situation like that will be complex. And, um, you know, the last assessment that was done was for the entire state of California. If one has, you know, potentially say an only a uh, fishery independent index in, in Northern California that one doesn't think, or one doesn't have any reason to believe would represent trends in other parts of the state, then that would create some challenges for an assessment author in, uh, how to go about using that information and might lead to uh, at least exploring smaller areas uh, than the entire state, which would get us back to uh, some of these stock delineation issues, but also, um, you know, the potential for diluting other sources of information uh, when those are split among multiple areas. So. Um, I guess the other question would be, did they want to devote a full assessment slot to it, noting that it would not have as much age data as our typical full assessment, but that that approach, you know, if one wanted to take the most data-rich approach and make sure that all of the length data could be included, then the only way to get uh, to be able to add in the previously used uh, fishery CPUE indices would be to do a full. Thank you, Jim. Okay, thank you, Corey. Anybody else have questions? Um, actually, I, I do, um, Jim. Uh, two questions, actually. and. Um, the first one would be, um, I had a lot of complaints from folks about uh, not incorporating um, or the uh, closed areas into the assessment cycle or into the, into the assessment. Um, and I didn't, it wasn't the star panel, but I'm kind of curious if, um, if, if folks up there in the, the Science Center have been looking at ways to incorporate those closed areas um, and to give them some credit for that somehow. Um, because a lot of these issues that these stocks were having are in the nearshore waters. And um, I'm kind of curious where you're at on that. Are there any plans um, on working on that? Um, where are we at? Well, yes, that's certainly an issue that, that came up last year. And uh, I believe that there's an SSC workshop that is going to be looking at that. And our folks will certainly be contributing and participating in that uh, later this year. Uh, it's a very challenging question. In some circumstances where there might be ROV or other surveys that are, or survey type monitoring that is sampling both uh, fit areas that are open to fishing and areas that are closed, then there may be some potential to uh, explore uh, alternative assumptions about uh, fish density. Um, the trouble with our assessments is that, you know, we're always looking to have two types of information coming in. One of, one of them tells us about abundance, you know, in the form of, say, one of these indices and in trends in that. The other tells us about the stock composition. Uh, and so we rely on the length and age data to, to tell us about uh, how, how, how fish are distributed by age and how much recruitment variability there is within the population. And those things can be much more challenging to, to to document differences in between fished and unfished areas, um, particularly if there's only visual monitoring going. John, so it's, it's an issue that 
that we're interested in looking at, but we're also going to have to invest a lot of time over the coming year in uh, in the stock delineation issue and bringing data together, identifying sources of data that bear on uh, that question. And we'll also be doing a lot of work this spring as I conveyed to the gap on looking at survey and assessment uh, potential impacts from wind energy areas. So we have a, we have a lot on our agenda. Oh, I don't doubt that. Um, I see John DeVore has his hand up there, John. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm uh, Jim's recollection. Um, you'll see in the SSC C7 statement that there's a provo proposed ground fish subcommittee meeting to explore approaches to deal with large closed areas and other regulation changes in stock assessments, and that's proposed to occur in late mm -hmm. August. So um, that's that. Okay, thanks, John. Um, and my last uh, question, uh, Jim, is um, on, I think slide 11, I see a PSA scores. I'm kind of curious, when's the last time um, uh, I'm sure those are from the COPE et al. paper. Um, when's the last time uh, those were updated? I don't know exactly. It was in the late 2000s, I believe, somewhere in the 2007 to 2009 range. I think John DeVore might have a clearer recollection than I do. And of course, um, the vulnerability aspects of um, of the stocks may have changed less than uh, there, or those may have changed a bit more than the productivity um, issues. But um, there has been some discussion, I think, in the GMT and, and elsewhere about the at least discussion of the value of trying to update that exercise, uh, given that we're in a different management situation than we were 15 years ago. Yeah, thanks Jim, I see John has his hand up again, John. Yeah, just to confirm that those PSA scores have not been updated since the COPE et al uh, paper and um, uh, and I also agree with Jim that the susceptibility scores are, are due for an update since the fishery has changed. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I'm not seeing any hands, Jim. So uh, I think we're we've uh, we've uh, we're appreciate you coming up and uh, and uh, helping us out here. So okay. Um, Thank you. We'll stick around in case questions come up during uh, council discussion. Please do. Appreciate that. Okay, next up is uh, John Field with the SSC report. John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me all right? We can. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is John Field, a member of the SSC. I'll be reading from SSC report for agenda item 8 E8A. The SSC discussed planning for new groundfish stock assessments for 2023 and 2025 and revisions to three terms of reference that guide the stock assessment process. The upcoming stock assessments will inform the harvest specifications and management measures and decisions for groundfish fisheries in 2025 and beyond. Doctors Jim Hasty and Chantel Wetzel of the Northwest Center presented information and analyses that support the proposed stock assessment priorities and responded to questions. These analyses remain largely unchanged since 2020, and the SSC appreciates the analysis and reports completed for this agenda item. The SSC provided Dr. Hasey with minor suggestions for modifications to the stock assessment prioritization workbook for future cycles. That includes better explanation of the range and rationale for the scores used in each category of information ranked in the prioritization and provision of a consistent rationale for the calculation of the factor scores for each category. The SSC discussed the interactions between the species prioritized for stock assessments, many of which are nearshore species, and the council action on groundfish stock definitions and future FMP amendments that will define regions for management units and stock status determinations. Despite the uncertainty in future stock definitions, stock assessment considerations for a few more highly prioritized species were discussed. 
Black rockfish is an important recreational species with new data to inform future assessments. Rose thorn and red banded rockfish could be assessed as full or data moderate assessments, but both of these assessments will need to address the higher than usual uncertainty in the catch data given these species are very minor components of rockfish fisheries. Tree fish is likely to only be possible to assess using data moderate methods. Brown rockfish would likely need to be conducted as a full single area assessment in California waters because this assessment would depend on recreational CPUE indices uh, for abundance information. There's limited age data for brown rockfish as well. Rex and English soles are good candidates for length-based data moderate assessments. While update assessments require less time for review, they require nearly the same amount of time to complete for the analysis, for the analysts, sorry. Uh, Catch-only projections could be completed for stock assessments that cannot be updated due to limited staff capacity for full and update assessments. Alternatively, data poor methods could be applied to such stocks or less intensive update methods such as those informed with just lengths and indices could be considered. The SSC marked up versions of the three terms of references that will guide this brownfish stock assessment process for 2023-24. These changes reflected the outcomes from the 2021 Brownfish Stock Assessment Process Review Workshop held in January of this year, including input from stock assessment authors. The SSC recommends that future data moderate assessments be reviewed in a stock assessment review panel. The SSC recommended that um, such changes to the TOR be available for public review. The SSC did not recommend changes to the methodology review in terms of reference. The SSC Grantfish Subcommittee intends to hold a webinar during April 2022 to resolve comments in the current draft terms of reference. The SSC concurs with the CPS management team plan for revised CPS terms of reference that could be considered during the June and November council meetings. And that concludes our statement. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, John. Questions for John on the SSC report? Corey Niles. Corey. Thanks, uh, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair, and thanks, uh, Dr. Field. I've got a question for you on your the sentence on the SSC talking about the interaction between this item and the stock de delineation matter, for uh, to paraphrase there, and just kind of articulate some thoughts bouncing around in my head and ask for your reaction to them. You'll see in the uh, gap in GMT reports, we're, they're, we're looking at uh, possibly recommending copper and, and quillback for full assessment, which are two of the stocks that, that brought up many of these questions about how do we how do we um, identify stocks and uh, stocks for assessment, you know, stock units for uh, for status determination. And I guess just to again to try to get give you a better idea what's in, what's in mind is, you know, we, we're not making a determination, for example, on Quillback uh, this cycle, yet it would seem that uh, uh, one possible likely result is that Quillback, for example, could be at least three different stocks um, using using the states as, as, as borders, as boundaries. So, and, and using Quillback as an example, again, Looking at Oregon and Washington, both were near B40, and it was California where where the, it looks like the depletion was happening. So, you know, for a long time, you know, WDFW has you know looking to the to how uh, intensive assessments are, you know, sought to look to focus priorities on on areas where fishing pressure has been higher, especially in the near shore. So, for example, we're thinking that Quillback off Oregon and Washington looks like a lower priority for for folks time and in, in, in California a high priority so But that's just an example of how do we this in this stock delineation conversation is going to take a while looking at this assessment cycle Do you interact how to how we how we most efficiently take up questions like that when when looking at Quillback? What, what if we said focus on Quillback off California? It looks like the highest need um yeah, how, I'm going to stop there. See if you have any reactions. I I know you well enough to think you you probably get where I'm going, but yeah, just to, what are, what are your thoughts on this this how we look at stock priorities and this broader stock delineation question? 
thank you, Mr. Niles, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Uh, it's it's a good one, <laughs> and probably a, a difficult one to answer um, with a whole lot of certainty, which I think is, is part of the problem. There's uh, a lot of uncertainty around how exactly we grapple with this. Um, I believe that the SSC statement on E3 does reflect um, some SSC discussion, uh, a little bit more SSC discussion on this issue to the extent that um, our, you know, our, our hope and recommendation and, and advice would be that um, what for whatever we end up doing with respect to stocks, definitions for status determination and management units does not preclude uh, taking a reasonable approach to uh, defining the uh, assessment areas that we use to develop the assessments, which um, take into account a range of factors, in, including our best perception of what a stock might be and the data limitations um, and regional differences and potential trends that might be associated with that. So I guess I would try to mostly defer back to that statement and, and the concerns that we raise there in, in addressing this question and hope that um, you know some, some dovetailing of uh, those concerns uh, and reflections help um, put this into context. And I, I hope that's a reasonable response um, to the question because I'm not sure what more I could say that was actually discussed at the SSC uh, at this meeting. Thanks, John. It's 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 um, somewhat reassuring to it. It's complex and confusing to you as well. So no, I appreciate you giving those thoughts. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Marcy Yermko. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, happy Saturday, John. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I'm just wondering if maybe one, one thing that wasn't covered in the statement that I, I kind of thought we might hear a little bit about um, is the situation with the Sigma clock and how that uh, fits into our discussions here on stock assessments. Obviously, that's that's been a huge consideration for us as we deliberate um, the number and type of assessments and the relative trade-offs. And um, I guess I was just expecting to maybe see a mention about um, plans uh, that may be in the works for um, simplifying that process or revisiting it um, into the future. So maybe you can bring us up to date. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and Ms. Yaremko for the question. I'm sorry, just to clarify, I had a little warble in my connection there. Did uh, Are you referring to Sigma? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Sorry, I, I missed that little bit. Um, briefly, we, we didn't really discuss um, Sigma very much at this meeting. We did discuss it a little bit and, and the potential to um, kind of revisit that and circle back um, to that at the uh, Grandfish Assessment Process Review and some options for uh, reconsidering the, the Category 2 and Category 3 Sigmas. Uh, were discussed, and my, the best of my understanding is that we have not really gone a whole lot further than um, discussing them with respect to work at the science centers themselves. I think there are a few um, efforts ongoing in, in the background um, by some workers, but I don't think anything's risen to the level at which we're ready to um, have a serious discussion or, or revisit that. So. Um, I guess I would have to apologize and say that I, I, I can't really say a whole lot more than was reflected in the um, in, in the groundfish assessment process report, um, but perhaps with a little prodding, we can um, give that a little more brainstorming and thought and report back in either April or June. Thank you, Mr. Rice Chair. Thank you, John. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, appreciate that it's uh, still on the radar. Um, even if the work isn't quite ripe for our consideration yet. Just uh, we'll look forward to hearing maybe a little more in April. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Marcy. Further questions for John? Okay, not see any. Thank you, John. Uh, next up, 
is Joe Peterson, the GMT report. And um, we're, we're probably gonna try to get through the reports and we're gonna take probably a long lunch. So uh, just the best way to do it. So um, Joe, are you there? Yeah, good morning, um, Chair, Vice Chair, and the members of the council. Um, I'm Joe Peterson um, from the Groundfish Management Team, and I'll be reading the Groundfish Management Team report on preliminary stock assessment plans and terms of reference. The Groundfish Management Team reviewed the documents in the advanced briefing book and received an overview from Dr. Jim Hasty and Dr. Chantel Wetzel of the National Marine Fishery Service, Northwest Fishery Science Center, and John DeVore of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, 2023 preliminary recommendations of species to be assessed. The GMT recommended list of species to assess in 2023 is shown in table one. These include combination of top ranking species from NIMS assessment prioritization analysis and lower ranked species that the GMT identified as possibly being higher priority for assessment due to a range of factors. The GMT recognizes that the number of recommendations are likely to exceed age reading and assessor capacity, especially given the several recommended assessments may require separate area models, hence a prioritization is provided. Additionally, going forward, the Scientific and Statistical Committee recommended that future data moderate assessments be subject to a stock assessment review panel. The Northwest Fishery Science Center indicated that four data moderate assessments could potentially be reviewed together within a single star panel, especially if the species selected had similar life history and data. In response, the GMT has identified four species that may facilitate a data moderate assessment. Finally, we also explain why we do not recommend a full or update assessment for yellow eye rockfish in 2023, but rather a catch only update for 2023, although yellow eye rockfish was on the Council's 2020 motion on guidance for assessment prioritization in 2023. Uh, table one, as we go down, so GMT top priorities, which we will talk about further in this document, are black rockfish, petroli sole, rough eye rockfish, quillback rockfish, and copper rockfish. Alternative species were yellowtail rockfish. The four data moderate assessments indicated in the previous paragraph from the GMT were long spine thorny head, short spine thorny head, English sole, um, and rex sole. Um, and other catch-only updates indicated throughout this document would be cow cod, uh, Pacific spiny dogfish, and yellow eye rockfish. Um, <clears throat> so rationale for selection of species to be assessed in 2023. Uh, for black rockfish, GMT recommends a full assessment. Uh, black rockfish are a highly important species off the west coast. There is a new acoustic survey data that is supplemented with underwater video and hook and line data available in Oregon that could be used to better inform the assessment of this area. Full assessments are recommended coastwide, acknowledging that the species will likely have regional assessment areas. Um, the GMT notes that if, these species, if this species is included in the final selection by the council, action will need to be taken to amend the groundfish fishery management plan, assuming there will once again be an area assessment similar to 2015, such that the 2023 stock status determinations could be adopted by NIMS. This applies to any species selected for assessments in 2023 that will have multiple assessment areas across the West Coast. Petroli sole, full coastwide assessment. The last full assessment for Petroli sole was conducted in 2013 with subsequent update assessments being conducted in 2015 and 2019. Since the last assessment in 2013, there is a new recruitment driver relationship that could be used in the next full assessment to better inform Petroli sole recruitment within the model. Given the commercial and tribal importance of this species, and it will have been 10 years since the last full assessment, the GMT recommends a full assessment in 2023. Rough-eyed black-spotted rockfish, uh, a full coastwide assessment. Rough-eyed black-spotted rockfish was not ranked high. It was number 26 within the um, NIMPS assessment prioritization, but the GMT recommends that it should be considered since the last assessment was conducted in 2013, meaning that we are now at the end of a 10-year project projection to set overfishing limit OFLs and ABCs. Rough-eyed black-spotted rockfish has had high recruit recent attainment um, and future catches are projected to be constraining um, by the 2024 annual catch limit. 
which could impact the at sea Pacific whiting and um, IFQ trawl fisheries. Additionally, there is likely to be new genetic information which could help inform the proportion of the stock that is rough eye versus black spotted rockfishes off the west coast. If black spotted rockfishes are determined to be only a small por portion of the catch relative to rough eye rockfish, this information could allow the assessment to be classified as a category one rather than a category two, similar to the assessment for Vermilion Sunset. Um, rockfish between Point Conception and the California Oregon um, border in 2021. Um, the GMT recommends a full assessment for rough eye black spotted rockfish in 2023. Quillback rockfish. The GMT recommends a full assessment of quillback rockfish to be con conducted in 2023. This species was identified as a high priority based on the results of the 2021 length based data moderate assessment. Having the opportunity to incorporate all available data for an assessment would allow stakeholders to have increased confidence in the assessment results and any resulting management actions. A full assessment would allow for the inclusion of additional data relative to the 2021 length-based data moderate assessment. Although the additional data available by 2023 that could support a full assessment may be fairly limited, especially relative to full assessments or similar nearshore rockfish species. Some of the additional data sources that could be eval evaluated for an inclusion in the full assessment are age data. There will be limited otoliths available for aging collected by commercial and recreational fisheries in California prior to 2021. However, CDF and W has increased fisheries data collection across nearshore stocks, which would result in additional data from 2021 and 2022. There are existing age data and additional otoliths that could be read, collected within Oregon and Washington waters that could be incorporated in area-specific full assessments. Fishery-dependent indices of abundance. Depending on the available data, indices of abundance from the commercial and or recreational fisheries could be estimated. Fisheries-independent indices of abundance. Um, quillback rockfish were observed in remote operated vehicle surveys conducted in California waters between 2020 or 2013 and 2015. However, the limited number of observations may preclude the use of these data in a full assessment, but a more detailed analysis should be conducted to understand the potential of these data. The California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program has observed quillback rockfish north of San Francisco and could be evaluated to create indices of abundance using data starting in 2017. Additionally, um, CCFRP may provide additional otoliths for aging. Um, ODFW's new acoustic survey data that is supplemented with underwater video and hook and line data available in Oregon that could be used to better inform the assessment of this area. While the survey was focused on black rockfish, there could be useful information and data for quillback rock. Future workshops. The SSC is currently planning a workshop to examine spatial issues and stock assessments. The results of this workshop could provide new pathways for future nearshore assessments to account for closed areas. Data from ROV, acoustics, and other closed area surveys may provide additional insight on this topic. Copper rockfish. The GMT recommends a full assessment of copper rockfish to be conducted in 2023. The 2021 data moderate assessment estimated that the portion of the species south of Point Conception was below the management threshold. Given the importance of copper rockfish to recreational fishers, fisheries off the west coast, conducting a full assessment would allow all available data to inform management. Across the coast, there are several additional data sources that could be used in a 2023 full assessment age data from recreational and commercial fisheries, along with survey ages from both the Northwest Fishery Science Center hook and line survey and the CCFRP would be available for use. Additionally, uh, there may be both fishery dependent from commercial and, and or recreational fisheries and fishery independent indices of abundance that could be evaluated for use in a full assessment. Similar to quillback rockfish, future assessments of copper rockfish may benefit from the outcome of the spatial issues and stock assessment workshop scheduled for later this year. Yellowtail rockfish, full assessment. 
The GMT recommends a full assessment of yellowtail rockfish, although ranked as a lower priority relative to the previously discussed species. Yellowtail rockfish was last assessed in 2017. At that time, only yellowtail rockfish north of 4010 um, resulted in an SSC endorsed full assessment. Current coastwide mortality of yellowtail rockfish between 2018 and 2020 on average is only approximately 50% of the OFL. However, effort may be moving onto the shelf due to other council actions, which could result in increased catches, especially south of 4010, where changes in the non-trawl RCAs could allow additional access to where yellowtail rockfish are commonly encountered. Um, Length-based data moderate assessments, a general note. Dr. Jim Hasty and the Northwest Fishery Science Center indicated that up to four species with data moderate assessments may be able to be reviewed within a single star panel if some of the species selected had similar life histories and available data sources. The information guided the GMT selection of the four species identified for potential data moderate assessments in 2023. Long spine and short spine thorny head. The GMT recommends a catch length and index data moderate assessment for both long spine and short spine thorny head in 2023. Although ranked as a lower priority, depending upon stock assessment capacity, assessments of long spine and short spine thorny head were last conducted in 2023 and are now at the end of their 10 year projections to set OFLs and ABCs. Long spine and short spine thorny head otoliths currently are una unable to be read for age determination, preventing the inclusion of age data within an assessment. The 2013 stock assessments for these species relied primarily on catches, on catches indices of abundance and length comp composition data and align well within the terms of reference for possible data moderate assessments using catch index of abundance and length data. Additionally, both species are well observed in the Northwest Fishery Science Center West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey. Um, and the potential of having informative indices of abundance that could inform a data moderate stock assessment. English and Rex Soul. The GMT recommends a catch length and index data moderate assessment for both English and Rex Soul in 2023. Although ranked as a lower priority depending upon stock assessment capacity, both English and Rex Soul were last assessed in 2023 as index based data moderate assessments, meaning that both of these assessments are at the end of their 10 year projections to set OFLs and ABCs. Both English and Rexel are well observed by the Northwest Fishery Science Center, West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey, which could provide in informative indices of abundance along with links comp composition data. One clear advantage of applying a catch length and index data moderate assessment compared to an index only data moderate assessment would be the ability to estimate annual recruitment variation, which can be a key driver of population dynamics of flatfish stocks. Yellow eye rockfish. The GMT believes that there continues to be low probability of the assessment resu results diverging from the projections provided in the 2017 full assessment and rebuilding analysis of yellow eye rockfish which estimated a 50% probability of rebuilding in, in 2027. The GMT recommends not doing a full assessment of yellow eye rockfish in 2023 because no new data streams have become available since the last assessment. And there have not been changes in the existing data streams that would significantly alter the assessment outcomes or warrant structural changes um, to that model. That said, the GMT would be supportive of a catch-only update for yellow eye rockfish to allow tracking on the, on the impact of recent removals relative to the rebuilding status. Catch-only updates for 2023. The primary purpose of catch-only projections would be to more accurately reflect the current status of the, of the stock and update harvest limits, primarily by including actual removals rather than assuming the full ACL was caught incorporating this lower um, actual catch would increase future ACLs. As a, remainder, or as a reminder, catch only projection maintains all the parameters of the most recent assessment. 
can only update assumed removals based on the realized total mortality in years since the last assessment. CalCOD, south of 4010. The most recent full assessment of CalCOD indicated that the stock was rebuilt. However, there was some uncertainty in the assessment and the risk of alternative future harvest levels. A catch-only update will not resolve the uncertainty around the estimated current stock status. However, a catch-only update could be conducted in 2023 to help provide reassurances that even, through, even though CalCOD is rebuilt, management measures and total mortality have been precautionary. Therefore, the GMT recommends a catch-only update for CalCOD in 2023. Pacific Spiny Dogfish. A full assessment of Pacific Spiny Dogfish was conducted in 2021, which projected ACLs in 2023 and beyond that are expected to be increasingly constraining to particularly the groundfish trawl fishery. The primary source of Pacific Spiny Dogfish mortality if the ACL is exceeded or projected to be exceeded, the council could close areas important to the fishery. Only 48% of the Pacific Spiny Dogfish ACL was attained in 2021 and 2022 attainment could be similarly low. If that is the case, a catch-only update could, could update the projected ACLs based on realized catches and potentially alleviate some of the pressure on the at-sea and shore-based IFQ trawl sectors. Therefore, the GMT recommends a catch-only update for Pacific spiny dogfish in 2023. Yellow-eye rockfish. <clears throat> in between full assessments of yellow-eye rockfish, catch-only updates have been provided to show how mortality has been tracking compared to OFLs, ACLs, and removal assumptions. This could help show that we are still on track towards the rebuilding time estimated in the 2017 rebuilding analysis. The GMT recommends a catch-only update for yellow-eye rockfish in 2023. 2025 stock assessment tentative guidance. The new stock assessment prioritization process adopted in 2018 also includes council guidance for a tentative list of species to assess in 2025. The primary purpose of this tentative list is to provide more planning time for age readers and to better rectify potential issues with data inputs or model structure. Below are species that the GMT has preliminarily identified for assessments in 2025. Sablefish. Sablefish is a valuable groundfish species and based on the stock status estimated in the most recent update assessment conducted in 2021 and the changes in the pre-specified management risk tolerance PSTAR over the last couple of cycles. The GMT recommends that this stock be closely monitored by doing regular assessment. A full assessment of sablefish in 2025 should be considered a high priority. Yellow-eye rockfish. The most recent rebuilding analysis for yellow-eye rockfish estimated a 50% probability of the stock being rebuilt in 2027. Due to the importance of rebuilding this stock, and to track continued progress towards that rebuilding, the GMT recommends either a full or update assessment for yellow-eye rockfish in 2025. The results of a catch-only update of yellow-eye rockfish conducted in 2023 would likely provide additional insight on how the species is tracking relative to the rebuilding target year. If there is a concern the yellow-eye rockfish may not have yet rebuilt to the management target in 2025, an update assessment could be a way to formally evaluate the rebuilding status while providing additional capacity for other assessments. Other 2025 priorities. Any species that the GMT has identified as a priority for 2023, table one above, um, that are not selected for assessment in 2023. The GMT recommends that those then be considered as preliminary priority for assessment in 2025. The council may also consider conducting a Pacific Spiny Dogfish catch-only update in 2025, in addition to a 2023 catch-only update to incorporate any changes in trawl-based catches as a result of the Pacific Whiting Utilization Action Item currently being considered for January 2023 implementation. Assessment prioritization process. 
the GMT appreciates the in-depth analysis conducted by the Northwest Fishery Science Center on assessment prioritization. The assessment prioritization process includes several factors that incorporate state and or industry input. Um, since the importance of particular species may change across time, the GMT encourages future check-ins with the states, industry members, and the tribes to ensure the applied weights and species importance scoring continues to reflect current fishery conditions. Terms of reference. The GMT agrees with the SSC's ground fish subcommittee recommendations on the stock assessment process from the January 2022 ground fish stock assessment process review workshop. The SSC captured feedback from the GMT on how to improve future stock assessment processes. The GMT agrees with the SSC that in the future, data moderate assessments would benefit from a star panel review. Future items for consideration. There continues to be interest in assessing Pacific cod. However, Pacific cod off the U.S. West Coast is at the southern end of the range for that species, with the bulk of the species distribution off British Columbia and Alaska. Therefore, coordinating a regional or transboundary assessment may be the most appropriate assessment option. The GMT recognizes that the workload to create the needed partnerships, coordinate efforts, and agreements across management agencies to conduct a transboundary assessment of Pacific cod would be significant. However, the importance of Pacific cod to both tribal and recreational fisheries along the northern U.S. West Coast justifies the need for this effort. Thank you, and with that, uh, I will attempt to answer any questions. Thank you, Joe. Questions for Joe on the GMT report? Corey Niles? Corey? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and, and thanks, Joe. Good to hear your voice. Thanks to you and, te to you and the team for the, uh, the very thorough report. I guess my one question is about yellow eye rockfish. I've got some, I, I, I believe I agree with the team on the, on the recommendation of full assessment, looking at it for 2025. And I almost, I don't know if you caught my questioning to Dr. Hasty on his presentation and about the relative scoring versus of, of stocks rebuilding over certain time frames. Um, and I think I understood his, his answer of, you know, the longer you have to rebuild the, the less maybe pressing it is, but the thought I can't get out of my head is, is canary rockfish, um, which I think looking at this very handle, handy table in, in attachment one was, was assessed several cycles in a row, updated in full, and then, and then 2015 was a result that really changed everything. And it was you know just two cycles before that had been assessed. And that 2015 assessment said that the stock had actually built in 2007, which was in the management in 2007 was when I believe we were the ACL or OY as we called it at the time was, was at its lowest. It was 44 metric tons. The council had to close the area north of the lava, which really hurt the, you know, the, the trawl industry on Nia Bay and elsewhere. So if we hadn't done it, if we had waited, we would have been under a building plan for I don't know how much longer and looks like unnecessarily so and at, at great cost. So I, I see some differences with, with yellow eye but the last time this assessment was done in 2017, again, w without um, without any new data streams, um, seeing Chantel's chat there, without any new data streams, um, changed significantly as well. You know, rebuilding from whatever 2065 or, or later 2085, 2075, whatever it was, down to 2027. So that was also a huge change, which also resulted in a big change in the ACL that has, has brought more stability to, to these fisheries. So I don't know if you have reactions to that thought. Those, those are, that's just, I understand needing to prioritize our, the assessment needs, the, the aging um, resources, the, the resources for aging fish. Um, but yeah, had we waited for canary, had we waited for, for yellow eye based on this rationale, we, we would have been, um, the fisheries would have been under more restrictions than it looks like they had to be. So yeah, any any answers, reactions would be appreciated. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Corey. Um, yeah, and so for the first part, yes, we I've been following your conversation that you had on Canary earlier in this meeting. And um, I'd like to point out that the GMT put a lot of thought into our prioritization process. Um, we really, really thought that the um, documents put together from Jim and Chantel were super helpful in starting our discussions. Um, but like the same as the council has been discussing, um, you know, that's that's your starting point as far as for where um, you start forming where you're going to go with these different assessments over the next cycle. Um, for yellow eye specifically, um, one of the differences that we saw um, based on yellow eye versus, I guess, canary is the fact that so um, yellow eye was recently assessed and we felt that potentially not using our, I guess, our stock assessment chip, as we've called it in um, personal cycles, not burning that on yellow eye, we could potentially put it towards another species, at least, at least this cycle. Um, and we would be able to track um, yellow eye and see how it's doing um, against the previous assessment um, by doing a catch only uh, update. Um, towards yellow eye this cycle. Um, so that's kind of the where the GMT um, looked at it and how our discussions went. And Chantel, if you want to add anything more to that, um, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, sure, thank you, Joe. Go, go ahead, Chantel. I just uh, I saw you had a text that you had a um, your, your text there. So okay. please. Great. Thank you, Mr. Pettinger. I was quickly going to respond to Mr. Niles' question, and it's a very good question and something we should be considering um, when we look at the progress of rebuilding stocks. The major difference that drove Canary to be um, estimated to be rebuilt in the 2015 assessment was an updating of our understanding about rockfish productivity. So how many recruitments or how big a recruitment could be relative to the spawning biomass. And so in between the assessment before the 2015 canary rockfish, we had a much more pessimistic view. Um, so when we updated that parameter in the stock assessment model, uh, it became more productive and hence had actually rebuilt well below the target. Yellow Eye was last assessed in 2017, so has the same productivity assumptions. Our, our understanding of productivity really hasn't changed much since 2015. And so, you know, the, that parameter would not change in a new assessment and really result in a, a new understanding of the stock dynamics. Things have been relatively constant since the last time it was assessed. Thank you, Shadal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Chantel. And yeah, I wasn't. Thank you for that um, steepness comment, Chantel. That makes that does make it sense. Appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions for the GMT? Okay. I'm not seeing any. Um, thank you, Joe. And um, we're gonna, actually we are going to stop here. That's we've been out for two hours and twenty minutes, and so um, what we're going to take out. My chairman wants our chairman wants a, an hour and twenty minute lunch, so we're going to see you back here at um, one twenty five.
get going here. Now. We're going to go in here in just a minute or so. So stand by. Okay, I've got the uh, the green light here to, to take off. So um, we're back on E8 and the gap report, and I see uh, Gary Ricker and uh, Harris Nybach. Gentlemen. Good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, Gary. I'll be reading from agenda item E8A, Supplemental Gap Report 1, Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on Initial Stock Assessment Plans and Terms of Reference. Dr. Jim Hasty, National Marine Fisheries Service, Mr. John DeVore, Council Staff, and Dr. Chantel Wetzel of NIMPS briefed the Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel on stock assessment planning for 2023 and 2025. GAP offers the following comments and recommendations on stock assessment planning. For full assessments for 2023, the GAP recommends the following species for full assessments in 2023. Those would be black rockfish and copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, patrolli sole, and yellowtail rockfish. Black rockfish is an important species for the recreational sector and has some new data to better inform a new full assessment. Copper rockfish is one of the more important nearshore rockfish species economically for non-trawl fisheries in Oregon and California. They are a major component of the nearshore rockfish take in Southern California and are caught in both the nearshore and shelf rockfish fisheries. There is new data that could better inform a full assessment. Quillback rockfish is another key nearshore species for the recreational and commercial sectors. New data to inform a new full assessment is sparse. If there isn't sufficient data to conduct a full assessment, the GAP suggests prioritizing quillback for a full assessment in 2025. Petroli sole is an important trawl target species. The most recent update assessment suggested a decline in recruitment occurring in recent years, possibly as far back as 2013. A full assessment may be advisable should the 2021 Northwest Fisheries Science Center bottom trawl surveys index indicate continuing declines in recruitment. And yellowtail rockfish is a very important stock, both recreationally and commercially, particularly for the fisheries north of 4010 North Latitude. For the data moderate assessments for 2023, GAP would, would recommend uh, long spine and short spine thorny head, rex sole, and English sole. These four stocks could be assessed as a single stock assessment review panel review. For 2022, uh, excuse me, 2022 workshops, Mr. John DeVore briefed the GAP on upcoming workshops this year, which include a hook and line survey workshop in late June or early July and an August workshop that will focus on closed area data gathering. A GAP representative is expected to attend these workshops. And lastly, in terms of reference, the GAP supports the SSC recommendation that future data moderate assessments be reviewed in a STAR panel. Mr. Vice Chair, that completes our GAP statement and I'm guessing we've got some questions. Thank you, Gary. Um, questions for the GAP? Uh, Bill Anderson. Bill. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Gary. I'm um, just looking at the recommendation relative to Petroli Soul. Seems to suggest that you know, you're recommending that we wait until we get some information out of this year's bottom trawl survey. Is, is that what I should be reading into this? Yeah, Mr. Vice Chair, Phil, absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Phil. Anybody else? Bob Dooley, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. 
And thanks, Gary, for the report from the Gap. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I noticed in, in the first few species, you commented on the, the data that was sufficient to conduct or not sufficient to conduct a, a full assessment. Although in Yellowtail, you didn't do that. And I'm just curious, I may be missing something, but I don't see any advisement on there. And given what's happened in the past here, I just would like to be fully advised that we, we have enough data that'll support that and not end up in a, a bad situation. So I appreciate it and thanks for the good report. Yeah, Mr. Vice Chair, Bob. Yeah, I, I might want to defer to Mr. DeVore on this. I've been a part of several of these star panels where we had enough data to do yellowtail rockfish in the north, but when it came to the south, we attempted to do it and ended up, you know, not endorsing the uh, the assessment. So I might want to defer to John on this. I, I'm assuming there's enough data to do one for the north, but John, if you'd like to help me. Um, sure. Um, well, it's been five years since we've uh, done uh, an assessment for Yellowtail North. And for that matter, uh, we have yet to do an assessment for Yellowtail South. And if this goes through, um, I'm quite certain that there would be um, a coastwide attention to Yellowtail Rockfish. Um, and um, there are certainly fishery dependent data. Um, there's uh, aging data. There are data that were left out of the 2017 assessment that could um, um, be inform a new assessment. And um, if you really want more detail, um, <laughs> I'll just take that uh, dollar that Gary handed me and pass it to Jim Hasty because he, um, of course, uh, has wrangled and looked at and considered the data that inform stock assessments. Okay. Thank you there, um, John. Um, Marcy Urumko, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I noticed that the gap has no comment or recommendation regarding um, black spotted and uh, rough eye. Um, and meanwhile, I note in the GMT report that they're recommending a full coastwide assessment, noting that the last assessment was conducted in 2013. We're nearing the end of the 10 year projections to set over fishing limits and ABCs. There's been recent high attainment. And uh, there's also evidently new genetic information, which could help inform the portion of the stock that is rough eye versus black spotted, um, which might uh, assist with determination of the assessment as a category one rather than a category two stock. Um, can you tell me the discussion the gap had on rough eye black spotted and why it's not on your list? Yeah, Mr. Vice Chair and Marcy, um, honestly, we had already turned in our gap statement. We were kind of caught off guard by what the team put in there. Um, you know, we, we were looking at Dr. Hasty's spreadsheets there and stuff, but rough, I uh, really wasn't, I, I think it showed up on one of those, maybe 10 or 12 notches down the, down the line there, but it wasn't anything that jumped out at us. That said, a uh, couple of us in the gap, I, I should mention that our two trawl reps weren't at this meeting and something like this, we would definitely want to include them. But two of us, myself and Dan Waldeck attended that panel. I think I was a gap rep there and we had a lot of industry representation at that panel. And there was a lot of question marks going into that one. And I don't know if they were ever answered coming out of that. We had a really strong stat. I, I looked at my notes at lunch here and Alan Hicks and Chantel and I seem to recall John Harms was offering up stuff too. So we had a really strong stat, but we had a lot of question marks. We had uh, questions about the discard. Didn't seem like there was very much discard. Industry suggested maybe because the fish were larger and more marketable, maybe they weren't being discarded. Uh, the trawl, bottom trawl survey may not have been seeing all these fish. Uh, black uh, rough eyes tend to hang out in the harder habitat, rockier habitat, and we all know that the trawl survey tries to avoid those at all costs. Um, 
And it seemed that rough eyes move around a lot. It's one thing that we noticed or we were asking about anyway. They, I don't want to say they're pelagic, semi-pelagic or something, but they definitely move around. And there was really a lot of questions to that bottom trawl survey index. Um, there was questionable catch data um, going way back. And then the last and most important, obviously, was the genetics and the black spotted versus rough eye. And I don't know if we ever answered that coming out of that assessment. I mean, we came out status wise. We came uh, status wise. We came out okay. It was above B40, um, but it just seemed like there was a lot of question marks there. And if what we were hearing today and yesterday is true, that there is new data related to that black spotted, it may be something to look at. I don't want to say that without conferring with the gap and especially our trawl reps on the gap, but that may be something to look at. And it, you know, I wouldn't have any heartburn if we, you know, if that thing ended up on the list for suggested uh, assessment next year that's kind of a blowhard answering your question marcy but i hope i answered it thank you mr vice chair thank you gary yes uh you you answered it in full and you answered my follow-up question which was uh can you live with it being on the list recognizing that this is preliminary adoption and we have some time to finalize our list before before june so appreciate the input there and uh very helpful discussion Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Marcy. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Not seeing any hands. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, sir. Have a good afternoon. Yep. Uh, next up is Kirk Lynn with the CPS uh, management team uh, report. Kirk. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be reading Gen I'm E8A Supplemental CPSMT Report 1. The Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team reviewed the terms of reference for the ground fish and CPS stock assessment review process in June 2020 and submitted revisions prior to and at the meeting. The CPSMT at that time recommended and the council decided to initiate separate terms of reference documents for ground fish and CPS to streamline and improve coordination of the revision process with shorter documents tailored for each fishery management plan. In consultation with the Scientific and Statistical Committee CPS subcommittee, the CPSMT anticipates being able to review and comment on a draft CPS terms of reference this year. The CPSMT recommends the council schedule a CPS stock assessment terms of reference initial review for June 2022 with final adoption for November 2022. This timeline will allow for the new CPS terms of reference to be in place for 2023 assessments. Okay, thanks, Kirk. Questions for Kirk on the CPS management team report? Okay, not seeing any hands. Thanks, Kirk. Thank you. Um, okay, that'll take us to public comment. I think we may have one individual signed up last time I looked. And wait for the screen to show that. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, Merritt McRae. Merritt? Hello, Vice Chair Pettinger, Council Members. I'm Merritt McRae with the Sport Fishing Association of California. We support full assessments of the California copper and quillback as soon as sufficient data are available. These are important species to the fishery. Uh, our previous data moderate assessments clearly suffered from a dearth of representative data, including fisheries independent data, data on populations within areas close to fishers, which you've already heard about, and data in other areas that are actually less accessible to fishers, either by way of being far from port or out in the weather, and often both. Southern California data collected by samplers aboard charter boats and dockside is likely uh, biased to shorter trips. And um, the most e easily accessible areas, mostly because the uh, private boaters tend not to be able to get out that far in smaller boats, and there are a lot more smaller boats in that fishery than, than larger ones. <clears throat> Data moderate results have already compelled management measures, at least in California, which could 
um, constrained fisheries for the entire com complex of co-occurring sympatric rockfish species. Uh, our, our recreational fishery just opened 12 days ago, so I haven't heard directly from the fleet um, the extent to which the one fish copper limit that we now have um, is affecting how and where they fish and, and whether or not it keeps them from actually being able to, to catch what they would normally be able to catch of other species that occur in the same areas. In, in addition, we support removing the rose thorn rockfish from consideration. Um, it's not frequently caught by fisheries and you can see that by the statements previously that indicate there's not much fisheries data for these fish. These are diminutive demersal rockfish of rocky reefs and they can contribute little to the fishery even in the best of times. Um, <clears throat> they would be challenging they mature late in life at 15 years approximately, and they have a maximum lifespan of 87 years. So they're likely not very productive. They have a maximum size of around 10 and a half inches and 12 ounces. This species is easily conflated with other small species in the subgenus Sebastomus. These are those little rockfish that they tend to be small anyway, that have like four or five white spots on either side. Uh, these include the sword spine and, and pink rose rockfishes, especially. Attempting to op optimize the protectivity of, of this fish is likely to bring nothing but problems and could de-optimize fisheries for co-occurring species on the whole. The rose stone rockfish is likely more appropriately characterized as an ecosystem component species, and, and you probably have heard or will hear, hear something um, on that. There are much more important assessments that need to be done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Merritt. Questions for Merritt? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, that finishes a public comment and takes us to council action. So with that, um, I'll open up the floor to uh, see Ryan, Ryan Wolf. Sorry, I wasn't trying to jump. You just wanted to put my hand up for discussion. Are you ready for that? We are. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to go first here. It's, it's really up to the council what you want to prioritize for stock assessment. So that's why I wanted to go first and just say a couple of things um, before you have that discussion. First, before we get into uh, the upcoming assessments, uh, acknowledging that part of this agenda item is also a bit of a reflection on the just concluded assessment cycle. I did want to take a moment to recognize and express at least our uh, NIFS's gratitude for the excellent work that was done by the stock assessors and, and all involved in the development and review of the assessments that are really foundational to um, continued successful management of our groundfish fisheries. This recently completed cycle, as we are all aware, was especially challenging, not just the ongoing pandemic, but of course the issues related to stock definitions that we started talking about earlier this week and at previous council meetings. So just wanted to thank the assessment teams and the reviewers for their hard work and determination for all of what they did to provide the integral information we're using in our management process here. Now turning to um, the upcoming potential assessments and the fact that this agenda item to some extent, as we've heard with some of the Q&A back and forth with the reports, is inextricably linked with the stock definition issue we've been discussing. Just wanted to lay out a few points from NIMP's perspective. Uh, the first is we agree with and we support the SSC's points that assessments may stratify, stratify area-based assessments in a manner that best fits the available scientific information. We also note that in the reports from the advisory bodies on stock assessment prioritization that some of the stocks proposed to be prioritized here are ones that currently in regulation are identified as having various geographic delineations and not coast-wide. 
however, these species are currently identified as coastwide in the FMP, as we discussed under E3. So I just want the council to be aware of that discrepancy between the delineations in regs versus the FMP. And of course, um, that could lead uh, to stock different issues for some of these new assessments. And again, while assessments can be structured to best meet the data, stock status should be determined consistent with the stock defined in the FMP. So while we realize the low likelihood that stock definitions will be finalized before the start of the 2023 assessment cycle, the council could be strategic in their initial choices of assessment priorities for 2023 in acknowledgement that some of the stock definition challenges encountered in 2021 may persist until a decision framework for defining stocks is finalized. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Anybody else? Corey Niles. Corey? Well, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll just say I have a, um, a couple of motions prepared, but yeah, I, if people are still thinking about um, speaking, I, I don't want to put those forward yet. Maybe we, I could put them forward if they'll help, but if, if no one else has opening thoughts, I'd, I'd be willing to to make those motions. Okay. Look around. I'm not seeing any hands, so I would say to proceed. Please. Uh, okay, Mr. Vice Chair, here, Sandra or Chris, um, if you could put up the motion number one, please. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. And I move that the council adopt the following documents for public review. Number one, draft terms of reference for the groundfish and coastal pelagic species stock assessment process for 2023-2024. Agenda item E8, attachment four. While, while following the recommendations of the CPS, MT and SSC for creating and adopting separate tours for the two FMPs, two draft terms of reference for methodology reviews, and three draft terms of reference for the ground fish rebuilding analyses for 2023-2024 agenda item E8 attachment five. Okay, Corey, is the language on the screen accurate? It is. Okay, very good. Seconded by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Speak your motion, Corey. Yeah, thanks, um, Mr. Vice Chair. I think I'm going to mess up the Mark Twain uh, saying about eating a frog first when you have uh, fr eating frogs is your job. But I, I decided to do the opposite and do the easy one here and, and, and break up the motions just for readability. This this is um, somewhat routine step to adopt some documents for public review uh, based on the SSC's recommendations um, and. I'll, speaking to number one, uh, there's also this this um, recommendation from the CPS management team and and SSC to to separate out the CPS components, and they have a process for doing that, which we may I understand have to take up under the workload planning. It's I believe June or first step would be June for them, and I forget the second meeting November or September, but that's the intent there. So yeah, the, the yeah, intent is just to put these out for public review. The, the second one doesn't have any changes, but I think council staff would advise to put it out for review anyway. And, and we'll get some feedback and, and, and come back in, uh, for, for adoption later. And but briefly before I end, I, just, I think there's some really big questions. Ryan spoke really nicely to the appreciation we have for the stock assessment um, professionals people who feed data into that to that it was a tough cycle there's good comments back and forth um I, i've heard you know i was attending you know virtually of course the the panel where they where they reviewed the experience there and heard some colleagues experience it as one of the tough toughest ever so um i'm hoping these comments address some of those issues but i think there are some longer term things we should be thinking about, not today or not necessarily as part of this process, but as we go through the stock delineation, 
I believe there'll be some related related topics we can take up. But yeah, again, just stop, uh, adopting these documents for public review, and um, I will stop there. Okay, thank you, Corey. Meg Maggie Summer, Maggie. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Corey, for the motion. Uh, I didn't catch this earlier, but a question. My impression was that the CPS MT was recommending uh, let me open the report recommending uh, adopting the a CPS stock assessment TOR in, for initial review in June. And I thought that the draft groundfish and CPS TOR document in our briefing book had all of the references to CPS uh, highlighted and noted for removal from this, this one. So I uh, was wondering if this is indeed consistent with the CPS MT's recommendation and Perhaps staff could help clarify if I'm off track there. Corey? Uh, yeah, that, it'd probably be appropriate for Mr. DeVore to wait, but my, my, my intent was to, to follow the process, which I thought was outlined by the management team and the SSC on, on, and in being in agreement with, but yeah, if Mr. DeVore has, would, would more directly answer Maggie's question, that'd be great. Uh, John? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the, the highlighting in the uh, the current version of the uh, terms of reference that you see in attachment four it just highlighted instances where you know CPS is is uh, uh, brought up in that terms of reference, but there's not been any uh, deep dive into the terms of reference specifically for uh, the CPS process and and um, it, and you know we didn't we didn't really uh, get uh, feedback from the CPS groups uh, during the process review um, other than the need to separate these two terms of reference. So the SSC recognizes that too and has uh, recommended the CPS subcommittee meet with the CPS groups in a, in a work meeting, um, I believe in April or early May to um, to do that first step of really going through it and, and uh, providing a draft CPS centric terms of reference. So that step hasn't happened yet. Thank you, John. Maggie, you good? Okay. All right. Further discussion? Questions for the maker of the motion, perhaps? John DeVore? John? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, residual hand. Okay, you're forgiven. Okay, I'm not seeing any, I'm not seeing any hands, so uh, I'm gonna call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion uh, passes unanimously. All right, wonderful. Okay, that's... Get that away, and I see Corey, um, please. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, Sandra, Chris could put up the, the motion number two, please. Okay, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I move that the council, A, adopt the following preliminary list of stock assessments for public review. One, um, category of 2023 full assessments, black rockfish, patrolli sole, copper rockfish, quillback rockfish, yellowtail rockfish, or rough eye, black spotted rockfish. Two, 2023 data moderate assessments, uh, long spine, thorny head, short spine, thorny head, English sole, rex sole. 2023 catch only updates, Cow cod, spiny dogfish, yellow eye rockfish. And for 2025 full assessments, sable fish, yellow eye rockfish, spiny dogfish, and then yellow eye rockfish or rough eye black spotted rockfish, if not 2023. 
and B, request information and discussion from the Science Center's SSC and GMT on one, how the 2023 assessments will proceed in line with discussions on stock definitions. Two, how stocks of the same species may be assessed according to conservation need, i.e. do all the areas need to be assessed at once. Three, a presumption that the nearshore stocks and shelf stocks should be assessed at, at, a, at a fine scale. Um, I mean, if Sandra Chris, if you could mess, make, fix my grammar here, assessed at as fine of a scale. Sorry, assessed at a assessed at as fine scale as the data allows. Thank you. And how areas are, how when areas are combined, excuse me, one second here. Can you put a, an or before the how? or how when areas are combined, how regional differences in status slash depletion could be evaluated. And four, the feasibility of a research assessment for short belly rockfish in 2023, 2025, or even off cycle. Okay. Is that language now uh, accurate there, Corey? It does, and, and thank you for the on the fly corrections there. Not a problem. Okay. Looking for a second. Second by Maggie Summer. Thank you, Maggie. Corey, please speak to your motion. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll try to be brief um, in terms of the, the list of the preliminary list, again, for public review and comment. Um, this comes mostly from the, largely from the GMT and, and GAP, um, a combination of the GMT and GAP reports. We heard, as in, in questioning, we heard there was some question about what the GAP believed about the rough eye black spotted rockfish and, and Marcy confirmed that keeping it on the list would be consistent with for, for getting comments. Um, so yeah, I will, I will, I'm going to hold off on saying uh, much more about the rationale for the inclusion. I think it's captured in the reports and I'll look to colleagues here in discussion to, to add their own thoughts. If, um, if I'm hearing pretty wide consensus around which, which stocks should be on this list for public review. I'll speak a little bit more to the, the rationale behind some of the questions under B and explain a bit because maybe they're not as precisely worded as they could be. But the first one there um, really gets to the question uh, Mr. Wolf led off with about he used the term how to be strategic about it. Maybe that's maybe not the word I'm thinking about how to be efficient um, and, and not, you know, avoid um, some of the issues we had last time. We're going to have some parallel, or not parallel, but overlapping processes here on discussing what what our stock should be in terms of um, areas, and also trying to do some assessments for for, for stocks where that where that um, that will be a very important question. Number two, really, I kind of I asked the SSC, Dr. Field, about this um, using Quillback as an example um, in Washington and our near shore. You know, we've 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 only had a commercial fishery. We never had a nearshore fishery develop, and we, you know, presumably the fishing pressure in that in the nearshore has been lower than in other areas. So, given limited resources, again, in terms of being able to process data, review stock assessments, um, you know, is is there? A, you know, we heard in the in the review of the assessment process that doing separate areas is is a good thing. Often, assessing different areas is a good thing. But doing them is almost doing like uh, three or four different assessments instead of just one. So, um, given Quillback again as, a, as an example, in the Pacific Northwest, looking like it's near B40, um, do they really need to be taking up those resources, or should they be focused, as we heard in public testimony, on, on California, where the where the need is greater, and also Oregon and Washington, for example, might not have any new data to bring. Um, to a, a full assessment, unlike California, where they're hoping there will be. So that's an explanation of that question. Number three, along the same lines, um, we've been working over number cycles now, especially in the near shore and in the shallower shelf, at least, of 
doing the assessments as fine of a scale as, as you can with the data. There's a trade-off between pooling data and, and, and stratifying it, as, as Mr. Wolf again said. Um, but yeah, it, we are we are hopeful that um, we, the assessments continue to be to be area based. States might not be perfect, but they're not as arbitrary as you might think. But and as Mr. Wolf said, you can do the assessments at one scale, and the status determination might be at a different scale. Again, just trying to give some more context to explain the, the, the not ideally worded questions here. And then number four is different. Uh, just asking, we knew, I think it was last cycle, maybe not the cycle before, we've, we've had interest in short belly rockfish and, what, and the events that happened in our whiting fisheries in particular, and what was the cause of those. And I know the Southwest Center was working on updating the assessment from many years ago. Um, this is a, a request to, for them to, to hopefully come back and advise the council on, on how we can get an you know, update on what, what the stock uh, dynamics were like in this boom we saw and the intent there would not be for an assessment for setting ACLs but more just a, a, a research type assessment that that can um, you know, publicly show what what may have gone on with that stock and that's another a distinction I'll just lead, I'll end on is speaking to my other comments on the first motion about in the future I hope we, we talk about different ways of, of possibly using our science including how do we use data limit assessments to, to before declaring over uh, species overfished? Is there a way to do these research assessments before they're used for management? A lot of various questions in mind that I, I hope you'll we'll, we'll keep working on as, as part of this stock deniliation um, effort. And okay, I think I'll, I'll stop there. And again, I hope my colleagues, if they have you know, other, other views or, or will speak to um, the rationale for doing these assessments. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Corey. Discussion on the motion? Marcy Yeremko. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Corey, for the motion. And yes, I'm uh, very much supportive of including on the 2023 full list uh, copper and quillback rockfishes. And I have a, a few notes along those lines. Um, first, we did some data moderate assessments on these two stocks, and um, we all know um, the circumstances that we're uh, looking at today to implement that new science. And um, I can certainly express that our our stakeholders um, continue to have questions about the veracity of the stock assessments. Um, recognizing that um, the perspective is that the outcomes of those assessments are not reflective of conditions on the water uh, or that we're seeing in our, our catch data in the fisheries. So an opportunity to uh, conduct full assessments on these two stocks in 2023 will um, give us an opportunity to uh, see what we get from a full. Um, there were uncertainties in the data moderate assessments that I think can be well addressed in the context of a full assessment. Um, it will give us an opportunity to compare uh, results of the two different methods and better understand which data sources and methods are um, critical to provide uh, the best look at um, these two California nearshore fishery resources. Um, just wanting to add that, um, you know, there are a number of questions out there, I think, with data moderate assessments in general now, and, and we're a little reluctant to, to uh, move forward with um, using the method, uh, particularly on other nearshore stocks. So I think uh, this opportunity to conduct a full will really give us some insight um, into the, the both model types, uh, looking at a, a full assessment with a data moderate um, in hopes that uh, we can support future data moderate assessments and um, how to make them better. Um, additional information for the full stock assessments is available. 
for both copper and quillback. Um, there's more information from the California Cooperative Fisheries Research Program, uh, some ROV survey data, and other fishery dependent indices of abundance that um, can be informed by data collected by our California Recreational Fisheries Survey. There's also um, additional age data to inform the growth rates in California. Uh, you might recall that it was kind of a last minute um, heroic effort on the part of the Science Center to get some uh, California quillback age data into the data moderate assessment. Uh, and actually, um, you know, a subset of, of those fish were aged and um, those initial results um, suggested that for, for now there wasn't a need to continue aging the, the stockpile that was there. But um, I think it's uh, an opportunity here we have to collect some more otoliths and get some more ages to see if we can develop uh, California specific um, growth rate relationship for quillback um, using data both from fishery dependent and independent data. Um, just want to talk a little bit about data collection. Um, I've mentioned this in a number of, of agenda items this way, week that uh, CDFW has begun um, collecting otoliths for both copper and quillback um, in our 2021 fisheries as well as uh, coming up here in 2022 when uh, the fishery season's open. So we do have that uh, activity underway. Um, we're also working on outreach with our stakeholders. We've produced a number of uh, new outreach materials to assist with identification of these species, which will help with compliance and also aid us um, in gaining participation with our, our, um, our sampling activities and our uh, recreational survey. Um, what else? There are workshops going on. We know that um, they've already had the postmortem and had some discussion about the, the data moderate and the procedures here forward that um, we will be using um, with regard to review of data moderate assessments. And that has uh, culminated in the recommendation today that they be uh, subject to a star review. Um, so that's a positive development, but I think um, there are more workshops forthcoming kind of in the spirit of lessons learned from the data moderate. And those uh, discussions certainly are going to be useful as we approach um, pursuing full assessments for, for these two stocks uh, in 2023. So with that, I, I just want to again express my support for the motion and appreciate the hard work of the GMT and the GAP to identify these two as a priority. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Further discussion? Maggie Summer, Maggie. Thanks, Vice Chair Pettinger, and thank you, Corey, for the motion. Certainly support it and um, appreciate the requests in section B. just wanted to speak to uh, item number B3, the presumption that nearshore stocks and shelf stocks should be assessed at as fine a scale as the data allows. Um, and I, it, you know, it's, it would be my interpretation that there is also some room in there for uh, the stat team's judgment as they are evaluating the data and um, other elements of the modeling and assessment exercise and that this should not be intended as uh, really a, a rigid requirement that they must always make a determination to, to go at a, a smaller scale if they have some reason to uh, believe that it's more appropriate to conduct an assessment um, at, at some other level. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Uh, Corey Niles. Corey? Yeah, 
Thank you, Maggie, Mr. Vice Chair. Just one, and again, these were maybe I've, I've had hours to spend on what were them better, but the intent here is to get reactions from folks and not not meaning to prescribe things at, at this uh, moment. But yeah, I think as we've heard, we've had good discussions the past year about the trade-offs between pooling and splitting data, and it is the ass assessment teams that are the experts in that. So yeah, again, just looking for um, reactions to this to, to help us with the with, with the, the question and yeah, like we, we're gonna be dealing with the stock denilation, I cannot say that word today, definition, I'll go with stock definition topic for a while here, but facing how to do it with um, copper, quillback, black rock, rockfish, for example, you know, if it's presuming this list stays the same when we adopt it final. So yeah, not, not prescribing anything by any means, but looking for reaction and um, an, an, an advisement on how we, how we do that this cycle. Okay, thanks, Corey. All right, anyone else? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. So um, seeing that, I'm gonna call for the question. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion passes unanimously. And uh, with that, I'll look to uh, John DeVore to uh, see how we're doing here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, you've adopted a preliminary list um, for uh, stock assessment priorities in 2023 and 2025, and we'll put that out for public review uh, to solicit uh, feedback on the prioritizations uh, for your June action. You've raised a couple of uh, uh, important questions that you would like some feedback from uh, the science centers, the GMT, and other relevant parties uh, when we readdress this in June. And you've also adopted the three uh, terms of reference that inform um, the stock assessment process um, for public review as well. And, and uh, all of these uh, decisions will uh, be considered uh, for final action in June. Um, in June, uh, you can expect to see under the groundfish uh, stock assessment item, a groundfish centric uh, draft uh, stock assessment terms of reference. And then uh, pending your uh, decision on scheduling um, uh, meetings from June uh, thereafter, uh, you may also be seeing a draft CPS centric terms of reference in June, but that's a decision that you got to make under agenda item C7. So with that, I would say you have completed all of the items on this agenda. Okay, okay very good. Thank you, John. Okay, with that, we're going to go to E9. And um, John, are you going to take that or is Todd? That's uh, Todd's show. Okay, so we'll make sure to check on that. So if you need uh, time there, so very good. So uh, Todd. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, before you, you have E9, the last of the ground fish measures for this meeting. So under this particular um, agenda item, the Council is scheduled to receive an update from the GMT regarding the development of the 2023-2024 harvest specifications and management measures, in particular, the management measures. Um, so as part of their general, their overview, the GMT is gonna update the Council regarding new management measures that were forwarded for consideration by the Council in November, as well as update the Council on routine measures that um, are part of the, the specs. Um, so what this particular agenda item is designed to do is to provide the council to give additional guidance to the GMT to excuse me, facilitate completion of their overwinter tasks. So just as to back up and provide a little bit of information, back in November, the council adopted final OFLs, ABCs, and ACLs for most stocks and complexes but also forward a range of ACLs for such species as Oregon black rockfish, quillback and copper and vermilion rockfishes, Pacific spiny dogfish, and ling cod, both north and south of 4 to 10, and as well as sablefish. Um, final action on this, the specifications will be taken at the next meeting, which is in April. Additionally, back in November, the council uh, forwarded multiple uh, routine measures 
as usual for the GMT to consider as part of their overwinter analyses, as well as the um, new management measures, which I mentioned at the onset of this discussion. Uh, some of those new management measures were uh, the potential FMP amendment for short belly rockfish, modifications to the non-trawl RCA, as well as extension to the primary sablefish season. And I'll note that there might have, the GMT has uh, several questions for, uh, that need some guidance on these issues. Uh, additionally, uh, the, regarding the, na the non-trawl RCA, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service has provided a report for the council to consider and the report, in short, uh, examines changing or modifying the motion um, from the to different language. Uh, the, the, the excuse me, the National Marine Fisheries Service is um, looking for guidance and input from the council on this particular item, so it can help them in their their NEPA discussions. And finally. Uh, as part of our overwinter work, GMT and staff, we noticed a discrepancy between the FMP language and regulations on block area closures, and that report is provided as attachment one. And here the council has the opportunity to include BACs as part of the specs and um, give guidance as necessary. <clears throat> so in your informational packet, you have multiple supplemental reports. You have that supplemental NEMS report, which I mentioned, supplemental reports from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and California Fish Department of Fish and Wildlife. You have a GMT report and presentation. And for general knowledge, the GMT will be giving a presentation in lieu of reading their report. You have a report from the GAP as well as EC. And your action today is to review preliminary preferred alternative harvest specifications the range of management measure alternatives and draft analyses and provide guidance as appropriate, or excuse me, as necessary. With that, Mr. Vice Chair, my completed my overview. I'll look to my virtual right here and ask if John DeVore has anything to add to that particular discussion. Um, yeah, you, I think you might've misspoke a little bit on the alternative harvest control rules that are, um, that have been selected for detailed analysis, you included copper rockfish. Um, you know, the list includes black rockfish in Oregon, lingcod, north and south, sablefish, spiny dogfish, and then vermilion sunset south and vermilion north. So um, just to clear up any confusion. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions that the council may have, Mr. Vice Chair, or we could move right into the reports. Hey, thank you, Todd. Uh, question to, uh, on uh, Todd on his overview. Okay, seeing none, um, with that, we'll go to the NIPS report. And Ryan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Actually, we have Lynn Massey who's prepared to present that. Uh huh. Okay, that's side Keeley down. So, um, hey, very good. Lynn? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? We do. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lynn Massey from NIMS West Coast Region, and I'll be summarizing NIMS Report 1 for Agenda Item A9. At the November 2021 meeting, the Council added Action Item 12E to the 2023-24 Specs Management Measure Action with the intent of allowing limited access to the non troll RCA through the Specs Action. The excerpt of Item 12E from that motion is provided for you here in the report. NIMS has preliminarily evaluated this item and the analysis currently being prepared by council staff. There is substantial uncertainty about the potential impacts from item 12E as adopted in the range of alternatives at the November 2021 meeting. Specifically, we don't have a regulatory definition for non-bottom contact gear and any gear types that we do know of that would fall in that category are not widely used during regular fishing activities. And because of that, we have very limited data with which to analyze impacts. In addition, NOAA's OLE has expressed concern over the lack of gear definition on which to predicate enforcement of this provision. And lastly, NIMS has initiated discussions on this item with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, who have confirmed that item 12E from November, as was written, is outside the scope of what was contemplated in the Seabird Biological Opinion, which means we would need to reinitiate ESA consultation. So altogether, 
These concerns indicate high uncertainty in, in, in the potential impacts from this item and therefore necessitate, necessitate additional an analysis that could not be completed in time for this piece to be implemented in the specs action. Um, so NIMS completely understands that the council has a very strong interest in ensuring that this new non troll RCA provision does in fact happen on the specs timeline. Therefore, over the winter, we put together a revised 12E proposal, which you have in this NIMS report in order to help make that happen. Specifically, we added a definition of non-bottom contact gear, the specifics of which are modeled after the ESP hook and line gear configurations that are currently being tested under the Emily Platt and Real Good Fish ESP projects. And that includes a vertical jig gear configuration and a troll gear configuration. Uh, in order to alleviate concerns over seabird interactions, We've also specified that these new gear configurations would be required to use artificial bait, which is also consistent with current ESP requirements. And then finally, we specified that this provision would only be available to the directed open access ground fish, fish fishery and the limited entry fixed gear fishers that would fish under OA trip limits. Uh, if these changes are adopted for consideration, uh, then we think that we can implement this piece as a specs management measure. Uh, so I'll note a couple of things here. Uh, one is that uh, this is only a proposal for action item 12E. Uh, more can still be contemplated and discussed under the actual non troll RCA action. So for example, if industry would prefer the option to use natural bait, or perhaps they would like other options for non-bottom contact gear outside the jig and troll gear that we've listed, those types of things can still be considered for the future. Um, I'll also note that we are still wordsmithing the definition of directed open access provided in this re report to alleviate the concerns we've heard from the gap in EC. Uh, you heard these during the discussion of the non troll logbook a couple of days ago. So come April, this definition will look a little different. Um, and then in addition, as you know, there's no action being taken to adopt this right now. Uh, we simply wanted to get this in front of the council as soon as we could just to get a general reaction. Uh, we can modify the details for April. So for example, uh, we do already plan to make the minimum number of feet off the bottom rule a consistent depth across both gear types based on industry feedback. Uh, we've also received feedback from the EC and we'll likely be making additional tweaks to the gear specifications so we can help make this a little more doable for them. Uh, this concludes my summary. Uh, Keely Kent and I are both here to take any questions that you might have about our report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Questions for Lynn on her report? Um, Maggie Summer, Maggie? Thanks, Vice Chair, and, and thank you, Lynn, for the report. I don't have a question. I'll just um, maybe note for everybody uh, where your report says um, gears like troll and jig gear aren't typically used to target ground fish outside of the non troll RCA uh, in, in Oregon in shore of the non troll RCA, actually jig gear is, is used um, relatively frequently in Oregon's commercial near shore fishery. So that's just uh, a note that's available as a potential source of information if needed at any point. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Anyone, uh, Bob Dooley, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear any comments about uh, observer coverage and if there was a, 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 any additional observer coverage with now entering the non troll RCA, an area that hasn't been fished in numerous years. And we'd heard before of very low observer rates. And I was curious how, uh, if you had any comments in that, in that regard. Thank you. Lynn? Through the chair, thank you for the question, Mr. Dooley. Um, we have had some discussions about observer coverage. Um, on the specs timeline, I don't think that uh, much can be changed in terms of observer coverage, and I'm going to um, say that Keeley can correct me on that if I am wrong. Uh, this is part of the reason that we had that we advised that you uh, alter the logbook motion to ensure that it would cover these non-bottom contact gear types in the RCA. So while we might not have as much observer coverage as is ideal, uh, we will have a logbook in place for these fishers to complete the enter the non-troll RCA. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Okay. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. Next up is um, Heather, I believe, with the WDFW report. Thanks, Vice Chair. Um, I'll do my best to summarize the WDFW report we have under this agenda item. Um, really, the purpose of our report is to provide the Council with a, a summary of catch in the Washington Recreational Fishery in 2021. Um, it catch uh, last year, last season, approached the Washington Harvest Guideline. And the report also provides an opportunity to add an evaluation of the non trawl sector allocations of canary rockfish um, and the overall risk of exceeding the ACL uh, to the analysis of 2023 2024 management measures package in April, if the council wishes. Um, we realize this information is coming a bit late, uh, but really wanted to flag it before the council considers two year allocations in April. Um, and although allocations for canary rockfish have been ongoing for the council, we really didn't expect canary rockfish uh, to be a priority for us for the cycle. Um, in 2021, uh, the canary rockfish catch in the Washington fishery was 39.4 metric tons, which is three times higher than the previous season high in 2019. This compares to the harvest guideline um, in 2021, a harvest guideline of 43.3. Um, and this year in 2022, it's 42.2. Uh, um, the harvest guidelines that we're looking at for 2023 and 2024 under the range of alternatives that are um, being considered right now are 41.5 metric tons and 40.9 metric tons in 2023 and 2024 respectively. So recognizing that the, the opening, the selective opening of the non trawl RCA in 2023 and 2024 um, might be expected to increase catch of canary rockfish. We also note that catches in the non near shore sector are likely to remain low. And based on trends in the trawl sector, the chance of exceeding the canary rockfish ACL would also be expected to remain very low. So considering the overall conservation need for canary rockfish, it may be that no formal changes to allocations are needed for 2023 and 2024. Um, you'll also see um, as we get to the, the GMT report under this agenda item that um, they have prepared an update um, based on our request at their January meeting to show us how catch is compared um, against projections and allocations so the report also um, walks through the 2021 um, season showing um, running mo monthly totals from the Washington Recreational Fishery. As a reminder, our season is open from mid-March to mid-October. And on figure um, one, you can see how that catch going back to the 2013-2014 biennium in each of the biennium progressively increases until you get to the 2021-2022 um, biennium, which only is showing for 2021, obviously. But that um, it's actually, I think, purple line in figure one is the catch that we saw um, last year. And you could see it bumped up and then really increased um, significantly in September. So for these changes, I mean, we've um, we've really progressively um, reduced our restrictions on the recreational fleet to uh, cautiously walk toward these higher canary rockfish ACLs, um, and you can see that in the graphic. Um, but also, kind of, is why we were suddenly surprised to see the big jump in 2021 um, in September. So uh, we met with our stakeholders um, as we do during the biennial process and um, heard from them that um, 
we there was um, a lot of success in finding large canary rockfish. Some of it in areas that were closed, um, previously closed yellow eye rockfish conservation areas um, in uh, deeper waters off green area two. And also that um, there was likely some effect of um, anglers uh, switching effort as the as the salmon season closed earlier than normal and um, there was a poor albacore season off our coast last year. So um, see I covered the history of that. Um, so while we're looking at options for constraining catch to the harvest guideline, we really believe that reimposing major restrictions on the fishery would be premature until um, allocations are next evaluated more fully by the council. So um, with our cautious approach we've taken, we've really just starting to understand what the fishery could catch. We hope to look at that um, more in 2023 and 2024 um, and see get a better understanding of where our catch rates could reach. And I, I think that was really the intent when the council held off on making formal allocations for canary rockfish after it was rebuilt. Um, we also have some, a bit of uncertainty in, in some of our catch that we're using to make projections 2021 and 2020, the pandemic year, were also very different for our fisheries. So uh, taking a look at 2023 and 2024, when we hope are more normal um, for our recreational fishery in many ways uh, will give us a better idea of where these catches might actually be. Um, that concludes our report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions for Heather? WFW report. So Anderson, Bill? I don't have a question. I just had a couple of um, additional comments to the report. Thank you, Heather, for the report. Um, very informative. Um, my observation uh, is that the primary reason for this large increase in canary rockfish in our recreational fishery is as a result of a couple of things. Obviously, the removal of the sub bag limit, which was one and two fish. Now it's, um, you can take up to seven, which is our rockfish bag limit. The second reason um, is that our, what we call our deep water fishery, where we don't have a 30 or a 50 fathom depth restriction was expanded um, to include we had the first two weeks of June, and then we had um, the month of September, I believe. The, the popularity of deep water bottom fish trips is pretty extraordinary. Boats target on lingcod, as well as rockfish. And then this, as you can see in, in this particular case, canary rockfish. So the popularity of that fishery has really grown uh, over the last few years. The third reason, and I think the biggest reason that the canary rockfish catch went up to the degree it did is the opening of the rockfish conservation area uh, that is, that's been around, it's, it's right out near Grace Canyon. The edge of Grace Canyon's about 28 miles offshore from Westport. And it, it um, contains um, some really good fishing, both for canary, for lingcod, and for halibut. So there was quite a few halibut trips that had been targeting an area about 35 miles west-northwest of Westport that now are being taken and targeting this area where the rockfish conservation area used to be closed. And that's for two reasons. Number one, the halibut fishing is really good. And number two, the lingcod and canary rockfish fishing in that area is really good. And so we're fishing in depths of 80, 
80 to 100 fathom uh, is where is the depth of the area that this fishing has taken place. I personally observed on, on, a, on a particular day 50 boats in a relatively small area that was all within the confines of what used to be the rockfish conservation area. So not only are charter boats accessing this area, but we have a lot of um, private boats, you know, uh, what I would high end, I, I'd call them private boats that are able to make that, that trip offshore. So the, those are the, in my mind, the reasons that we've seen this, this increase. Um, I don't know, frankly, how much farther it will go from where it is. Um, and as Heather said, we did have some other limitations. Well, not so much limitations, but our albacore fishery did not materialize this year, which caused a number of boats that might have otherwise have been fishing that in September to use the deep water opportunity instead, the deep water um, lingcod and rockfish opportunity. Um, but as again, I, I, I share Heather's opinion that we have a lot of headroom, I'll call it, between what are our, our overall catches of canary rockfish are and, and where the ACL is. Um, and I would um, um, suggest that, that we don't need to do anything from a, from a regulation perspective. Let's, uh, we'll watch it here as, as, as the department is doing very closely and um, see where this goes. But I just wanted to add a little bit of, of additional information and context to, to what I saw uh, and why I think this catch bumped up to the degree it did, um, just for your information. Thanks. Thanks, Phil, for the explanation. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Heather. Next up will be um, Gary Ricker. Oh, sorry. Marcy Ripko, the CDFW report. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be referring to uh, agenda item E9A supplemental CDFW report on 2324 management measures for the California recreational groundfish fishery. Uh, we'd just like to take an opportunity to brief the council on a key addition to the range of management measure alternatives that will be proposed for use in the 23-24 cycle. Um, we're proposing a, a somewhat different or novel uh, utilization of the RCA boundary lines for the California recreational fishery. While further analysis and description will be included in the April 2022 briefing book, uh, we just wanted to highlight this option now because it is somewhat of a departure with how we've used RCA lines in the recreational fishery previously. Uh, for over two decades, our RCA boundary lines, which are just the set of connecting waypoints, which approximate a depth contour, uh, have been used to allow fishing shoreward of a specific RCA line off California, meaning that fishing is prohibited seaward of that line. Beginning with the 23-24 cycle, if, when, and where approved, fishing would be authorized only seaward of an RCA boundary line and prohibited shoreward of that line. The RCAs are used to reduce mortality by shifting fishing effort away from depths where constraining or rebuilding stocks are most commonly encountered and onto healthier groundfish stocks. In the future, it is hoped that by reversing the application of the RCAs in select times and areas, fishing pressure will be shifted away from nearshore stocks, including quillback and copper rockfishes, and onto the shelf and slope habitats where several desirable target stocks are abundant. In previous specification cycles, some private sport and commercial passenger fishing vessel representatives have requested access to slope fishery opportunities, specifically for sablefish. At the time, significant constraints on a number of overfished shelf species 
made it very difficult to develop a suite of measures that would allow for effective enforcement and management of a recreational slope fishery while maintaining the shelf closures and while also concurrently maintaining opportunities in the near shore. Using RCAs to allow recreational fishing only seaward of a line in select times and areas would allow development of new offshore slope and shelf recreational fisheries while alleviating pressure in the near shore. CDFW envisions this alternative may be among those adopted as part of the final suite of management measures for the 23-24 biennium, but would also be available for use with other routine in-season adjustments as needed to aid in achieving harvest specifications, especially for rebuilding stocks like yellow eye rockfish or stocks of concern such as quillback or copper rockfish. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Questions for Marcy on the CDFW report? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Marcy. Okay, next up is Gary Victor in the um, GAP report. Gary. You're muted. Yeah, uh, I, sorry about that, Mr. Vice Chair. I, <laughs> I had Sue's on the other line. We're trying to straighten something out here. Ah. You're good. You're reading, be reading from agenda item, Mr. Vice Chair and uh, members of the council be reading from agenda item E9A supplemental gap report one, ground fish advisory panel report on update of 2023, 2024 harbor specifications and management measures. Ground fish advisory sub panel received an update from the ground fish management team on the status of 2023, 2024 management measures. The gap offers the following comments and recommendations. For the non trawl rockfish conservation area, as the council is aware, the non trawl sector has been working for several years to get the non trawl rockfish conservation areas open to non trawl groundfish fishermen. This is a top priority for the non trawl sector, and it is imperative for the economic vitality of non trawl fishermen and fishing ports that access is granted soon. The current status of several nearshore stocks heightens this need as pressure should be taken off of vulnerable nearshore species and allowing fishermen to move into the non-trawl RCA could serve this purpose and facilitate access to healthy midwater stocks. The GAP reviewed the NIMS report and the recommendations for narrowing the scope of 12E, which is the ground fish retention in the non-trawl RCA. At this time, we support the recommendation to narrow the scope of action item 12E to the specific gear used in the Emily Platt and the Real Good Fish of, from Monterey exempted fishing permits. Council staff flagged a related issue for the gap regarding the need for guidance related to what would occur in the 30 to 40 fathom depths from 4010 to 4616 north latitude under 12E. In 2021 2022, Vessels are allowed to use any hook and line gear except for dingle bar and long line in this area. Under 12E though, any bottom contact hook and line gear, such as vertical hook and line gear anchored to the bottom would also be prohibited. The gap supports having all areas within the non trawl RCA be subject to the same fishing requirements and therefore any action taken by 12E should supersede the 2021-2022 regulations. We support this approach with the understanding that it will enable regulations to be finalized and implemented by January 1, 2023. To be clear, we view this as a first step and we will continue to pursue opportunities to allow other gear types in the future. For block area closures, the GMT updated the gap on a mismatch between the ground fish fishery management plan and federal register language that would prevent the use of block area closures as a tool for bycatch avoidance in the midwater trawl fishery. The gap agrees that the FMP should be updated to allow use of BACs as one tool in the toolbox. That said, the gap continues to believe that industry developed bycatch avoidance plans can be more surgical, timely and effective. If BACs are to be used, it should be later in the year when bycatch rates, particularly for dogfish, tend to be higher. The GAP believes that cooperative level industry plans should be the first line of defense 
with the BACs as a last resort backup. And lastly, the California Recreational RCA, the gap supports inclusion of California Department of Fish and Wildlife's proposed approach to RCA line application for consideration as a new management measure for potential use in the 2023-2024 cycle. The GAP believes this is a tool that used under the right circumstances could protect vulnerable species and allow for ongoing recreational opportunity. Let me stop there. And this is what Susan and I were just talking about. We need to invert these last two sentences. I'll read it as it should be stated correctly. The GAP also notes that there could be value in the form of maximum opportunity, opportunity relative to vulnerable species catch through consideration of both an inside and outside line as is done for the commercial hook and line fishery. And then the last sentence should read, the GAP notes that it could pose enforcement challenges and recommends that the enforcement consultants provide their input on enforceability. And if we need to correct that through the secretary, I'll, uh, well, we'll get with the writer of the report and get that fixed. Otherwise, Mr. Vice Chair, I can answer any questions you might have. Okay, thanks for that clarification, uh, Gary. And uh, questions for Gary on the GAP report. Okay, I think you're good. Thank you, Mr. Thank Vice Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. All right, next up is uh, Greg Bush in the uh, EC report. Greg? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll be reading Supplemental EC Report 1, agenda item E9A, Enforcement Consultants Report on Update on 2023 to 2024 harvest specifications and management. The enforcement consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to agenda item E9, update on 2023-2024 harvest specifications and management, and received a briefing from Pacific Fishery Management Council staff member Jesse Dorpinghouse and National Marine Fisheries Service staff member Lynn Massey. The enforcement consultants have concerns with any proposal authorizing fishing activity within a ground fish conservation area with specific gear and area restrictions due to the need for additional shoreside monitoring and at sea enforcement to ensure gear and retention requirements are met. As previously stated in the Supplemental EC Report 1 to Agenda Item E6 at the November 2021 Council meeting, the EC recommends making changes to the boundaries of the Natural RCA over a partial reopening of the non-troll RCA to additional ground fish fishing activity. That said, the EC recognizes the council's strong desire to provide some additional fishing opportunities within the non-troll RCA while additional analysis and a final recommendation is contemplated. The EC recommends that the council provide clarification to action item 12E adopted by the council at the November 2021 meeting and whether the fishing currently allowed between 30 to 40 fathoms is to be continued as a separate authorization or replaced by this new action. The 2021 to 2022 management measures allowed the use of hook and line gear, except bottom long line and dingo bar gear between the 30, 40 fathom lines between 40 degrees, 10 minutes north and 46 degrees, 16 minutes north latitude. The EC recommends against retaining the 30 to 40 fathom management measure while also adding a new category of allowed fishing within the non trawl RCA. Any fishing vessel retaining ground fish within the non trawl RCA under this proposal should follow the same gear and catch limit and not include sub areas with separate gear or retention limits. The EC has reviewed supplemental NIMS report one has concerns with the enforceability of the described allowable gear and wants to ensure any specific item, such as depth, length, number of hooks, et cetera, be of sufficient management concern as to warrant on the water or shoreside enforcement. For example, we consider verifying the number of proposed hooks up to 500 as impractical for enforcement to verify at sea or shoreside without the inclusion of some sort of marking or indicator to assess and count to assist in counting such as no more than 25 hooks between floats and no more than 20 floats. Determining distance of the weights and gear off the bottom is very difficult to determine. However, we could measure the distance between the bottom weight and the first hooks and whether there are indications of bottom contact on the weight, such as mud on weights when inspected. 
We'll continue to work with staff to identify enforceability concerns with proposed gear types. The EC previously noticed, it, noticed its concern with the proposed definition of directed open access fishery in a supplemental EC report one to agenda item E5A and noted, the council, and noted the council intent to clarify the definition in the council approved motion. If directed open access fishing is allowed in the non-troll RCA under this action item with the EC, which the EC recommends against, the EC recommends the gear types be limited and the vessels only be allowed to be declared into that fishery. This is not intended to affect ground fish retention already approved in the non troll RCA, such as the incidental retention of yellowtail rockfish and ling cod in the commercial salmon troll fishery. This concludes the EC statement. Okay, thank you, Greg. Questions uh, for Greg on the uh, EC report? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Greg. And then um, next up is uh, Lynn Mattis in the uh, GMT uh, report presentation. Lynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yep, you get to hear from the other Lynn M now. Um, <laughs> it, it was confusing me when you were asking questions of the other Lynn earlier. Um, Sandra or Chris, could I be allowed to share my screen, please? Okay, thank you. Hopefully you all are seeing the correct uh, view. We are. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so this, this is a, a supplemental GMT presentation to summarize what is in our report. Um, I think Todd laid it out pretty well what we're doing here. Um, and you all seem to like presentations on spec stuff a little better than us sitting up there reading pages upon pages upon pages upon pages. So what we've got in this report, this presentation, is some information on items that the council specifically requested that we bring back. And then there's a couple of things that we need some specific clarification on. And uh, this is the list uh, that I'll be going through. Um, some question about EFPs, set-asides, ACTs, responding to the WDFW report that Ms. Hall just described, block area closures, and then some updates on some of the new management measures that we have been looking at. Just want to say in general, uh, no big surprises, nothing unexpected. In, in our overall analysis of the sector specific things where we were analyzing and trying to model season dates, trip limits, catch limits, all that. Uh, so other than just the full amount of work it was, uh, the specs analysis has been going well. On the exempted fishing permits, currently there are, I think, I believe it's two exempted fishing permits that are being considered for this cycle. And depending on what the council's decision is on 12E that um, uh, Lynn Massey spoke about a few moments ago, uh, the non troll gear, the non troll RCA and that gear limit, um, are, will those midwater EFPs still be necessary or will that item 12E address that need? If so, the, if those EFPs are no longer needed, then those set asides for those EFPs could be returned to the harvest guidelines, the fishery harvest guideline, and then that could be allocated proportionally back out to fishery sectors. When we were having our joint discussion with the GAP a couple of days ago, uh, there was some discussion about possible interest in continuing with these EFPs, but looking at using natural bait. Uh, if the applicants wanted to add this for this cycle, it would need to be signaled in April with their applications updated so that it could be finalized in June. And if natural bait is used, uh, we believe set-asides would likely need to be adjusted upward as the purpose of natural baits is to increase catches. 
Council asked the GMT and council staff to look at quillback rockfish set asides, possible quillback rockfish set asides for California. No previous species specific set asides have been uh, set aside for or have been identified for quillback. They've been at the complex level. For quillback off California, the set aside categories would be research, EFP, and incidental open access. Uh, there are no tribal impacts down there. And the non ground fish mortality or IOA fishery, um, the highest catches north of 4010 is in the directed Pacific halibut fishery, and south of 4010 is in research. In general, when we looked at the, the what the recent cumulative set asides have been, uh, the cumulative impacts from those sectors have been, in most cases, it's been less than 0.1 metric ton, with the number of years being less than 0.01 metric tons of total impact. We did the same thing for copper rockfish. Similarly to copper or to quillback, there is no species specific set aside at present. Uh, it's all at the complex level. If set asides were to be identified, it would be for research EFP and IOA again. In recent years, the IOA mortality um, has been highest north of 4010, again in the directed halibut fishery and south of 4010 in other incidental open access fisheries. So looking at within non-trawl allocations, specifically the request uh, that WDFW gave the GMT a heads up of, of in January and is described in their report one on mortality in the non-trawl sectors, we looked at the most recent five years of total mortality for Washington REC, Oregon REC, California REC, near shore and non-near shore, the sectors that make up that non-near shore uh, or the non-trawl allocation. 2017 through 2020 are from the WICOP GEM report and 2021 are preliminary estimates uh, that we got through PACFIN, RECFIN, fish tickets, um, best estimate by GMT since the, we won't get the official estimates from WICOP until later, uh, until September. We also included the, the 2020 SHARE, and we're calling it SHARE because it's not a formal harvest guideline, a formal ACT. That's just what in regulation is designated for that particular sector. So we have what is in regulation for 2022, and then the draft SHARE for 2023. Um, and then um, I have said, we have had some communication with WDFW folks, and they indicated that this is the type of information they were after. So really appreciate the early heads up. So we had some time to get to compile this information. Next, we get into some ACTs, annual catch targets. The first thing we were looking at, we're asked to look at was quillback and copper rockfish off of California. Uh, neither species has been subject to sector specific ACTs or ACLs, um, sector specific mortality contributions were estimated, uh, again, using like the gem product and options were considered that looked at using 25%, uh, 50 and 75% of estimated sector mortality to come up with a possible ACT. For quillback rockfish, the recreational fishery accounts for 70% of the mortality off of California, both north and south of uh, 4010, greater than 70%. And similarly for uh, copper rockfish, the recreational fishery accounts for greater than 70% 70, 70 of the mortality north of 4010 and 90% of the mortality south of 4010. While we were looking at ACTs and going through the process, the, the topic of the cow cod south of 4010 ACT came up. Um, cow cod was newly rebuilt during the last assessment cycle, but to be precautionary, the council had set and was managing to an, a 50 metric ton ACT. However, with some of the issues we've been discussing over the last several days, with uh, the near, more near shore stocks off of California, there's the potential to increase offshore fishing as a means to reduce pressure on those near shore rockfish species from the non trawl commercial and wreck fisheries. Therefore, the council may want to consider removing the cow cod 50 metric ton ACT to provide some additional flexibility and stability to the non trawl sectors as they may be encountering more, more cow cod. An example of what that would mean 
under a 50 metric ton ACT, the in 23, 24, the trawl allocation would be 18 metric tons and the non-trawl would be 32. But if the ACT were removed in 2023, the trawl allocation would be just under 25 metric tons and the non-trawl allocation would be 44 metric tons. So there's a bit of a difference there um, that could provide some additional flexibility as well as uh, some reassurances if catches end up being higher than what they have been. Similarly, the last couple of cycles, we have, the council has used a, uh, excuse me, an ACT for the non-trawl sectors, which has been, it's approximately 78% of the, the fishery harvest guideline for the non-trawl sectors. This was, these were put in place to be precautionary, and we would just like some confirmation if the council wants us to continue to uh, analyze using that ACT value rather than the fishery harvest guideline value. Next, onto spiny dogfish spatial tools, uh, looking into the at sea fleet. Approximately 20 to 40 percent of the barking mortality is from at sea sectors. There are higher bycatch rates in October and November. And currently, the only spatial tool useful to the council is the bycatch reduction areas or BRAs within 200 fathoms, but that could effectively shut down much of the fleet. Dogfish mortality in 23 and 24 is expected to be lower than the recent maximums in 18 and 19, given ex some expected changes to the fishery. And complete in-season tracking of dogfish mortality is possible, and the fleet currently uses move-along measures. For the shore-based IFQ fishery, 30 to 60 percent of the mortality is from the shore-based se sector, with greater than 95 percent of the barkies encountered uh, discarded from the bottom trawl fishery, while nearly 100 percent of the shore-side whiting fishery it's landed. There are some latitudinal differences with average latitude of hauls greater than five metric tons is, north, is about 47 degrees north latitude. One to five metric tons, 46 degrees, and less than one metric ton, uh, 45 degrees. The graph on the right-hand side of the chart shows the last uh, 10 years of spiny dogfish catches and mortality by um, sector with bottom trawl in the lower blue band, midwater hake in the middle reddish band, and midwater rockfish in the higher uh, greenish band. And midwater hake equals shoreside whiting. In-season tracking of bottom trawl discards is not possible at the moment. It is not a quota species. However, shoreside Pacific whiting landings can be tracked in season along with the at sea total catch. So what are our spatial tools to reduce uh, impacts to spiny dogfish? There are block area closures, which are bounded by latitude and depth. For midwater trawl gear, uh, these have only been analyzed to mitigate salmon bycatch off of all three states. For bottom trawl, it's only been analyzed for use off of Oregon and California. We also have bycatch reduction areas, or BRAs. These are bound only by depth and for midwater trawl gear only. They are currently shoreward of 75, 100, 150, or 200 fathoms. Analysis of 75, 100, and 150 fathoms. Uh, depth contours are potentially outdated, but, my, most, bleh, but most likely the most effective for shoreside catch. And then we have the trawl RCA, which is depth based north of 4616, which is the Washington Oregon border. Currently, it's at 100 to 150 fathoms off Washington. Here is a table of the spatial tools to reduce barky um, impacts. It's by state on the, the row, and then the columns are BACs, BRAs, and RCAs. This is just a summary to show you what's available off of which state. So for guidance, what we are looking for here is, does the council, council wish the GMT to analyze the use of BRAs and or BACs for uses not currently available or analyzed, making them potentially available for in-season spiny dogfish bycatch minimization in 23-24? Uh, the potential options we see 
our BACs for midwater gear uh, to mitigate bycatch of all three from all three states. BACs for bottom trawl gear off Washington and BRAs for bottom trawl coastwide. Uh, the analysis would be conducted with the intent of including results in the April and or June briefing books. While looking at the block area closures in our overwinter analysis, we discovered a mismatch between the FMP and the federal regs, as Mr. Phillips indicated earlier. The federal regs articulate the council's intent to manage incidental salmon bycatch by vessels using midwater trawl gear in the EEZ off Washington, Oregon, and California. However, inadvertently, we did not update the FMP to sync with those regulations. To avoid potential future issues, delay, uh, implementation delays, we believe the FMP should be updated to be consistent with the council intent um, and the rulemaking document. And this next slide has draft language, the draft language correction. The there's strikeout is the section we that is being proposed to be removed, and then the text that is highlighted in yellow is what is being proposed to be added. The final section of this report is looking at some of the new management measures. Uh, Mr. Remco spoke just a few moments ago about the California recreational RCAs, uh, so I'm not going to go into details on those um, since she covered them very carefully. We also There's also looking at the recreational bag limits for California. Recall back in no November of last year, a sub bag limit for quillback, a sub bag limit for copper, and a four fish sub bag limit for vermilion off California were implemented for 2022. Uh, we don't yet know what the mortality associated with those reductions are. Uh, we wouldn't know those until sometime early next year. And as part of the 23-24 process, if further reductions to fishing pressure are needed, uh, there's some additional look at additional sub bag limits from anywhere from 10 down to zero or no, or no retention within the 10 fish RCG bag limit off California. Sable fish season extension. Uh, the, the GMT analysts have developed options to extend the season from October 31st to December 31st. As part of that, there's also some consideration for the Pacific halibut retention off of Point Chehalis in regards to the end date. Short belly rockfish amendment. Uh, we were asked to develop an FMP amendment language specifying a catch threshold for short belly rockfish that would trigger council review. Uh, that threshold is at 2000 metric tons. And if it's exceeded or projected to be exceeded, then the council would be required to review all the fisheries data and, uh, and reduce short belly rockfish catches. Non-bottom contact hook and line gear in the non-trawl RCA. Uh, this is our friend also known as 12E. Vessels in the open access, limited entry fixed gear and IFQ gear switch sectors would be allowed to use non-bottom contact hook and line gear within the non-trawl RCA. This would extend from the Oregon-Washington border at 4616 down to the US-Mexico border. Using vertical hook and line anchored to the bottom Oh, I'm sorry, not being able to use vertical hook and line anchored to the bottom, dingle bar and long line gears. The current biggest issue is uncertainty because there's limited data and unclear gear definitions. Um, the NIFS report that uh, Ms. Massey just, uh, reviewed a few moments ago describes a revised proposal to deal with some of those uncertainties. And the council could consider this option for April when selecting a PPA. Uh, similar to, um, can't remember who spoke about it a couple of moments ago, about the area between 30 and 40 fathoms north of 4010 to the Oregon-Washington border. Currently in 21 and 22, allowed for hook and line gear except long line and dingle bar. For 23 and 24, there's a proposal to have be similar as 21, 22, except also excludes vertical hook and line gear anchored to the bottom. So a place that we would need some, would like some clarification and further guidance on is should vertical hook and line gear still be permitted between that 30 and 40 fathom range from 4010 to 4616, or would it be better aligned with the rest of the non-trawl RCA proposal? 
So there's a lot of words on this slide. The, this is the summary of the questions that are also at the beginning of our written report, uh, places where we would like some specific feedback. And with that, I will, attempt, I, I will answer some questions, but I will likely have to phone a friend for the experts on the various sections. Uh, we just thought it would be cleaner for one person to do the presentation and then have others available to answer the questions. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Questions for Lynn on the uh, GMT uh, report? I think you did a pretty good job, Lynn, because I'm not seeing any hands. So, oh. either, either that or I put everybody to sleep. They've got the three the three o'clock uh, nappies. Well, I think Heather woke up actually, and uh, Heather Hall. Hasn't <laughs> Heather, thank you, Vice Chair, and um, thank you, Lynn. Not so much a question, but again, appreciation for the the presentation, and um, thanks to the GMT for accommodating our request to look at the. Um, catch in the non-trial sectors of canary rockfish. Uh, again, this is this just a really helpful way to synthesize all of this information. Um, so thank you. Okay. For the questions, Bob Dooley. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Lynn. Once again, an excellent report by you and your GMT colleagues. I, I have a question on number six and regarding the use of BRAs and BACs. And I, I seem to recall there was a um, talk about an exception for um, if there's, if there is a um, cooperative program to have, have uh, address closures within those. I think I'm explaining that right. I think you understand what I mean, I hope. But I'm just curious, is that part of this or is this a one size fits all for, that would include uh, those cooperative management uh, agreements? Vice Chair Pettinger, Mr. Dooley, I'm gonna have to defer that one to Whitney and hopefully she's online and can speak. Yeah. Uh Thank you, this is Whitney um, through the vice chair. Thank you for the question. I think I understand what you're asking. And I, if I can get quick clarification, I think you're asking about the um, Pacific Whiting cooperatives related to salmon mitigation plans. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, exactly, thank you. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, yeah, you are correct. We looked into that as well um, in, in the federal regulations that would, or based on the federal regulations, those we did not include in this presentation or the analysis because they only um, apply to the Pacific Whiting Fleet's ability to access the Chinook Salmon Reserve. So in other words, um, if a cooperative, Pacific Whiting Cooperative has a salmon mitigation plan um, they, they may be able to access the Chinook Salmon Reserve um, if that salmon mitigation plan um, addresses some, some mitigation measures of salmon related to, to bycatch reduction areas. So I, I may have made, put that in a confusing way, but the short of it is just that the, it's not related to um, groundfish mitigation, let alone mitigation of Pacific spiny dogfish, which is what we're um, looking at here. And so those are a very separate um, process according to how the federal regulations are interpreted. Um, and, and this is all um, also based on conversations that I've had with um, NIMS folks throughout the overwinter analysis confirming that um, those are really very specifically targeted towards allowing the cooperatives to access the Chinook Salmon Reserve uh, based on their salmon mitigation plans. And I, I hope that answered your question and didn't just confuse you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Whitney. I appreciate that. I, I know that those plans are, uh, the way they're operated, they do, uh, they do have those same type of movement requirements and such for groundfish bycatch avoidance. And I wasn't, I was, that's one of my confusion was, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you, Bob. Um, Phil Anderson, Phil. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thanks, Lynn, and, and to the rest of the groundfish management team for this report. I'm back on slide six, which is the canary um, table. Um, I have, I have two, I think I have two questions. First is where, where did the 2023 draft shares come from? How, how were they calculated? Uh, maybe I should know that. Maybe we told you that's what they were. I don't remember, but that's one question. And my second question is, do you, do you know offhand, and maybe this is unfair, what the trawl um, draft 2023 share is? Uh, Vice Chair Pettinger, Mr. Anderson, I'll start with the second question first. I don't know off the top of my head what the trawl share is. Um, we could look it up. So I'm sure one of my teammates is hopefully looking it up and we can get the answer to you momentarily. As far as the 2023 draft share in November, the council gave us guidance to use the status quo per, uh, sharing percentages for all trawl, non-trawl sectors that had been in place for 21-22 applied to the fishery harvest guideline. So it, it was the Canary ACL minus all the set asides, what was left then was split proportionally via the same proportions that were put in place for 21-22 uh, as per the guidance we were given in November. Okay, thank you. And well, for a moment there, my, the answer was in the chat, but no, I can't see it was 800 and some for troll, I think is what I saw. Okay, um, and um, we will need, um, I'm just, I'm thinking out loud here, sorry, it's dangerous. Um, so we would be potentially talking about these again in April and then as part of our final uh, decision on specs for 23-24 in June. I mean, is that correct? Vice Chair Pettinger, Mr. Anderson, yes, that is correct. Um, in the big document that we are frantically editing behind the scenes that will uh, be in the advanced briefing book, it lays out all of this, the sharing of the draft sharing of all the sectors. And yes, preliminary preferred management measures in April and final preferred management measures in June and the within non-trial allocations or the canary sharing falls within the management measures piece with PPA April and FPA June. Great, thank you very much, Lynn. Okay, thank you, Phil. Further questions? The GMT, okay. Not seeing any, um, thank you, Lynn. Okay, um, do we have public comment? Okay. Uh, well, before we go to council action, we're going to take a, a break, a 15 minute break. I think uh, got to chase down some salmon stuff here, I believe, information. No. Have an update from Merrick when we get back. And uh, anyway, we'll see each other, everybody back here at um, 347. 337. It's a long day. All right.
Okay, we're going to get started here just shortly. A pause? Okay, we're um, actually need another five minutes, I understand, here. So, uh, late breaking news. So, anyway, we'll be back at uh, 343. So.
Okay, we're um, we're back, and we're hoping that everybody's ready to go. Um, so with that, we'll um, open the floor for discussion um, and or motions uh, when appropriate. So, Maggie Summers. Maggie? Thanks, Vice Chair. Um, I really appreciate the, the check-in opportunity here from the GMT to receive an update on uh, the items they're working on as part of the specs uh, and management measures package. That's very helpful for us, and I, I know it's helpful for them to have this opportunity for guidance from the council. Uh, it sounds like some, some good issues were raised. Uh, both in the GMT's list of questions, and I, I think we will have some guidance uh, responding to those shortly. Uh, I just thought I'd get um, a couple thoughts out to start with. Uh, in particular, I wanted to recognize the enforcement consultants uh, report and appreciate them uh, raising the issues they did, uh, potential enforceability challenges relating to some of the uh, gear definitions proposed in the NIMS report uh, noted um, their comment that they will be happy to work further on, on development of that language. And I would certainly encourage that. We don't want to end up with uh, something in place that isn't, uh, just can't realistically be enforced on the water or on shore. Uh, I think the other item I would uh, touch on right now is uh, on the canary rockfish uh, discussion that we had earlier and, and was um, brought to our attention with the WDFW report. Uh, we certainly have seen uh, some volatility in canary rockfish catch in Oregon's recreational fishery too. Uh, appreciate the information provided by the GMT uh, illustrating um, that Overall, in terms of uh, total coastwide attainment across all sectors of canary rockfish specifications, um, we're really quite low, and there's a lot of a lot of room there. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I don't feel like there is any need um, to constrain fisheries. Just agreeing there with uh, what was uh, suggested in the WDFW report, um, and I think that Mr. Anderson mentioned earlier. I'm going to leave my initial remarks there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, further discussion? Phil Anderson. Bill? Yeah, I just wanted to speak a little bit more to the canary issue. And, and um, you know, when we when this resource was was rebuilt, you know, which was really a good thing, and there was a lot of lot of uh, pain inflicted on all of the sectors that impact canary to uh, during those years of the rebuilding plan and and when we came out of it um, you know we really didn't have a good sense or at least I'll say I didn't have a good sense of how what was going to happen and how the the fishery would would mature you know once we had you know a lot higher ACLs we were up at 1300 tons or a little bit over and we're at, I think 1284 coming into this next biennial cycle and um you know the the recreational fishery which i spoke to off of washington um we had a number of closed areas and restrictions and all of those kinds of things um that's part of the effort to try to rebuild the stock and and um now we've been able to relax some of those and we're beginning to understand what the magnitude of the recreational fishery is um, albeit, I will say that that uh, you know the last two years, where we've been in the grips of a pandemic and the and the um, uh, whatever what whatever uh, impacts that may have had on our on our effort in the recreational fishery, people you know uh, a lot of people staying home, all those kinds of things. We st I, I really still don't feel like we have a very we have a much better feel than we did two or three years ago, but it's still in that maturing um, process. Um, so I'm I'm just um, I'm not sure what what the right uh, remedy is uh, at this point, um, and and that by that I mean, you know, we were we were at 
39.4 tons here this this past uh, or in um, in 2021. Um, our 2022 share is 42.3. Our draft share is 40.9. Coming up, but you know, using that proportional kind of calculation to get to a share, and it just puts to me puts a target, a bit of a target on us when us being the Washington Recreational Fishery or other sectors in here that are in the similar situation uh, where we have a number, it's really tight. Uh, we're not sure, you know, whether whether we're, we're pretty sure we're not going to be very much over it, but chances are we, we might be a little bit and uh, which causes um, a magnifying glass to be put on the fishery or sector uh, that's in that position. And, and I find it to be an, an um, almost an unnecessary position to be in uh, relative to what we have going on in the trawl and the non-trawl sectors and, uh, and the catches that are occurring uh, and then looking at the ACL. So again, I'm not sure what the remedy is here, but I, I'm un I am uncomfortable with kind of having a target uh, uh, on the on the recreational fishery in this case, where we have a number uh, that we're putting out there that that is really tight and could very well be exceeded by, I think, a very nominal amount. But in in 2023 and 2024, so I'm just putting that out there. Um, I, again, I don't know exactly what the remedy is, but. I am concerned about it. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Heather all. Heather. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I have a motion on this, uh, if folks are ready. I, I think we are. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Sandra has a motion, if she could put it on the screen. I move that the council provide the following guidance to the groundfish management team. Retain the midwater rockfish EFPs. Do not analyze set asides for quillback rockfish or copper rockfish off California. Analyze ACTs for quillback rockfish and copper rockfish off California. ACTs should be broken out into two sub areas. And Sandra, at this point, I have a correction to this link to the um, coordinates that we have listed here. That should read the two sub areas should be 42 degrees to 4010 north latitude and, and 4010 north latitude to the US. Mexico border. Thank you. Maggie, it's 42 degrees, not 4210. It should say 42 degrees to 4010 north latitude. So, so after 42 degrees to 40 degrees, there you go. Um, right, and just no, no, no. You have 10, 10. 240, 10. There we go. Okay. Here. Continue. That's it. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, the next bullet uh, add an option to remove the 50 metric ton ACT for CalCOD south of 4010 north latitude to the management measure package. Oh, and the corrections are complete. So I'm good. 
Thanks, Sandra. Continue using a yellow eye rockfish ACT for the non Charles sectors. Analyze the use of BRAs and BACs for uses not currently available or analyzed, making them potentially available for in season Pacific spiny dogfish trial bycatch minimiz minimization in the 23 24. Uh, management measures analysis. Actually, that should probably just say delete the management measures analysis, Sandra, if you could. And just delete the in front of the 2324. There you go. Thank you. Amend the groundfish FMP to align the definition and uses of BACs with those in federal regulations as part of the 2324 harvest specifications process. Allow all areas within the non troll RCA to be subject to the same fishing requirements, and therefore any action taken by 12E would supersede the 2122 regulations. And um, <clears throat> the, the parentheses just note that this is a recommendation from the GAP consistent with the, e, with the e, um, enforcement consultants. I recommend NIMS revisit their proposed new gear definition in light of concerns about enforceability raised by EC to ensure that any specific item such as number of hooks or is of sufficient management concern to warrant at sea or shoreside enforcement. That's it. Okay. Thank you, uh, Heather. Is the language accurate? To your motion? It is with the corrections made by Sandra. Thank you. It is. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Second. Second by Marcy Rimko. Thank you, Marcy. Okay, Heather, speak to your motion, please. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, we this this motion uh, really is just it formalizes uh, the request by the GMT and and some information we heard from the EC to provide gu guidance that will um, allow the analysis of the harvest specifications package to move forward. Um, in April, um, so folks can do their work. These all align with the GMT's report and their specific um, questions of the council. Uh, I won't speak to each one of these um, specifically, but hopefully this provides the GMT with the information they need to, to move forward. Oh, okay, thank you. Discussion on the motion? Uh, Ryan Wolf, right? Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Heather, for the motion. I just have a clarifying question, since I don't see it specifically referenced about your intent. Does the last bullet indicate you generally support our 12E proposed revision in the NIMS report? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you, Ryan, for that uh, clarification. Anyone else? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. So that being the case, I'm gonna call for the question. All those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Oh. Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I had a few things to say on this agenda item. Um, like to start with the midwater rockfish EFPs. Um, appreciate continuing on with them. I realize that we're likely to recommend an action under 12E in the specs that um, might negate the need for them. Um, but in our discussions within the delegation, um, the current um, members of those two EFPs, they're, they're both uh, California EFPs. 
um, indicate a, a willingness and an interest in continuing them, um, specifically to look at the ability to use bait in the um, new uh, midwater fishery that we're uh, developing um, under the stringent um, new or the specific new regulations that were proposed um, in the NIMS report. Um, so appreciate keeping that item on the list and look forward to working uh, with the EFP holders on some modifications to those uh, set asides uh, and the provisions in terms and conditions. I, I really like to take a chance to thank NIMS for the work on the 12E item um, that took place over winter. Um, we had a number of sidebar state conversations on this topic. Um, and just want to acknowledge the hard work of the National Marine Fisheries Service to look at um, how we get to yes on that in the specifications. Um, as the gap has mentioned, it's not a, it doesn't provide a full suite of opportunities in the RCA and they'll, they'll be looking for other opportunities and other agenda items uh, as we move forward in the future. But this uh, narrow, um, carefully crafted uh, opportunity in the RCA is, is very much um, needed by our open access uh, fleets that are interested in targeting these healthy midwater stocks. And we, we certainly have uh, a bunch of information today that um, will support um, allowing that activity to occur and within um, or without causing uh, undue impacts to our overfixed stock. So I really just want to uh, thank NIMS again for the work on this topic um, and acknowledge the EC statement and the other discussions we've had during the week um, about the need for some flexibility as that language uh, develops over the course of uh, the specifications uh, development process. So a few um, issues and under discussion and just appreciate uh, Lynn when giving the presentation here today in the NIMS report, her her nod that um, we'll be working to refine that language uh, as the package develops. Um, on the topic of the ACTs, um, just like to um, recognize that um, these ACTs are a critical um, measure that will allow us both to develop um, our management measures more fully um, and establish as benchmarks uh, for us in the 23-24 um, process to uh, ensure that we are managing and monitoring consistent with the new uh, best available information provided to us in the 2021 uh, stock assessments, both for, for copper and quillback rockfish. So um, appreciate analyzing the ACT tools uh, in the package, and we'll look forward to, forward to seeing more on that item. Um, on the set-aside item, just wanted to acknowledge that um, I was the one that requested that those be analyzed in this in this uh, package. Um, and that was under the lens of where we were at um, in November, um, that potentially we would be looking at some newly overfished stocks in the 23-24 biennium. Um, traditionally, we establish uh, set-asides for our overfished stocks to ensure that we maintain um, accountability or accounting for mortality from all, all sources. So. Um, appreciate the look that the GMT took uh, at this item and um, noting the, the results that they found and, and the very small um, amount of impact that um, accrues from research and IOA sectors. I um, want to thank them for that and I, I'm comfortable that we are um, on the right track not pursuing that in the 23-24 uh, biennium um, in light of the, the new information that we have now regarding stock definitions and the need for us to um, pursue an FMP amendment um, before we're looking at uh, new overfished stocks. Um, 
also want to take a second to comment on the um, Washington discussion on canary rockfish. Uh, I want to thank Heather for her report and uh, Phil for the extra discussion. Um, and just want to add my support for the process um, that I think we are all uh, working toward uh, in the 23-24 biennium regarding uh, sharing. Um, I think this is a strategy that helps all states. Um, Heather and Phil spoke to the, the change that they've seen and the uptick in the canary catch. Um, and then appreciate uh, the table that the GMT prepared for us on this item. Um, I think it's notable that, in fact, that the spike that Washington um, may have had in 2020 and uh, or and expected in 21, um, you know, uh, they they described some of the reasons for that. Um, they talked about the removal of the sublimit and now that they're operating. Um, under the aggregate bag limit for all uh, rockfish off Washington, the seven fish. Um, you know, it's interesting that in California, we had exactly the opposite response when we repealed our sub bag limit. Our, our catches actually went down. Um, but I think what's important to note is um, fish move and the volatility in our catch data, um, particularly for canary, and that's that snapshot, that five-year snapshot, uh, really suggests that um, you know one one place may see an uptick one year, and um, it may be in another location uh, a year later. Um, I think what's important here is is exactly um, as Heather and and Phil uh, suggested. What's uh, our our goal is that we stay within the ACL, and I think um, we have a strong track record of working together in season to track our catches to make sure that collectively uh, we stay within them. So I just want to express um, my support for the approach and appreciate them um, uh, bringing this to our attention. Um, but I, I think the solution here is uh, very sound and um, I think we will do just fine staying within our established ACLs. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, Marcy, thank you for that. And so I'll turn to Todd and see, Todd, how are we doing here? Yes, thank you, Mr. Oh. Vice Chair. Um, oh. So- one, one second here. Yep. Phil Anderson, Phil? I'm gonna take one more, just one more shot at I'm in on the Canary situation. And I apologize for doing it repeatedly, but, um, and I appreciate Marcy's comments as, as well as, Maggie's and of course Heather's. Um, what what is is nagging at me, frankly, is the the use of the term share that was in that table. And um, we had a ACL for Canary just north of thirteen hundred tons uh, last well this year. Um, it's twelve eighty four, I think for. 2023, I believe, under we haven't what, what we voted on in November. The the total what I see in from the data, the total catch of canary by all troll non troll is in the neighborhood of five to six hundred tons versus an ACL of twelve or thirteen hundred. So, um, and then when I look at and, and when I think about, like, I'm going, obviously going back to where I come from, Washington, due to the pandemic, our no, most northern port, which would have normally accounted for most, of, for, for the majority of the canary in previous years, was closed. Nobody could go on reservation. The only way you could get to the ocean outside of our north coast is to leave from CQ. And it's at about an 18 mile run just to get to Nia Bay before you. So, so that, that is in part my uneasiness <laughs> about the, the, the share that's described for Washington's recreational fishery in 2023. And I'm not suggesting that we need to take any fish out of anybody else's bag, given that we're, you know, 
in the neighborhood of half of our ACL, but we're going to need, we're, we're, we may well need a little bit more that's what, than what our share is here. And I think as long as we have an understanding that this number's hanging out here, but um, we have room, um, obviously, uh, as, as uh, Marcy described it, to, to uh, accommodate, if you will, the, our fishery as well as the other states' fisheries without, in, you know, getting into an allocation war or creating some sort of a conservation issue. So I'm, I'm going to leave it right there, um, but I just wanted to speak to it one more time. Okay, thank you, Phil. Maggie, did you? Uh, one second. Okay. Todd, did you have a question for us by chance? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yes, at your discretion, sir, I, some, a couple of members of the GMT asked me a question regarding the, the, a, the BRA, BAC, and I was wondering if uh, we could have Ms. Uh, Whitney Roberts ask the question so I don't confuse the issue. Sure, please. Thank you. Chris, if you could uh, elevate Whitney. I believe she's an attendee. <laughs> Thank you. Through the vice chair, this is Whitney Roberts here. Um, I know it's getting close to the five o'clock hour and I'm sure councils want to wrap up, but I just wanted some um, clarification on the motion that Heather um, just put forward to have the GMT analyze uh, block area closures or bycatch reduction areas that are not um, currently available or analyzed for Pacific spiny dogfish trawl bycatch minimization. Um, I, I was hoping for a little bit of clarification we were hoping that the council um, would either signal their intent that the GMT would analyze um, specific uh, specific uses, for example, block area closures for midwater trawl gear off of a certain state or coastwide, um, something to that effect. We list some options in the presentation um, with the expectation that we that certain ones would um, be more effective for mitigating spiny dogfish bycatch and therefore um, wouldn't need to necessarily analyze all of the options under the rainbow um, that could be available necessary could be analyzed, but um, but maybe was essentially just hoping for uh, some council clarification as to whether um, the intent for this motion was for us to um, analyze everything that uh, could potentially be looked at or to focus on um, the tools that would be most effective for mitigating um, bycatch so that those uh, the targeted ones are um, available and and in the FMP amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Whitney. Okay, look around for the other hands. Okay, Todd. Oh, Heather. Well, thanks, Vice Chair. I was going to respond to Whitney. Oh, please. If I could um, see if we can get there. Um, I'm looking at the presentation, Whitney. Um, I guess when I when we when I put together the motion was just hoping that we would do whatever we can to make sure our toolbox was was full. So it was being um, I guess maybe um, overly broad that we would just capture um, areas where the the BACs or BRAs aren't in place. So for example. Cur BACs are currently not available off Washington, and I think we want to fill that gap. Um, I guess you're asking to um, if BRAs, which are now currently available for midwater trawl gear in Oregon and Washington and California, should also be available for bottom trawl gear. Um, and I I would just say that's that's what we're hoping to to get. 
Is that helping, Whitney? Yeah, thanks, Heather. I, I think that does. I understand the intent of the motion now. Um, and I, we will do our best to get um, all of those tools in the FMP amendment of specs um, and try to have those tools in the council's toolbox moving forward for uh, spiny dogfish bycatch mitigation. Thank you so much for the clarification and sorry to derail the, the council process. Thank you so much. Oh no, we're good. Yeah, thanks, Whitney. This this is you're not derailing. You're you're helping the process for sure. And I I don't know if there's an opportunity for us to even follow up afterward to make sure provide any additional clarity to the GMT <laughs> as needed. Um, so. Thank you. Okay. All right, Todd. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, for indulging me on that particular comment or the question there. And thank you, Ms. Hall, for answering that. I know it was a little out of, <coughs> out of scheme there. Uh, so looking at uh, this particular agenda item, the council has given good direction and guidance for us to move forward in the analyses, um, which we will bring back in April for complete council review. And you've had a really good discussion on multiple items. And I say, would say, sir, that you are complete with this particular action. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doug. Well, it's always good to uh, get things taken care of early instead of later, so. All right. So that takes care of E9. And uh, we're gonna go to Salmon, I believe, next. And so it would be uh, D5. That's my understanding. So, yeah. So we're gonna we'll, we'll pause here. So people move around in the chairs. So uh, in a few minutes we'll get going here. So just uh, stand by.
Okay. Welcome back, everyone. We're starting D5 for the direction for the uh, 2022 management alternatives. So uh, with that, we'll look to Robin to um, kick us off. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Agenda item D5, we have further direction for the 22, 2022 management alternatives. Uh, you have your STT report uh, that's going to uh, wrap up the information that we gathered under D3 and D4 and help us move forward to get through uh, D6 and eventually the final agenda item D7. Not much more to add to that. We're just looking for some clarification and additional guidance. And I believe the STT is ready to give the report. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. I'll be referring to agenda item D5A, Supplemental STT Report 1. Uh, the team took into account uh, Council guidance from yesterday um, that is presented in tables 1, 2, and 3. The results of our analysis um, start on page 26 with table 5. For Chinook, um, uh, Lower Columbia River Natural Tules, uh, uh, all three alternatives are above the maximum uh, exploitation rate. Uh, same is true for Klamath River Fall Chinook, uh, not meeting the escapement, uh, the minimum escapement this year, or the maximum, uh, yeah, the minimum escapement or the uh, ER cap for this year. Moving on to the next page for Coho. Make one note about um, these four uh, Washington coastal stocks. We now provide uh, ERs uh, for those four management units that are relevant to the PST. Um, the ERs are presented underneath the ocean escapement estimates. And uh, the most constraining um, ER is, is listed here, whether that's the PST total exploitation rate constraint or a, um, the maximum fishing mortality threshold from the FMP. At the bottom of this table, um, <clears throat> note that the uh, Sonk Coho um, exploitation rates are provided. Um, they were not ready as of yesterday, but now they're here. And um, we meet the ER ceilings for each of the different uh, components of the Sonk uh, ESU. Okay, we'll move on to table seven. Uh, this has a breakout of the exploitation rates for LCN Coho, OCN Coho, and Lower Columbia River Tules. Um, again, we can see that the Tule um, exploitation rates exceed their uh, goal. Um, this table used to have uh, Rogue Klamath Coho on it and it used to be one page, and now um, we've split that out. And so there's a second page to table seven. And this, this part of table seven is devoted solely to uh, Sonk Coho. We have here the Trinity Natural component, Klamath Natural, Rogue Natural, and then other Sonk. I'll note that the, um, the ocean exploitation rates for each of these different components of the Sonk ESU are identical. Uh, the only things that change are the, um, the freshwater rates um, at the bottom of the table. I believe that uh, concludes my overview of uh, the results of this analysis and um, I can try to take any questions you might have. Okay, thank you, Mike. Questions for, uh, for Mike on the SDT report? Okay, thank you. All right, Oop. Kyle Lennox, Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I assumed you're about to jump to guidance, but if not, um, I do have some guidance for North of Falcon Fisheries. Please. Oh. Oh. Susan. Susan. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, sorry, I wasn't uh, clear on the order of the discussion, but I did want to speak to the sort of status of discussions with regard to the age four ocean harvest rate for Klamath. Um, that might uh, uh, provide some additional information to the council in offering subsequent guidance. Okay. Okay. Um, Please. Susan, go ahead, and then we're going to public comment. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I would like to express my appreciation very much uh, to the STT and the SAS and the Oregon and California staff that has put a lot of time and energy into both analysis, late nights, and creative thinking on this topic. Um, I know it hasn't been easy, and it does seem to be a bit of a, a moving target. Um, I am considerable progress has been made. Um, but we, um, based on the information that I have in front of me, there is still a, a, a gap to be filled, I guess I would say. Um, uh, based on the information that I have in front of me currently, uh, we will be looking at a 10% um, harvest rate on age four ocean, or, uh, age four ocean harvest rate for Klamath Chinook um, to meet the guidance for California coastal Chinook. Um, I say that based on the information I have currently in front of me, I know there are ongoing discussions and considerations within the SAS, and I have indicated that I'm still open for further discussion if there is additional proposals that are brought to me. So I'm hoping that that sort of provides an update to the council on where the discussions were, are kind of where the threshold may have moved, but to make it uh, very clear that uh, we are still talking. Okay, you have a response to Susan on that? Okay, public comment? Okay, we have three uh, three folks online here. So we have uh, Dan Wolford, followed by Francis Estelia. Dan? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, council members. So my name is Dan Wolford. I'm representing the Coastside Fishing Club. We're an all-volunteer recreational fishing organization with more than 10,000 members dedicated to enhancing the recreational fishing experience for all Californians. So first, a quick note on the difficulties of this hybrid meeting structure on the formation of salmon seasons. While the SAS is going out of its way to engage with the public, it is difficult at best. And while I appreciate this effort, I hope we can meet in person at the April meeting. Given the negotiated nature of a salmon season setting process, an in-person meeting greatly enhances the ability of all partners to participate on an equal footing basis. This is especially true as so much of the strategy and rationale for this process occurs in smaller breakout sessions, which are very difficult to accommodate within the online process we are constrained to at this meeting. I urge the council to provide for an open, public, in-person, as well as online process at the April meeting, at least for the salmon agenda items. More specifically to this particular agenda item, the SAS and the STT are working diligently to arrive at an equitable salmon season that meets the conservation objectives, provide for fishing opportunities and balance the positive and negative impacts to our fishing communities. One very sticky issue is how to achieve the equitable impacts, positive and negative to the fishing communities. Achieving the conservation goals on the Klamath River is severely constraining the California and Oregon fisheries, leaving Sacramento Chinook, our target species on the table while essentially eliminating meaningful fisheries in and even outside the Klamath zone. This represents a very significant social and economic impact on the, on the Klamath communities that cannot be understated to their hotels, their restaurants, their neighborhoods and their fishermen. Even so, there are significant negative impacts required of the communities and fishermen to the north and south of the zone that cannot be overlooked either. Target fish are being left on the table while un untold thousands of recreational fishing trips are being prohibited with even greater pain in the commercial sector. 
I urge the SAS and the council to be sensitive to this delicate balance and to provide the greatest possible range of alternatives with as much opportunity as possible for the greatest benefit of the nation. However, the biggest stumbling block has been the lack of clear objectives throughout most of this week, specifically the age four Klamath harvest rate. In the guidance letter that NIMP submitted to the council, they indicated a margin of 40% to the management plan objective of 16% that must be, accounted, must be achieved in order to account for prior modeling or inaccuracies, or the models must be modified such that margin is not needed. At this point, the models and databases have been revised and the results are showing significant changes with major impacts to the sport and commercial fisheries. But today, NIMS has now changed its position to mandate that the process must result in seasons that achieve both the stated 40% harvest rate margin while incorporating the new model changes. In the meeting that NIMS had with SAS earlier today, they stated that the model changes explained by the STT were, quote, not quite there, end quote. Further that, quote, there still needs to be an adjustment, end quote. And quote, so this leads us to target 10%, end quote, which is in fact the same margin from the 16% FMP objective. And later in the discussion, NIMS, NIMS did not respond to one particular question, but deflected it by saying, that is a question for people who know the model better than I do. Well, presumably the STT knows the model and the data it uses, how it works, how it has been changed, and what it is now achieving. I have great faith that they walked NIMS through those steps painfully in, in their detailed discussions but NIMS offered no detailed explanations that would validate what now is to be, appears to be an arbitrary and capricious decision to hold on to their 40% margin. If that is not the case, then NIMS needs to show its work to qualify, quantify how they arrived at the 40% buffer and why it is still needed. In the SAS session, NIMS alluded to their dual obligation to provide a fishery that it, provide a fishery in the best interest of the nation while being mindful to ensure healthy fish stocks. Well, I would remind NIMS that everyone in the council is well aware that we too share those same dual objectives, an objective that does not just fall to NIMS, but to all of us involved in this process. Further, ours is not just lip service to our conservation objectives. Our very livelihoods and way of life depend on ensuring that our stocks are healthy now and in the future, our stake in this game is much higher than to those within NIMS. One of the following things that we take great pride in is that we observe and follow the best scientific information available. That means our models are the very best they can be, and we work hard every year to keep them that way. Our fishery man management plans are well thought out, and our conservation objectives are developed with quantitative analysis that supports them. So it is insulting that NIMS comes to this meeting without showing us their quantitative analysis that supported their initial 40% margin. And it is even more insulting that today they provided the SAS with no analysis whatsoever to demonstrate that the same margin is needed in light of the model changes, saying only that, quote, they are led to believe, end quote. They acknowledge that the changes have come a long ways, but are perhaps, quote, not quite there, end quote, but holding on to this arbitrary margin denies us the ability to use the best scientific information available. Well, I guess you can see I'm more than just a little upset with this outcome. Hopefully you can tell I'm out that I am irate. The only thing that keeps me from stomping on the ground and threatening to sue over this egregious behavior is that there's no time to argue this through the courts and time to do anything about the 20, 2022 fishing season. Perhaps the only thing we can do is to restore the models and the databases to their original status and target the 40% margin in the original NIMS guidance letter. Well, I think I better quit here before I go even further down this rabbit hole. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Dan. Questions for Dan on his testimony? Okay, not seeing any hands. Thanks, Dan. Next up is... Uh, French, Francis Estelilla, Estelilla, Francis. Oh, I didn't butcher your name too bad. Are you there? Not bad. I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? 
we have. Okay, greetings to the council and thanks for the chance to uh, provide some public comment through this remote venue. Uh, my name is Francis S. Delila. I'm a recreational fisherman speaking as an individual. <clears throat> uh, I'm happy to see that the ocean constraints imposed by Queets Coho during the past four years has uh, essentially become a non-issue for 2022. And that gives the council a tremendous opportunity to expand our ocean options north of uh, Cape Falcon relative to what we had seen in 21 and 22. Um, uh, but uh, I, I find it concerning that uh, even after the latest STT reported uh, report generated last night that the high, middle and low options uh, currently on the table all still exceed the ESA cap of 38% for LRH twoies. Um, uh, there seemed to be no movement from the report issued uh, the previous evening. Um, and as much as we all want to see seasons maximized, uh, there's still some sharpening to be done on the Chinook side to uh, responsibly shoehorn the model impacts into compliance with ESA. Uh, and yes, while the immediately previous testimony highlighted the challenges for Klamath, um, there, there remains uh, some shaving to be done south of Falcon to meet those conservation objectives for Klamath Chinook. Uh, resolving those harvest overages uh, should result in some proportionate reduction in LRH impacts uh, accruing south of Falcon and getting us to slide a little closer to ESA compliance. But I would just encourage the council to provide guidance to make up the balance um, in the whatever balance is necessary in the ocean options north of Falcon. And uh, uh, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to comment. I'd be happy to engage any questions. Thank you, Francis. Uh, questions for Francis on this testimony? Okay. Next up is uh, Brian McLaughlin. Uh, Brian, are you there? Yes, can you hear me all right? We can. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony to the council. My comments today may seem to come a little out of left field in that you probably have not received testimony about this topic before. Until very recently, this issue was not even on my radar screen. Nonetheless, it is now, so I'm bringing it to the council's attention. I have also recently brought it to the attention of the salmon technical team and the salmon advisory subpanel. My concern is about natural wild Quileute River summer coho. This is a wild native population that I understand from discussions with WDFW managers is genetically distinct from normal timed fall coho in the Quileute Basin, as well as from other coho stocks in the Olympic Peninsula ESU. It exhibits a very unique life history, both temporarily, temporarily and spatially. These fish enter the Quileute River in August and September during the lowest flows of the year. A few miles up the Quileute, they turn left up the Solduck and go 40 to 50 miles, often crossing shallow riffles and rapids with their backs out of the water to the Salmon Cascades in Olympic National Park. There they wait for the right flows and then delight tourists from all over the country and from foreign countries by leaping the falls in late September and October to spawn in the river area immediately upstream. Because of their unique life history and distinct genetics, this wild population is disproportionately important to the diversity of the Olympic Peninsula Coho ESU. Indeed, it is the only coho population of this summer type of which WDFW managers are aware. Unfortunately, the Council's Salmon Fishery Management Plan uh, for Quileute Summer Coho designates this stock as a hatchery stock and does not contain any conservation objectives for the wild component. The FMP indicates that stocks designated as hatchery stocks rely on artificial production exclusively, while those designated as natural stocks have at least some component of the stock that relies on natural production. Because the Quileute summer coho stock includes an important wild component, I don't feel it's appropriate for the FMP to designate this stock as a hatchery stock and to not have any conservation objectives for the wild component. Moreover, Although to my knowledge, the co-managers have not established an estate escapement objective for this stock, a recent paper by prominent fishery scientists at the University of Washington and NOAA's Northwest Fishery Science Center 
recommend a minimum MSY escapement objective for this natural population that has not been achieved in nine out of the last 10 years. Accordingly, I've come to ask the council to take three actions. First, request the SAMA technical team to include the Quileute natural summer coho in future reports to the council regarding projected escapements of this stock under various management alternatives under consideration for the 2022 season and beyond. Second, change the FMP designation of Quileute summer coho from a hatchery stock to a hatchery and natural stock and working with WDFW and the Quileute tribe establish appropriate conservation objectives for the natural component of the stock, taking into account the unique life history and genetic makeup of the stock and other applicable MSA standards. I think this may be accomplished without a formal FMP amendment, but I'll leave that to your determination. Third, adopt ocean salmon seasons for the 2022 season and beyond that provide enough Quileute natural summer coho to escape marine fisheries to allow the wild population to meet reasonable conservation objectives while providing for an in-river Quileute treaty fishery and modest incidental impacts from an in-river mark selective recreational fishery for hatchery stocks and other game fish. As you know, an equitable sharing between the marine and in-river fisheries is an objective of the salmon fishery management plan. So in other words, what I'm asking you to do is to conserve and prioritize Quileute wild summer coho populations as you seek to conserve other wild coho stocks on the Washington coast. Given that the Quileute wild summer coho are a wild native genetically distinct population that exhibits a unique life history and, this, and thus contributes substantially to the genetic diversity of the Olympic Peninsula coho ESU, as well as the ecological integrity of Olympic National Park. I believe these are appropriate actions under the Magnuson-Stevens Act for the council to take. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brian. Questions for Brian on this testimony? Okay, seeing no hands, that concludes public comment. And we'll go into uh, council action. Just uh, additional guide and direction and uh, on management alternatives, development as necessary. So, Kyle, go to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have some guidance for North of Falcon, and this is relative to agenda item D5A, supplemental STT report one, March 12th. Implement the following changes on table one for North of Falcon commercial management measures beginning on page two. For the US Canada border to Cape Falcon on page two, the spring season, change Chinook quotas for the spring season to alternative two, 20,000, and alternative three, 13,750. Also update the sub area caps for the areas between the US Canada border and the Queets River and between Ledbetter Point and Cape Falcon accordingly. On page three for the summer season, change the Chinook quotas for the summer season to alternative two, 10,000, and alternative three, 13,750. Move the language open five days per week, Friday to Tuesday, C1 from alternative three to alternative two, and add same as alternative one to alternative three in place of the language that was removed. On table two for North of Falcon recreational fisheries, on page 16 for the Lapush sub area, change the Chinook quota for the October one through nine fishery to 125. Okay, thank you, Kyle. All right, moving down the coast, look to Oregon and Chris Kern. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And I'll just mention now that we were scrambling uh, most of the day to put things together uh, so we are essentially throwing some things at the wall today um, beyond what I might normally prefer. So if some, Senator Chris can put up what we've got, I should have it. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Beginning with the commercial alternatives on page five, table one, alternative one, replace all of the open dates with the following, March 15 through May 15, June 16 through 30, July 15 through August 6, 
September 1 through October 31, staying in the same area, uh, which is Falcon to Hecata Bank line, apologies. Uh, in alternative two, replace all open dates with the following, March 15 through June 15, July 20 through 31, September 1 through October 31, and replace the text in the bottom paragraph that begins all coho landings must be with all salmon, all retained coho must be marked with a healed adipose fin clip, C4, C7. If the coho quota for the combined area from Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain of 10,000 marked coho is met, then the season continues for all salmon except coho on the remaining open days. Salmon trollers may take and retain or possess on board a fishing vessel no more than 50 coho per vessel per open period. All coho retained possessed on a vessel and landed must not exceed a one-to-one -one ratio with Chinook salmon that are retained and landed at the same time. Alternative three, remaining in the same area, Falcon 2, Hecata Bank, replace all open dates with the following, March 15 through April 30, May 23 through 31, June 15 through 30, July 15 through August 10, September 1 through October 31. Remaining within the commercial troll fishery, but moving to the Hecata Bank line to Humbug Mountain area in alternative one, replace all open dates with the following, May 1 through May 15, June 1 through 7, August 10 through 18, September 1 through October 31. In alternative two, replace all dates with the following, March 15 through June 15, July 20 through 31, September 1 through October 31, and replace the text in the bottom full paragraph that begins all coho landings must be with the same language uh, that we added, that I added to uh, the um, Falcon to Hecata Bank area within the same alternative. I won't reread it. And finally, in alternative three, same area, replace all open dates with the following, May 1 through 14, August 1 through 10, September 1 through October 31st. Moving to recreational alternatives, beginning on page 19. The area between Cape Falcon and the Oregon-California border in alternative two, replace the non-mark selective coho quota of 20,000 with 18,000. Moving down to Cape Falcon to Humbug Mountain area in alternative three, replace same as alternative one with March 15 through July 31, September 1 through October 31st, Replace the ending date for the mark selective coho fishery of August 21 with August 28. Replace same as alternative one with open seven days per week, all salmon through July 31, then all salmon except close to retention of Chinook salmon during August, two salmon per day. All retained coho must be marked with a healed adipose fin clip, C1, C minimum size limits, B, C gear restrictions and definitions in C2 and C3. And recreational uh, fishery in the Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California border, Oregon KMZ. In alternative one, replace the dates of May 28 through August 6th with May 21 through June 27. Alternative two, replace June 18 through August 14 with July 1 through August 9. And in alternative three, replace the dates May 21 through July 31 with June 25 through July 31. And that completes my guidance. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chris. All right, moving down the coast to California. Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I think I'm going to pause a minute first and just say um, I'm going to provide this guidance, but um, we didn't have a chance there uh, in council discussion to, to talk a little more about uh, the H4 Klamath impact rate cap. So I am planning to go back to um, council discussion on that point. I want to flag that. Um, kind of rushed quickly here into guidance, but um, I think there's some important discussion yet to be have on that point. Sure. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, complete uh, the guidance from California. Uh, working off of C5A Supplemental STT Report 1 for March 12th, 
implement the following changes. Table one, these are the California commercial management alternatives beginning on page eight. From latitude 4010 to Point Arena, which is the Fort Bragg management area, alternative one, replace July 1 through 12 with July 1 through 10. Replace August 1 through 12 with August 1 through 10. In the San Francisco area, which is Point Arena to Pigeon Point, alternative one, remove June 1 through 7, replace July 1 through 12 with July 1 through 10, replace August 1 through 12 with August 1 through 10. Alternative two, remove June 1 through 10, replace July 1 through 8 with July 1 through 10. Replace August 1 through 12 with August 1 through 15. Alternative 3, replace June 1 through 10 with June 1 through 8. Replace July 1 through 10 with July 1 through 8. Moving to the Monterey area, which is Pigeon Point to the U.S.-Mexico border. Alternative 1, Replace May 20th through 27th with May 20th through 31st. Replace June 1 through 7 with June 1 through 15. Alternative 2, replace May 1 through 12 with May 1 through 10. Replace May 20th through 27th with May 22nd to 31st. Replace June 1 through 10 with June 1 through 15. Replace July 1 through 8 with July 1 through 12. And alternative three, replace June 1 through 10 with June 1 through 8. And replace July 1 through 10 with July 1 through 8. Moving to table two, the recreational management alternatives for California. And this begins on page 20 of the packet. Uh, for the California KMZ, which is the Oregon-California border to the 4010 line, alternative one, replace July 1 through September 1 with August 1 through September 5th. Alternative three, remove all dates and replace with July 1 through 22. Moving to the Fort Bragg area, which is the 4010 line to Porn Arena. And alternative two, replace April 2 through May 15th with May 1 through 15. And in alternative three, replace June 1 through September 30th with May 1 through September 30th. And thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I believe that completes the guidance for California, and I will uh, echo uh, Chris Kern's remark that um, this guidance is kind of um, just throwing something on a wall to see what might stick with um, uh, still a moving target out here to, to try to achieve. So I think this gets us closer. This will get us close, closer. We're, we're still over on a number of our objectives. So um, this, this should move us in the right direction. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, thank you Marcy. Uh, Chris Kern, Chris? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I apologize, but I am informed uh, by my phone a friend that I may have misspoke on one of the dates. So it is correct in the document I used, but I should probably reiterate it for the record if I may. Sure. And that was in uh, the last page, Humbug Mountain to Oregon, California, border Oregon, KMZ, and alternative two, replace the dates of June 18 through August 14 with July 1 through August 19th. I believe I may have said 9th in the first round. I meant to say 19th. Okay. And this reflects that. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And with that, we'll go to the uh, tribal, uh, tribal report. And uh, Joe, are you available? I am. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. 
At this time, I do not have any further guidance for the treatment and control management alternatives that's reflected in uh, Table 3, pages uh, 24 and 25 of the uh, SDT supplemental report. Thank you, Mr. Okay. okay. Thank you, Joe. All right. So we have the, that guidance is given. I guess, was anybody else? Additional, um, Chair Grolick. Uh, thank you, Vice. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. I just wanted to, before we left this agenda item, I wanted to get some clarity on an issue that was raised in public comment, and I think that Marcy may have briefly touched on, and, and that has to do with, with the NIMS guidance. And I understand that we have not done well for some years in accurately predicting our impact on the age four Klamath, which is our proxy for the California Coastal Chinook, and measures need to be taken. And we got a guidance letter in that regard. And um, I know that um, the model was changed to some extent, I guess, more selective use of dates. And I, if I can ask Dr. O'Farrell some questions, whether, I don't know if he can answer it or not, but if, Vice Chair, if I may have, uh, invite Dr. O'Farrell up. Please. Yep. Uh, to at least pose my question and then maybe if you can't answer it on the fly. Um, I, I understand that some dates were changed in, in the model. Do you have any idea what those changes did with regard to harvest predictions of age four compared to the previous model that we used? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Gorelnik, uh, I'll back up and say that <clears throat> there have been two data changes made to the KOHM in the last two years, it, it, both for the same reasons to, um, to address this uh, under prediction of the Klamath H4 harvest rate. And they both did the same thing. Uh, they shortened the data used to forecast or used to estimate the contact rates per unit effort, which is a big driver of the impacts in the model. Um, it was shortened to 2013 forward um, last year and this year 2015 forward. And the result of those um, changes were to place heavier weight on these most recent years that have high exploitation rates. And so the um, Appendix D of preseason report one has some analysis of this that shows that um, uh, these changes resulted in um, H4 ocean harvest rates that more closely corresponded with our postseason estimates than if we were to use the status quo data ranges. Um, did that adequately address your question? Uh, almost. <laughs> I, I, pre I, I will go back and look at, at that report, but can you quantify the, the change from the status quo that the, uh, the new data range provided in terms of impacts? I mean, I assume that because impacts were higher in most recent years, uh, the model predicts higher impacts from the status quo. And that's kind of what I'm kind of what I'm wondering what that number is, if you know. I don't have, I, there is, it's very difficult to make a, a single number um, change here. These, there's been, uh, the overall effect was to have higher harvest rates um, for seasons. If we had a set season and we use last year's model versus this year's model, there's substantially higher harvest rates that are predicted from it. Of course, you know, these harvest rates are predicted at the area, month area and fishery level of stratification in some areas went down, but on the, on the whole, um, most of them went up and the net effect is to have um, predictions for higher harvest rates than we would have in past years, given a same fishery. All right, I, I appreciate that. Thanks very much, Mike. And, and I, um, maybe there's still some discussions going on with, with NIMPS. Um, my understanding, um, and it may not be correct, so I'm gonna apologize in advance, that um, the guidance uh, 
recently provided was for <clears throat> a 40% reduction from the new model that already contains some measure of correction. And um, I guess my concern is I, on the one hand, we have to take into account the fact that we've not accurately predicted these. But on the other hand, um, we need to do it in the most reasonable way, uh, the most reasonable way we can. And I think that the guidance letter we received indicated a 40% reduction, which I assumed was from the status quo. Um, or a change in the model. We have a change in the model. May not be adequate, frankly. But it gets us, I assume, some distance towards the ultimate goal. And um, my concern is that there's some interpretation that perhaps we need to take that reduction and then 40% more. And uh, I think that is something that has come as a surprise to to stakeholders and others. So I don't know if I can ask Ms. Bishop for some clarification there or whether this is better for an offline discussion. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, um, Mr. Grilnick. Um, I had looked at the information that Dr. O'Farrell just reviewed um, and you are correct in that the most recent improvements to the model do make a substantial difference and do reduce the likelihood of over or under predicting the exploitation rate. But the results also show that in three of the four years, the model still would have under predicted the exploitation rates that resulted and in the most recent year, substantially so. Um, so I looked at that information and I took that into account and and relevant to the going back to I think it's worth revisiting the guidance in full that we gave which if I can just read it here um, you, you uh, reference the 40 percent reduction let me get to the right page um, uh, given the pattern of exceedance in recent years to ensure ocean harvest rates do not exceed the 16 percent age for KRFC harvest rate consultation standard Fisheries should be managed using a buffer of 40% on the preseason target ocean harvest rate. This would result in a preseason target that will achieve postseason attainment of 16% given the pattern of recent model performance. Unless the council and its advisory bodies identify management measures or further model adjustments that the, I think this is the important part, that the best available information indicates would have the same effect of keeping the post-season estimate of the harvest rate on KRFC age four at or below the 16% for 2022 salmon, ocean salmon fisheries. And when I looked at the analysis that um, Dr. O'Farrell had conducted and the improvements to the models, it still indicated that there was a likelihood that there would be an over predict or an under prediction of the exploitation rate. So I, in taking, in informing sort of where I have currently landed, um, I took that into account um, that there was some uh, improvement made, but not a substantial amount of improvement. So essentially it would, um, uh, there was still a level of uncertainty that would not be achieved by the 40% reduction um, based on the analysis that I had. And so, that is the, the conversation that I had with the SAS earlier today. Um, there is some additional information that uh, I think folks are working on with regard to the contact rates that are assumed and what that translates into the seasons on the water. Um, I would point out that we worked very hard last year. We made some substantial adjustments to the model, further constraining, very much the same exercise of constraining the years used focusing on the high, harv uh, high contact rates, assuming that those contact rates would not occur or that there would not be higher contract rates than those contact rates. And in fact, there were uh, contact rates that resulted in a substantial exceedance of the uh, limit. Um, and so I think th that also uh, uh, provides some uh, additional cautionary approach in this case, uh, should the contact rates this year be higher for some reason. 
Um, so that informed the in interim refined guidance that I have been uh, discussing with the SAS and the managers. All right, th thank you for that explanation. I guess my, my I, I, I don't have any concern with the fact that we may need additional uh, reductions. My, my concern is that, that we adequately capture the reductions that have been achieved in the model uh, such that we're not taking those reductions plus the 40% that was in the guidance. And that's, that's, that's my concern. I mean, you know, we clearly need to avoid exceeding that 16% rate. There's no dispute about that. It's just that taking more reductions than might be needed is going, is, is crippling an already crippled fishery. Um, you can see the, the, the season alternatives that were provided particularly for the troll fishery and it's, it's a week here and it's a week there and people can't make a living doing that. It's, uh, and communities are, are gonna suffer a great deal. Yep. Okay, thank you, Chair Grolnick. Um, Chris Kerr, Chris? Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I was just advised of another mistake, but I maybe should ask if the conversation Mr. Grolnick was uh, having is over. I don't want to interrupt. You know, if other folks have something on, other folks have something on the same topic, I don't want to. I do actually want to see Marcy. Yes, I do see Marcy's hand up there. So, Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And yes, it is on this topic. Um, I want to thank uh, Mark and Susan for the previous exchange. Um, I want to think back to yesterday um, and an exchange that I had with Susan on the need for clarity and on um, my request that NIMS document um, these savings, I guess you'd say, um, in a report. Um, and I believe she said that she'd be able to provide us uh, information and in, um, discussion here today that would then follow up later with the report. So um, I appreciate um, her explanation of how we're getting to the needed reduction and that it's really a, a twofold um, process. Um, first, the model updates, um, which have happened, um, clearly add substantial um, restriction into the model, um, but she's also expressed that that's not enough. Um, she told us yesterday that the technical work was ongoing uh, to be able to prove up um, exactly um, how much buffering is needed on top of the buffer or the, the change that comes in the model um, with the updates to the, the new data. So um, I am um, just reminding that I think we'd like to see that. I, we'd like to see uh, this revised guidance um, come to the council in written form. Um, one for transparency. I think it's important that, um, you know, it, it be clear to um, the public how how we're um, how we how we are effectively achieving uh, NIMS's guidance. Um, I'd also like um, to just note that um, what really is being asked here is is for a, a bright line, a typical bright line that our SAS and STT are accustomed to modeling to. Um, which in the case of uh, California Coastal Chinook and their surrogate on uh, being aged for Klamath Fall, um, that 16% is a constraint that we are accustomed to managing to every cycle. And um, it's very often a constraint in, in shaping our, our fishery package. The, the kind of unique situation that's occurred this year is that actually, um, similar to last year, um, the constraint in the Klamath area, as, as shown in the package right now, is really on the overfished Klamath adults. It's not on the age four. Uh, so what that means is 
so far in our modeling exercises, we have been aiming to do better on that Klamath adult uh, constraint and and not um, having a difficulty with the age four, uh, attaining the age four impact rate cap of the 16%. And Michael's walked through that uh, with us on the tables. Um, the, the challenge now is, you know, I mean, we've, we've had a couple of days and I, I had hoped that we would reach resolution on this point before now, um, but it looks like um, with the revised guidance that's coming from NIMS that um, now we uh, model to achieve 10% uh, instead of 16%. So the, the cumulative effect of both the, the model um, update coupled with this additional um, buffer is expected postseason to stay within the 16%. I think there's no debate about the need. There's no no question that um, significant change uh, is needed this year. Um, but what's what's key is that um, we be able to establish that bright line um, now. And so that there's no longer any uncertainty about what the 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 guidepost is. Um, you know, we've had a few days at this now, and the opportunity for the models to solidify and the constraints to become clear. But in order um, for the the SAS and the STT to um, keep us moving along in the development of alternatives, uh, we need some we need certainty on exactly what the constraint is. So. Um, it sounds like we're there uh, with this new information we've heard today um, from Susan, and I, I know that this has been a lot of work on the sidelines, and I do think, you know, I'm comfortable that the technical basis is there um, along the lines of Mark's questioning. I, I have that, um, that information has been provided um, by the CDFW staff in the STT room. Um, they have taken a very close look at it. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable that um, the, the model adjustment plus this, this additional buffer does, um, does do the job. Um, it's just, it is difficult coming so late in the development of alternatives. But again, just wanna express um, the request that um, we receive uh, this in writing from NIMS uh, by the time we uh, depart for home. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Okay, Chris Kern. Chris. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and I do apologize, but I was advised of another mistake this time in our written packet. Um, so this is on, um, for reference, it's on page two of this document for alternative to in the Hecata Bank line to Humbug Mountain. We had taken an in-season action yesterday that actually removed the preceding regulation that had a March 15th open date. And so this is a typo in here. Alternative two, the first line, instead of reading March 15 through June 15, should read May 1 through June 15. And I hope that's it. Me too. <laughs> you're, you're good, you're good, okay. <laughs> Anything else going on or as far as anybody else comments? We done? I would turn to Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, it's been a long day and thank you for uh, the patience and waiting for the salmon folks to produce some guidance um, so that we can get underway and look to get those salmon seasons um, within all of our management and conservation objectives. So with that, I think the council has done its work under this and the STT will now start its work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. And uh, thank you everyone for hanging in there and uh, give the gavel back to uh, Chair Grelnick. Mark. All right, thank you very much, Vice Chair Pettinger. Great job on the gavel. Uh, good job, everyone. Uh, salmon is always very stressful, and of course, this year is no different. Um, but we'll get through it. I know that the salmon folks are going to be burning the midnight oil tonight, working on where they need to go. So uh, no sense in holding this up. Tomorrow morning, we'll start with highly migratory species. And uh, we have ecosystems, some administrative items tomorrow. Um, 
and of course we'll come back to Salmon. So I'll ask our executive director, Merrick Burden, if he has any announcements. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, council members and, and everyone that's participating in this process. Um, I'll just echo your thanks and thanking everyone for being nimble and light on your feet as you work through some things today. Um, I would just remind everyone that we are staring down daylight savings time. So uh, don't forget, uh, we'll start I guess that call is yours, Mr. Chairman, if we'll start on time tomorrow. So it is daylight savings time either way. That's my only remark. We have, we'll start tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific daylight time. So good night, everyone.